talk, and so I will officially call this meeting to order. And I will ask our clerk, Trustee Cottle, to do the roll call. Thank you, Madam President. President Raymond. Here. Vice President Taylor. I'm here. And I am here. Trustee Calvert. Here. Trustee Simon Holland. Here. Trustee Minetto. Here. Student Representative Victoria Gomez. All right, Madam President, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, next up on the agenda is the roll call. Um, and I will ask our, who should I ask to do the pledge? I'll ask our CFO, Mr. Mark Mathers, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Mathers. All right, the next item on the agenda is the action to adopt the agenda. Um, I just have a few uh, comments for this item. So uh, we have some presenters coming um, up from Carson from the governor's office to present on um, COVID-19 response. Uh, they are here shortly, we think, uh, maybe stuck in traffic. So we'd like to put them up uh, first as soon as they arrive um, due to other conflicts they have. Um, we have uh, decided not to hear any public comment today until um, after 4 p.m., 4 p.m. or later. Um, so we'll move uh, 3.01 public comment uh, to be heard no earlier than 4 p.m. And then I will be pulling agenda item 5.02 today because uh, we do not meet the thresholds for that item um, to be heard. So, And so we'll have a little bit of flexibility to um, uh, move any presentation items up before 4 p.m. Um, so that we can wait until that 4 p.m. hour to do the public comment if necessary. Would someone like to move, make a motion? Yes. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'll move that we uh, hear item 3.01 after 4 p.m. that we uh, wait on 5.01 until our guests arrive and hear it as soon as we can after they arrive. And then that we um, will uh, not hear item 5.02 because we are not meeting the thresholds and otherwise adopt the agenda. All right, I have a motion by Trustee Simon Holland, a second from Trustee Cottle. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion passes unanimously. And since our presenters are still not here, <laughs> I think we'll start by moving up actually um, our board reports, which is agenda item 6.01. We can get that out of the way. And I will start um, down to the right with our student representative. Currently with Student Voice, we are working on, with student-led groups who are trying to make a change throughout the district. Sounds good. I've been trying to get to schools. Last week I had, uh, I think, four visits I had to postpone. But I did get to a couple uh, yesterday, and um, the principals are telling me things are really coming along nicely, and I'm just thrilled to hear that. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I've been spending the, ma the majority of my time working on um, a, a, some testing, a, t a testing program in, in partnership with Renown and actually some of the faith-based um, churches in, in the area, a lot of the faith-based churches in the area, um, to make sure that Washoe County School District is included in that. And the, the, the objective from Renown standpoint is to um, really provide free COVID testing for those vulnerable populations, in particular the populations of uh, uh, people of color as well as low income because we know that they're disproportionately impacted. 
And so there will be uh, five, six, seven, and as many as we need um, clinics, actually health clinics, when there's free testing, if they have insurance, great. If they have Medicaid, great. But if not, that's great too, to, uh, to be able to go to um, various locations in the community. The first one is this Saturday, uh, September 26th. It is from 1 to 4 at um, Ministerial uh, La Palabra de Vida, in other words, Word of Life, on uh, 2375 South Virginia Street. Again, it's from 1 to 4. And it's just the beginning, um, and these will happen about every two weeks or so, uh, probably as long as there's a need for it. So we're going to, uh, we've been able to partner from the school district standpoint to uh, provide the flyers whenever these come out in English and Spanish, get them to all the schools, um, and in particular target those schools that are in those areas. They'll be in various parts of town, which is great as well. So we can, uh, families, uh, children, um, employees of the Washington County School District that want to get tested. You don't need to be um, asymptomatic or symptomatic. Either way it goes. It doesn't matter. Um, if you just want to get tested, make sure that you're safe. So this will, um, this, I think this is going to be fantastic as it rolls out. So I'm very excited. And the first one is this Saturday. Thank you very much, Vice President Taylor, and great work on getting that rolling. Well, um, I like... Uh, Trustee Minetto had a couple visits to schools scheduled for last week that I had to postpone and reschedule. So um, just otherwise have been working hard on kind of trying to um, respond to emails and do other things. I did um, have the opportunity on Friday to meet with um, three amazing students at Galena High School who um, started a petition uh, around distance learning um, and so Principal Salter at uh, Galena High School hosted uh, them and I was able to just listen and kind of um, get some more understanding of the student perspective and, and sort of what is happening, um, you know, in their eyes with the, uh, some of the technical issues around distance learning, uh, but just also, you know, the general challenges of, of doing distance learning. And they were so impressive. They were really um, came from an approach of just wanting to find ways to solve the problems. They weren't just, um, you know, trying to make noise or be problem, problem, make a problem out of it. They really wanted to problem solve, which was wonderful. And I appreciated being able to be part of the conversation. So I'll pass it down to Trustee Cottle. Thank you, Madam President. Um, similar issues with school visits last week. Um, so really spent most of my time uh, doing constituent services, uh, which I enjoy speaking with parents, teachers, about what's going on. And then uh, a few Fridays ago, um, a teacher invited me to her classroom to talk about a few things and it turned in at Stead Elementary and it turned into a, like a teacher's round table with a, a number of teachers at the school. And I thought that was really fruitful conversation and it was uh, great to see what was going on and get some uh, different perspectives. So thank you. Uh, next up, uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to share, uh, as we've been dealing with the smoke in our region, we, um, we also are mindful of the costs, the human costs of what's happening that's causing all that smoke and, uh, and uh, asked for Superintendent McNeil's assistance and uh, she was uh, great about letting me make this announcement that as we know, two elementary schools in Butte County were completely destroyed by fire. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, let folks know that they can donate directly at the school district's website, which is www.bcoe.org. That's Butte County Office of Education, bcoe.org. Uh, and I did go on and donate, and it's very easy to do, and, and would just um, offer to anybody who's interested in helping them, because, you know, imagine having two entire schools destroyed, um, what that's done for those children and those teachers and those families. So I uh, wanted to share that with folks. Um, and other than that, just uh, like everyone else, um, keeping track of all that's going on. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Um, move over to our superintendent report with Dr. McNeil. Thank you very much, President Rainbow, members of the board, student representative, so just a few items today. Um, first of all, I want to do a shout out to McQueen High School for hosting uh, the Board of Trustees meeting today and to Principal Maribel and all of her staff 
Um, just a tremendous, tremendous effort on their part for being so great hosts for all of us. So thank you so much to Principal Maribel and her entire staff. Importantly, today is National Voter Registration Day. So if you're 18, I'm hoping that you are getting registered to vote and that um, if you are not 18 and 18 or older, that you also get registered to vote. And then last week, I was able to go to Pine Middle School um, and visit with Principal Brad Brudreau, walk through some classrooms, which was wonderful. And then um, able to participate with Governor Sisolak um, for um, a virtual pop-in visit at Smith Ridge Elementary with Principal Mike Dixon in a second grade classroom and then Principal Kelly Dominguez over at Whitehead Elementary School for fifth grade. And then finally, I made a commitment to fourth grade student over at North Star that I would read his letter that he sent to me and it has to do with water conservation. And so I told him I, was, I hoped that he would be able to stay up late, so it's great that we're able to do this early in the afternoon. So I'm hoping that Alexander is, is awake and listening. Um, his fourth grade teacher, Stephanie Vega, was able to send me this letter. So, dear Christy McNeil, I am learning about conser conserving water in Nevada, and I wanted to ask for your help. I have three simple ideas that a kid like me can easily do at home. But I think if all kids will do this, our drought problems will lessen. If you can help me share my ideas to the Washoe County, that would be great. There are three things that we can do to conserve water in Nevada. First, we can take shorter showers. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the average shower time is at least eight minutes. If you take a long shower, your skin will get very dry and itchy, aside from wasting water. Second, we should look for any leaks in our faucets. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, 15,140 drops of leaking faucet is a whole gallon of water is wasted. Imagine if 100 houses are leaking right now, every day, for a year. Third, we should close the faucet while brushing our teeth. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, keeping the faucet on while brushing our teeth wastes four gallons of water. So brushing our teeth twice a day, keeping the faucet on, wastes eight gallons. This is a lot of wasted water. As the new superintendent of our district, you also have a big super responsibility, not just to the school, but to the environment. Can you please share my ideas at school? Thank you, Alexander. And then he also included a little picture, which was really great. So thank you so much for Alexander, and that's my report. Thank you, Superintendent McNeil. Uh, next up, we'll do our consent agenda. I'm looking for approval of consent agenda items. Um, we have been asked by... Thank you for that. Um, so we'll move on to our consent agenda items. Uh, 2.01 is consent agenda items, two point, approval of consent agenda items 2.02 through 2.09. Um, there was a request from staff to pull agenda item 2.05 today. Um, and so we will not be considering that item today, but would be looking for approval on the other items. Um, I'll first check with our um, Recording secretary to see if we have pu any public comment on consent agenda. We do not. Okay. Uh, then I would be looking for approval for 2.02 .02 through 2.04 and 2.06 through 2.09. Madam President, I have to make a motion. Go ahead, Vice President Taylor. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the board um, approves a consent agenda items 2.02 .02 through 2.04 and 2.06 through 2.09. Thank you. Okay, motion by Vice President Taylor, second by Trustee Minetto. Is there any discussion or? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? All right, then now we would, um, I would like to move on to agenda item 
5.01 uh, Health Department of Health and Human Services. Julia is a native Nevadan, born and raised in Carson Valley. She went to school at Douglas High School, uh, then went on to the University of Nevada, Reno to get her bachelor's degree in health ecology and a certificate of gerontology. Julia moved to Seattle to get her master's degree in health services administration with a focus on rural and underserved communities at the University of Washington. Um, and she is a graduate of the Great Basin Public Health Leadership Institute. Uh, Julia has been with um, DHHS since 2006, starting as a health resource analyst, uh, and then was promoted to the manager of the Office of Public Health Informatics um, uh, and Epidemiology. Uh, during her public health career thus far, Julia has received several awards for her work, including the Dr. John E. Warden Award for Excellence in Public Health from the University of Nevada, Reno, and the Public Health Leader of the Year and Public Health Advocate of the Year from the Nevada Public Health Association. Uh, we also have um, Mr. Caleb Cage, uh, this, uh, and his role is the State of Nevada's COVID-19 Response Director. Um, this position coordinates resources and uh, works across multiple state, local, and federal entities to respond to COVID-19. Um, through the end of December, uh, from the officer, Office of Governor Sisolak, uh, this work includes a strong emphasis on the testing effort and capacity, contract tracing, and coordination of resources to support the robust, ongoing, and expanding work in these areas in localities and across the state. Um, Caleb is a native Nevadan who was, has also served in various capacities in public service for the last 18 years. Uh, immediately following college, he was commissioned as an artillery officer in the United States Army, serving in Germany and Iraq over the next five years. Upon returning to Nevada in 2007, Cage served in various capacities, including as a public advisor in the Lieutenant uh, Governor's Office, as well as the Governor's Office um, and leading the Nevada H H Office of Veteran Services and the Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Um, and he has also worked with the Nevada System of Higher Education. Um, and he lives here in Reno with his wife and three children. Um, I am really pleased that you were able to join us today. I reached out uh, to Caleb a few weeks back um, to invite uh, him here to just share a little bit more about the work that the state is doing and see, give us a sense as a school board how um, these two uh, you know, perspectives are working together. So I will turn it over to you all now and, and let you take it from here. Thank you, Thank you very much, President Raymond. Um, and uh, Julia, is it okay with you if I go ahead and kick off here? Okay, um, always, a, always a pleasure to talk with uh, partners throughout the state, uh, especially when I get to do so with uh, my friend and colleague, Julia Peake here, who really is uh, one of the state's experts on public health and uh, has been crucial and critical to our response here over the last six months and, and long before that as well. So um, I'm gonna kick off and talk a little bit about the high level uh, trajectory of where we've come from, where, where we are and where we're going, at least where we think we're going with respect to COVID uh, in the state of Nevada with respect to response in particular and recovery. And then um, Julia, if I'm missing anything or, or uh, at, at whatever point is appropriate, uh, please feel free to kick in at any time. So first, I just wanna thank you um, for all of, for the opportunity to be here today to talk about our efforts at the state. But much more important, I want to thank you for your leadership here, um, for our students and the staff and faculty and licensed educated professionals and otherwise here in the state of Nevada. You have an incredibly challenging job. I know you don't need to hear that from me. You live it every day. Um, but between you, superintendent, and, and uh, the members of the board, um, we're, um, uh, we're honored to be here and honored to work with you and, and really grateful for the work you're doing here. Um, <clears throat> A little background on, on Nevada's uh, overall trajectory with respect to uh, response and leading into recovery. I think it's appropriately framed as very early on um, the, the actions taken in order to stop the spread 
of the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, here in the state of Nevada were very similar to what was happening in other states um, and uh, started with, with a really aggressive um, uh, efforts in the front. And as we got more data, more information and more opportunities to deal with the virus going forward, um, we were able to, through, through Governor Sisolak and, and his leadership and, and direction on this, we were able to um, take a more targeted approach over time, uh, one that was more data-driven, one that was um, less restrictive, and one that was uh, more effectively able to help us balance the economic needs of the state with the public health needs of the state, which I think we all uh, appreciate as an important balance uh, and one that we need to take very, very seriously here. Uh, as you all know, the first case in the state of Nevada um, happened in Clark County on March 5th, and I believe around the same day uh, there was a Washoe County case as well, might have even been the same day. The World Health Organization declared a global pandemic on March 11th. The state of Nevada, Governor Sisolak, declared a public health emergency on March 12th and a national emergency was declared on March 13th. So very quick succession uh, of uh, global, national, and statewide events in the response. And over the next few weeks, as I, as I alluded to earlier, um, the governor issued a stay-at-home order. Um, and uh, the, the focus of the stay-at-home order was A, to stop the spread of the virus, B, uh, to allow for uh, time for the public infrastructure necessary to respond and see to ensure that we were protecting the um, uh, vulnerable populations and the essential uh, infrastructure that we had here in the state of Nevada, namely um, hospitals and hospital space, intensive care space, and so on. Uh, I joined the effort on March 30th on loan from the Nevada System of Higher Education. As you, you mentioned earlier, President Raymond, uh, and, and began working with, with Julia and her team at Public Health uh, because of my background in emergency management, was able to assist at that point. Um, as what, what was clear was uh, the stay-at-home order worked. It stopped the uh, spread of the virus, greatly decreased uh, the rate of transmission. Um, however, it was not sustainable long-term, uh, and, and uh, the governor made a decision to lift the stay-at-home order and has put a number of more targeted um, uh, restrictions or, or uh, measures in place since that time. On June 24th, I believe, he issued um, the uh, statewide mask mandate that went into effect on June 26th, uh, which was a Friday, and uh, at the same time initiated a statewide enforcement um, uh, program in order to ensure that we could, in fact, continue to reopen without um, seeing the uh, taxing of our hospital system and our critical care system here in the state of Nevada. Uh, he was able to, we were able to see some results of that, but because of the slow uh, nature of identifying the presence of this virus as well as treating it, uh, that um, we were able to, to really benefit from that within a number of weeks. So four to six weeks after that was when we started to see the decrease. Uh, however, starting around July 4th, uh, we were seeing and we were we were also uh, experiencing the increase in cases uh, at the same time, which resulted in uh, our hospitals, particularly in southern Nevada, being at or near capacity for um, treating the virus in early August, at which point around August 5th, we started to see the initial signs uh, of a decline in cases at that point. Um, we, uh, the governor, created a, an even more focused approach to this going forward, again, starting very broadly and moving into a, uh, a more targeted approach going forward, where we, he established a task force, which uh, both Julia and I sit on, and uh, um, allowed us the opportunity to develop three criteria for assessing counties throughout the state to determine uh, trigger points that would allow us to really engage with the county governments and determine what they saw through contact tracing. And I'll leave the contact tracing piece here for, for Julia because that's her 
uh, it's been a, a program she's built exceptionally well throughout the state over the last six months as well. Uh, the three criteria basically have to do with the amount of testing a county is doing, the overall case rates, so the, the percent of cases within their overall population, and then their test positivity rate. And if a county hits two of those three criteria, then they're flagged and they have to uh, engage in a discussion with the state. If they keep two of the three criteria or three of the three criteria, for any significant duration over two weeks or more, um, then we, uh, we require that they submit an action plan that says these are gonna be our mitigation and enforcement measures going forward until we can get these numbers back down. We started, I believe, with seven counties that were listed on the, the criteria list uh, five or six weeks ago. We're down to two counties right now. Uh, and we have slowly over time have been able to remove restrictions, statewide restrictions, and go to county targeted restrictions in that time as well. Um, I'll, I, I'd like to say none of that focusing over time would have been possible were it not for um, tremendous work in capacity building. And that capacity building has to do with building a logistics function that the state has never had before at this, at this magnitude in order to, um, to build out PPE warehouses so that we had a stockpile on hand uh, to make sure that our labs could uh, provide the level of testing support that they need to provide. Uh, I won't, I won't um, try to get the numbers right, but, but the, uh, the overall number of, of uh, labs tests that the labs ran last year was in the low tens of thousands. Uh, this year we do that in a, in a week uh, very easily with the number of labs that we're running through the program. So building lab capacity and then contact tracing, which is really the key result going forward. I'll, I'll stop here in a moment, but before I do, I'll uh, turn it over to Julia. I'll say all of this has been the statewide effort with the counties. Uh, and as you know, uh, through the Department of Education, uh, the districts have, have developed and, and, and school districts have developed uh, their own reopening plans. And again, I just want to say, um, I think Washoe County, I think the counties have, have done a, a remarkable job in a, in a very challenging time and uh, appreciate all of your hard work. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julia to talk about anything that I missed. Uh, thank you, Director. Uh, Julia Peek, uh, for the record, um, I do want to echo what Director Cage has said about um, your job. It's very hard having kids myself in the Washoe County School District. I don't envy the choices that you all have to make, but I certainly appreciate them. Um, I do want to acknowledge the relationship that Washoe County School District has with the Washoe County Health District. It truly is one of the strongest public health relationships with the school district that we have. We've modeled our school surveillance system for this state after what Washoe County has been doing for years with the absenteeism data. So I just want to acknowledge that, that you guys have the foundation in place that has really allowed COVID to come in, though at a scope unseen prior, you've done it with GI illness and other things in the past. So building that relationship is not something, unfortunately, that you all have to do. Um, it's just modifying it slightly. I'll add that I did have conversation with um, Kevin Dick with the health board to talk about your data and what it looks like. Um, in September, you are seeing growth among the age group 10 to 29, but you're watching it. And case investigation is one of the ways that we link cases together. About 25% of our cases are identified through this method, but the other 75% is not. And so one of the things that Nevada has tried to do to identify more cases is we developed an exposure-based app that goes on a phone. We have about 35,000 downloads to date. But I'll just say that our public health infrastructure has grown from less than 100 for case investigation and contact tracing to over 600. And so just that growth in our public health infrastructure um, has been incredible. But we're at a really good place now based on what Director Cage has said with our ability to more quickly identify where we're seeing clusters or outbreaks, respond to them. But that's hugely dependent as well on the public continuing to provide information to take our calls to help us understand what's happening. And it is a challenge. Um, so between traditional case investigation and contact tracing partnerships like what you have with the health board and technology like the COVID trace app, we hope that we will stay ahead of this. We're also hugely invested in the COVID vaccine. And so our team is working hard with teams in Washoe County and throughout the state to understand what that looks like for our community. Um, understanding that in the next month to six weeks, we'll start getting the first doses potentially. 
And so I just, um, I just want to acknowledge the efforts of our team in that area as well. Um, with that, I'm happy to take questions um, about any public health efforts that we're doing or anything related to the plan. Thank you both very much. Did you have anything to add, Caleb? Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate you both um, taking the time to be here. I know how um, extraordinarily busy you are, um, and it really means a lot uh, to me that you took the time I know um, was informative for, I think, all of us. Um, I will look to see if any of my fellow trustees have questions. Uh, Vice President Taylor. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to you both for being here. As, as you both mentioned, this is these are really crazy and challenging times for us here and um, as a board and I know we're working you know really hard together to uh, to make our way through this and we, we certainly need the, the help the advice the expertise and all of that from uh, the professionals like you so here, here is my question now uh, Julia you, you spoke a little bit about the the surveillance piece and and you said 75% of the cases I think I may have missed that are identified in a, in a different way can you kind of go through that again and then I may have a follow-up. Yeah, it's a great question. So the way our case investigation starts is we get a positive lab report. Mm -hmm. And so approximately 25% of that, those cases, we already knew that person was a close contact to one of our cases. So we were just waiting for that lab report to come in to start the investigation. 75% um, of the cases are unknown to us. So they went and got a lab test. Um, they were not on our radar. And then once we got that lab, we started our case investigation process. Mm -hmm. So in thank you, if, if I may. Thank, thank you for that, for that clarity. Um, so in, in follow-up to that, as a district, is there, is there um, a role that we play in that or could play in that as we, because as you know, as you know we're, we have our hybrid model and we're doing the best we can to keep schools, first of all, safe, right? And then uh, providing their safe open. And um, uh, so is there a role that we can play so that we can, because once we know, once schools are open, that what we have learned is that the, the response to a case or a response to contact, those things become critically important. Are there things that we can do that we aren't doing that you've noticed? Uh, Julia Peaks, so I won't say that there's things you haven't been doing. Again, I'll say that our system for the statewide surveillance is based on what Washoe County has developed in prior years. What I will say is um, we're all at a point um, of COVID fatigue, but we just need to stay the course and continue to test. Um, for our kids, that can be very scary. Again, having kids myself, you deal with the aspect of mental health for your kids and how scary the virus is and communicating that, but also understanding that testing is critical. Taking your temperature daily before school, though a little scary, is critical. Um, and the system that you've established as far as screening kids prior to going to school and then also their relationship with the health district, if you um, have an in-person class and all of a sudden um, you have high levels of absentee data, um, your health district will be on that so quickly. And what we are tracking is we, we are tracking businesses and businesses could come up because you have a high number of workers um, that have tested positive um, or a high number of students in your scenario. And what Washoe County has presented is that Washoe County um, School District and the University of Nevada Reno do have the highest number of cases just based on a single business entity, but that is purely really due to community spread and you just happen to have a high number of patrons and students and a high number of employees, both you and the university combined. And so those are things we're watching. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. The fact that we know is good because you're testing and we're finding the cases and we're isolating appropriately. Um, also continue to emphasize the need to quarantine. It's 14 days since the last exposure date and that's a long period of time. And so we just need to emphasize the importance again of isolating should you be positive and then quarantining should you be a close contact. Again, really hard for, for all of us in this period of COVID fatigue, but we truly need to stay the course until we see a vaccine. Um, COVID will be with us forever. And that's a conversation that I have with my kids as well. It will be like flu, it'll be like measles and it's okay. It's the new normal. And so I think that's an important conversation to have with our kids, but I think we're, we're doing it well in Washoe County, I could say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other? Trustee Cottle. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you both for, for being here. It's great that you took the time to, to come speak with us. I, I would assume Washoe County is one of the two counties that are having, um, are still on your, on your list. 
Are you seeing any positives coming out of or positive um, indicators coming out of Washoe County that we're moving in the right direction, um, or Clark County for that matter, because that's where the people live in the state of Nevada? Are you seeing positive trends um, as we go through this, or are you still or negative trends, or we're staying the same? Uh, what what would be your um, outlook for the two counties? Uh, thank you for the question, Caleb Cage. For the record. Um, and Madam President, do we go through you or do we go directly? I don't go directly, okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure we have the proper protocol. So um, Washoe County is not on the list actually uh, as of last week, I believe. It's relatively recently uh, and it's, it's tied to, for Washoe County, it's really been what we call test positivity. So the percent of uh, tests uh, cases that have been identified within the numbers who have been tested uh, and Washoe County, uh, I believe last Monday, not not the, not yesterday, but the week before, uh, was the first time that they were off the list since the beginning. So that's that's the the trend we're looking for, right? It's uh, the declining number of positives, uh, which I which I appreciate you clarifying uh, what you meant by positives. There, it's a confusion we have often in these discussions. What we're seeing right now is if you go back to early August. Uh, we were at our we were at our peak for cases, for hospitalization, for um, uh, everything but deaths. And and the reason why, and I apologize for talking about this so administratively, but it's looking at the data that we look at. Um, the deaths occur probably about five weeks after the case is identified. So you have a five week lag there and we're still experiencing some of those most likely from that early August period. Uh, but that was our that was our peak. Um, two weeks prior to that, um, we uh, we were working. Uh, three weeks prior to that, we were working on mitigation measures that would help us to get to this place we are right now. Uh, Governor Sisolak closing bars in a number of counties at that time, uh, as well as uh, the mask order, which was a couple of weeks before that. So statewide right now, we are trending in the right direction. And we, we want to, I'll speak for both of us, I hope you don't mind, we want to encourage everyone to look at this in terms of trends and not single data points or single days or even a couple of days together. Uh, these trends over time have been favorable here in the state. However, we, uh, and, and I'll, I'll just say it right now, we have to stay vigilant because uh, flu season being among us um, and, uh, or upon us and, and other factors that are beyond our control, um, we could be into a, a, we could be in, into another situation here uh, relatively soon. So I don't know if that answered your question completely or not. No, it did. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you clarifying. I guess I just assumed that Washoe would be one of the two counties. So it's great that Washoe is not on the list and hopefully it, it uh, stays that way as we move forward. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Madam President. Trustee Simon Holland. Thank you, Madam President. And, and likewise, thank you both. And thank you to all of your teams for all of the hard work that they're doing. I know this has been a tremendous heavy lift for, uh, for all of you. So thank you for that. Um, we've had a lot of questions from folks who are interested in athletics and uh, wanted to uh, see if you all could comment on um, what's the likelihood of athletics being able to come back. I know the, the NIAA is very involved in following Governor Sisolak's directives and uh, they have a plan for uh, fall athletics to be uh, done uh, during 2021. Just wanted to give you an opportunity to comment if you have any any guidance or any uh, any thoughts. Thank you, uh, Trustee Simon Hall and Caleb Cage for the record. Um, so, as as you're aware, and you mentioned NIA, they have um, uh, made the decision to uh, push the fall athletics into the spring, um, which which I think is a commendable, difficult, and commendable decision. And I know that uh, is difficult for. Uh, a lot of people who who would otherwise be part, uh, participating in this fall, um, and and I I have not I do not know of any changes to that necessarily that would would drive that right now and and would would certainly be um, you know happy to follow up with the NIAA. I'm sure you have better connections there than I do, uh, if that would be helpful at all. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate the response. I just wanted to give you all an opportunity to comment um, whether there was any um, possibility that there would be changes. So thank you for that. 
Thank you. I have a question if no one else. Okay. Um, just hearing you kind of go through the timeline and where we started in March and kind of where we are today, um, the district, you know, I think has been, uh, since we started conversations about the reopening plans, uh, started the conversation around kind of what would take us back to a, if we're gonna go in person, what would take us to a closure or a full distance kind of model. And at our last meeting, we did uh, determine that we, you know, sort of keep an eye out on some different indicators um, that are community wide, but for the most part would be uh, working with the health district on a sort of more focused, um, to use your words, uh, Mr. Cage, uh, case by case, site by site, school by school basis. Um, and I just wondered if you could share with me if you see, you know, and I know you can't see into the future, but <laughs> a time where the state would go back into kind of a full, you know, maybe closure or shelter in place mode um, should, you know, is there any reason as a district that we should be uh, looking at, you know, what would, take us as a, a Washoe County School District to a place where we would say it's just no longer safe to have in-person learning. Yes, uh, Julie, Julia, do you mind if I take a shot at that? So this is Caleb Cage for the record, um, President Raymond. Um, so the no crystal ball is a, is a, um, is a challenge here, of course. Um, what, what the governor, what Governor Sisolak has said from the beginning is that he's prioritizing health and safety of all Nevadans and basing his decision off of the input of uh, medical and public health experts. Um, so given the number of conditions and situations that could arise between now and some uh, sometime in the, in the uh, non foreseeable future, um, then I think um, you know, those are the sorts of decisions that would be made based off of the, the data really that are, that are driving that. So in, in the event, a hypothetical, in the event of a uh, significant increase in cases, uh, there could be a scenario where public health or medical experts or other advisors to the governor make a recommendation um, that would result in, in additional restrictions and that sort of thing. So uh, not knowing um, what that would look like, I know our goal, number one goal is to protect the uh, health and safety of Nevadans and, and that, would be, um, that would be a function of whatever the situation was. So uh, I know that's, a, that's, a, a, that's my best answer for a, a future hypothetical. So um, you asked if, if there was I, I, I don't recall the other aspects of the question, so I'll stop there. I apologize, Julia. Yeah, I would just add a couple things. Is one of the biggest challenges with COVID is that the data won't reflect what happened yesterday. It reflects what happens two weeks ago. So any decisions, if you were to see a spike in cases tomorrow in Washoe, that's really for events or policies that went in place two weeks ago. And so we're learning as we do this. That said, we're now several months into this and we know what prevents spread. Wearing masks, which is required, social distancing, um, washing your hands, all of the things that Washoe County has put in place and really that we're seeing statewide based on the governor's directives as well. So it's ensuring that those mitigation efforts are in place and that we're watching the data. Um, as I mentioned before, Washoe County is doing a great job watching the data. Statewide, our staffing for public health, again, was minimal statewide and now has grown eightfold. And so knowing that we have a public health infrastructure now that can respond, as long as those other things stay in place, mitigation, data quality, um, participation by our community. Again, if you get a call and you're a case to be transparent about your contacts and allow us to follow up appropriately, as long as all those things stay in place, we should be able to adapt, detect any issues and then quickly respond very strategically to wherever we're seeing that. So um, based on that structure we have now, I, I, I would not see that, but again, um, no crystal ball. Thank you, that's helpful information. I appreciate that. All right. Oh, Vice President Taylor. Thank you, Madam President. And Ms. Peek, um, this 
please, please forgive me if this isn't in the area that you work, but it's, I know you're, you've been talking somewhat, you've mentioned several times and Mr. Cage um, referred to you on some contact tracing. We, we get a lot of questions regarding, you know, when there is a case that has been identified, you know, someone in the school, whether a, a student or a staff member, whatever, and sometimes your people are excluded and sometimes others are not excluded. C can you talk a little bit about the difference in that? There, there seems to be people aren't, people are, they get really concerned. Why wasn't I excluded? And we don't make the decision anyway, it's with the health district, but if you can share on that, that would be helpful. Yeah, thank you for the question, Julia Peek again. Um, so people get concerned that they were included or were not included. I was a close contact and I should get tested. Um, case investigation is very complicated, I'll say. Um, and so what happens during the, the course of a case investigation to identify those contacts is the case investigator goes through each day with the individual of when they could have potentially exposed people. Um, it's a long interview and people forget interactions they've had. And so what we talk about is who were you in close proximity to, meaning six feet for 15 minutes or more. Let's talk about last Tuesday. And that's a really hard um, thing for people to remember. Um, the COVID trace app hopefully will um, get at that more for, to help um, identify those exposure points. But for the individual of the case who's getting identified, they could identify people. And then when you go talk to the contact, they could say, no, it was not six feet. It was eight feet and it was five minutes. And so we go through that contact tracing explanation with the individual, but they could be totally, we've had cases where there was a close contact and the individual wasn't identified during the case investigation for whatever reason. And so they think they should have been included and then should be quarantined at home. So public health is trying to respond to those different scenarios. But the easiest thing to say is within six feet for 15 minutes, you should consider yourself potentially exposed. Um, what we encourage is five to seven days after that exposure, go and get tested out of fear. Many people once told they were exposed either directly by the individual or through case investigation is fearful and might go get tested a day after exposure. And, and the, the virus just won't come up positive on the laboratory result. So that's all things you can talk through with, with public health if you're concerned or have questions, but, but it is a confusing and imperfect system, though we've tried to find ways to uh, make it work easier. Thank you. May, may I follow up, Madam President? Just the, the, the six feet within 15 minutes, we've, we've, we've learned that. Margaret Allen has taught us that. Um, is, is that with or without a mask, or does that not matter? In that scenario, it doesn't necessarily matter. It's part of the discussion with the case investigator, but that is really the standard. Certainly, your risk of exposure has decreased exponentially, but you still met the CDC case definition of a close contact, but likely you won't become positive if you were both masked and, and that scenario was true. Again, and then potentially if you were outdoors, there's different scenarios where your risk went down substantially, but you're still identified as a close contact. Okay, thank you very much, that was very helpful. All right, any other questions? Superintendent McNeil. Thank you very much, President Raymond. Well, I just want to thank Mr. Cage. Um, we truly appreciate the Nevada health response summaries that you send out. I do an update three days a week to, to our internal COVID task force as well as the Board of Trustees, and I know that they look forward to that information, so thank you for putting that out, as well as the weekly update. It's very, very important for information for us. And then, um, Ms. Peek, I was just wondering, you had mentioned um, the vaccine and you had mentioned within a month to six weeks. Um, all the information that I have heard is that there are going to be um, particular populations as far as essential um, workers within the hospital and the healthcare system. Can you go just a little bit more into depth as far as what that would look like in the state of Nevada for the vaccine? Julia Peek, thank you for the question. And again, this is all assumption based on um, everything you see in the media and what CDC is providing to us. So hopefully by November, we'll start seeing the vaccine again in limited doses. Um, and so our team right now is working with the local health department, the governor's office to look at what groups can be prioritized, but we don't know at this point a date or quantity. And so those are very limiting factors, but based on the plan, we'll be able to um, increase or decrease based on the supply of what that looks like statewide. It's just too early right now. We're just trying to put that plan in place. All right, well, it looks like that covers our questions. Um, 
If there's anything more that you have to add, I'll give you the last chance here. <laughs> uh, thank you again, Caleb Cage, for the record uh, on, on the state's behalf. Thank you very much for all the work that you are doing for our faculty, staff, and students and their families throughout the county. Uh, really appreciate that. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Well, thank you again. I, um, again, know how busy you both are. I know what a limited team there is running all of this behind the scenes. And um, just thank you both for stepping up and being such leaders at this time in our state. And I appreciate all that you both have done and um, look forward to continuing to be able to communicate and work with you in the hopefully not forever, but <laughs> in the months to come. <laughs> no offense, but <laughs> all right. Thank you both. <laughs> So it is 3.52 um, and we have um, decided to wait until 4 p.m. to begin our uh, agenda item 3.01 at 4 o'clock. Uh, so I would uh, like to just take a brief recess because we do know that once we start public comment and we'll move into our budget item that we'll have a, kind of a, a long uh, work session ahead of us. So if everyone would just be back here at 4 p.m. Thank you.
Um, so we are now going to move on to back up um, to agenda item 3.01. This is public comment. Um, we will um, be hearing from people here physically, um, and so if you have a yellow public comment card submitted, um, we'll call your name out to make that public comment. Um, but we, I know, also have some email public comment that has come in, um, and you are still able to, if you're watching us from home or work, um, submit public comment to the email address publiccomments at washoschools.net. Uh, those public comment emails are uh, sent to each trustee. We read those during the meeting. We don't read them aloud, but we will read the name of the individual that submitted the public comment. Um, and so I will now, um, or just uh, one more item uh, for public comment at this time, 3.01 is general public comment. It is not public comment related to a specific agenda item. It is general to um, the district, and I will now ask our Recording Secretary, Ms. J.J. Batchelder, to um, start us off. I believe you'll be reading the names of the emails first, but um, I know because of the separate rooms that you'll probably get the list of names going for those that will speak in person as well. <laughs> Correct. So in person, we will have Deanna Fine, Pablo Nava Duran, Bob Fulkerson, Jeff Church, and Dora Martinez. We received emails from Shannon Spursky, Karen and Jeff Roseborough, Cher T, Jesse Campbell, Yvonne Williams, Trina Kleinhens, Sherry Adelman, Steve Janowski, Sarah Dawkins, Andrea Ramirez, Jenny Snaza, Will Harper, Karen Devlin, Isabel Peralta, Kat Katiana Taylor, Casey Smith, Ed Atkins, Dino Mahler, Rael Porter, and David Thaxton. Deanna Fine. Wow, well, first one. <laughs> Hello, my name is Deanna Fine, and I am a recently retired elementary educator who taught for 22 years. I am here today to share my thoughts regarding the naming of the future CTE Academy. All of my life, I have worked in Title I schools composed of many minority students living in poverty. As a teacher, I wanted my students to see themselves as empowered to be lifelong learners and to believe in the value of education in order to become contributing members of society. There is much to be said in the naming of a school. Children need to see a future that is not dictated by wealth, race, class, money, or privilege. To this end, it is important for children to have a figure they can aspire to. They must understand that those who have come before them have met and overcome challenges that they too face every day. This connectivity can be made when students recognize their own struggles in the person which the school represents. This is not only the case for black and brown children, but it is also important for white children to envision a person of color as someone to look up to and behold. Thus, the namesake of a school is an opportunity to tell an in-depth story that bridges the gap between the difficulties faced by minorities and the possibility of academic excellence. The designation needs to represent equity diversity, inclusiveness, perseverance, and drive. Dolores Feimster was an individual who embodied these qualities. Her name should be honored as someone who uplifted education in the community she served, in the very place these children are a part of. She was the living testament to the belief that every child has incredible potential for success. 
As a concerned community member, I'm requesting that you disqualify the school naming from the May 12th school board meeting. In addition, I implore you to take the bold step to agendize Dolores Feimster CTE. Please put the school naming back on the agenda and allow the community to have a chance to participate in good spirit with the board intention of fair and true consideration. I support the naming of the Old Hug High School to the Dolores Feimster CTE Academy. This is the chance for Reno to become a more progressive city, which truly represents those who live and learn here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fine. Pablo Nava Duran, Bob Fulkerson, Jeff Church, Dora Martinez, Diana Dingledine. Uh, okay, good morning. Uh, do, uh, I say good afternoon to you or good morning to you if you wake up late. So, uh, so, um, so I don't get, I don't get tired, but, but I have a good, good chance to fall about get higher. So that's very good news. So hopefully you get higher by, uh, by the next two weeks. So, uh, so I, I like to talk about the political flag, you know, like you guys do not, do not support cur on a Black Lives Matter or LBGQ flag, or you should banning um, the the for the LBGQ flag because it seems like it's too political. Okay, so it does understand your concerns. So keep it doing safe from a political. I, and I know that I love politics. I used to love politics. And now I don't like politics because it's so divisive, and then so and uh, politicians are being dishonest for for the natural part. But you're not. You seem like you're a little bit politician, but but you're be honest. So so I like being honest. So. Uh, so, if you're concerned about banning a political flag, that's ban, uh, that's, that's ban, not such LBTQ, that's ban, like, this, that's ban a flag that concerns a political, that makes student unsafe, and, uh, make a school, uh, a safer environment from, get away from political things, and, um, and I have, a. Uh, Concern about the dropping of school moments, and we should talk about an agenda. Um, and uh, I don't know how to say. Um, so, and uh, I know the the black and brown students are suffered the most during a pandemic because because their parents were were working by ends meet to provide their students. So we should like. Concern additional research for the student, especially the near world area or Sun Valley area. Uh, so, and then we know I've become a increasingly diverse city, and uh, and 2026 it will will hopefully gain the gain the seat uh, by fifth Nevada fifth seed, and uh, for the National Water Tradition Day and. I'm not sensitive, but um, if you are sensitive, go vote. So, Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Mr. Navadran. Bob Fulkerson, Jeff Church, Dora Martinez, Diana Dingledine, Rachel Fisher. Hi, my name is Bob Fulkerson with the Progressive Leadership Alliance Nevada, and I'd like to co-sign on everything that Deanna Fine said about uh, the renaming of the school after uh, Dolores Feimster. I'm also here in support of teachers, staff, and students who want to make the district safe 
from COVID, from racism, and from bigotry. I'm here specifically to endorse the demands of Washoe County School District students for change and change our narrative. Growing up and going to school here at the district, like all students here and across the country, my history was whitewashed. Uh, the first thing, for example, I learned about George Washington was about the cherry tree. I never learned that he enslaved 300 black people whose teeth he sometimes extracted for his own use. I was indoctrinated into thinking this country was founded as a democracy in which all men are created equal. But I didn't learn that people only meant white men who owned property. Since our founding, there's been a slow process of democratization with rights accorded to those who were locked out. To me, that's what the Black Lives Matter movement is about. The simple acknowledgement that a black person's life matters just as much as mine as a white person. But what does your ban on discussing Black Lives Matter say to black kids in the district? Intentional or not, it says that their daily existence is not important to you. Um, and, and what does it say to LGBTQ kids when you banned this symbol? What does that say to them? You know, right back here, there's an anti-gay slur in, 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 right back here in your control room. What's that say to the gay kids here? Um, and why do you consider flying that flag such a threat? Is this the transgender pride flag? Is that allowed or is that too threatening as well? I well remember my friend Derek Henkel, who was subject to ruthless anti-gay bullying at Galena, at Wooster, Washoe High, and the district had to pay a very, uh, the highest settlement fee to date. More tragically, I remember the rash of suicides in this town, of kids who struggle with their sexual identity, like I did. And by criminalizing the rainbow flag, and by criminalizing Black Lives Matter, you're telling black and LGBTQ kids that their lives are less important than the comfort of straight, cis, white people here in this district. Banning the flag in these discussions is counter to, to democracy, and it's anti-education. So in closing, your handling of these issues is eerily sim similar to the way you've handled the COVID crisis in the reopening. It's basically, trust us, you know, a resolution is on the way. Um, but you're simply making it up as you go along. And I think that's symbolized by your now very cozy relationship with the Washoe County Health District, whose advice to not reopen, you conveniently ignored because it went against what you wanted to do. Um, so we demand that you do better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fulkerson. Jeff. Sorry, JJ, one second. I think okay. uh, Dr. McNeil wanted to respond to one thing. Thank you very much, Mr. Fulkerson. So for clarity and for the public, the policy ha that has been referenced um, in your statement as far as board policy 1310, which um, I would imagine that that's what you are referencing, is not new, and it has been in place for some time, and I think that there is an assumption that it is new, but it is not. Our district community, much like our national community, holds a variety of political viewpoints. And in some instances, those viewpoints are in conflict. We have an obligation to accommodate and welcome our students and staff from a wide variety of backgrounds. With regard to staff members, they are free to engage in political speech in their personal life. It is important that all of our students, I repeat, all of our students and families feel welcome and appreciated in our school buildings regardless of their political viewpoints in our schools. For our students, we celebrate the rights to free speech as long as that speech is not profane, promotes violence, promotes illegal drug use, or is considered hate speech. The district will continue to foster safe places for our educators to hold conversations and learn about the social injustices that already affect our students. We will also be a safe place for our students, irrespective of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, or disability. There has never been any words from this superintendent or this board as far as criminalization 
of Black Lives Matter or LGBTQ+. Thank you. So it's okay to hang the flag down? Is that criminalized? We can't get into a discussion. She just wanted to make that statement. So I think we can move on now, JJ. Thank you. Jeff Church, Dora Martinez, Diana Dingledine, Rachel Fisher, Kelly Curl. Ready? Good afternoon, folks, and that was very well said. My name is Jeffrey David Church. I'm a candidate for the Washoe County School Board District A, South Reno. As you know, Scott Kelly, my opponent, resigned under pressure from the Washoe County School District Board on August 27th. Quote, his actions clearly lack integrity and call into question his trustworthiness, end quote, Melina Raymond Chair, WCSD Board of Trustees. I'm here to discuss something that's not on the agenda. I'd like to discuss Kellygate. WCSD promotes transparency and honesty. An extremely serious issue is that Scott Kelly, while he was on the board and thus employed by the WCSD, allegedly created fraudulent social media stolen identity accounts and WCSD refused to investigate. I call upon the board members to simply answer if they did or did not have warning of these accounts and what action, if any, they took. Likewise, very senior staff, such as the superintendent, COO, and PIO should be asked. Nothing complicated here. Silence is complicity. If any board member or senior staffer participated in these fake accounts, they should resign. If any employees have knowledge, they should report it through their proper channels. Now, I want to explain why this hits home. One of those reported accounts was David Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. I am Jeffrey David Church, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, not E-R-Y. The email associated was djeff1199. 1199 is the police code for officer needs help. I am retired from the Reno Police Department. In essence, it appears my identity was stolen and misused and WCSD refuses to investigate and thus far all board members refuse to acknowledge that they did or did not know about this going on. One of those references involved an alleged statement of an Air Force retired lieutenant, or correct, an Air Force retired colonel threatening to shove a Corvette up the, I'll say it politely, rear of somebody that they were complaining about. I'm a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Reserve Commission. Again, it points back to me and insinuates that perhaps I was the one doing the false fraudulent emails. We need an, we need an inquiry. I'm not really asking for a full investigation, but an inquiry. We need to know if any board members knew about this, any senior staff that I listed, if they knew about this, and if not, let's move on. But if they did, then we need a further investigation and something needs to be done. I, I've been victimized by this. And so uh, I, I ask you to look into it and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Church. Dora Martinez, Diana Dingledine, Rachel Fisher, Kelly Curl, Lisa Cohen. Thank you. What do I just speak? Oh, okay. Good evening. Stop it. Sorry. Um, so my name is Dora Martinez and I'm really nervous, so I, I really don't don't want to do public comment, but on behalf of myself, I'm totally blind and for other parents who are, um, some of them are blind and some of them are physically disabled, so they couldn't come in person, although they would really want to. Um, I want to make sure that the website, because we are, all our children are doing um, distance learning, and I have a friend who is blind and her kid is um, first grade. 
She's not in IEP or anything like that. The child is not. But the mom is blind, and it's really difficult for the mom to, um, you know, like if, you're, if you all are parents, you want to be there and help your child. And it's hard for the parent to assist the child when school is done. And the teacher, and I would think, you know, since we are all getting federal grants to the district under Title II, their website should be accessible, and the teachers that uses third par party apps, those apps should be accessible as well. I thank your staff, um, Superintendent McNeil, who stepped up and put and gave the parent a laptop. It's old, but you know, hey, we make lemons out of lemonade, or lemonade out of lemons, sorry. Um, she's working on that, but it's tedious. And I'm here because she stays up until 2 a.m. To, to help her daughter and <laughs> I've been there too and I just I don't know who else to talk to to make sure that you know she's dealing with COVID and her health that she wouldn't have to deal with a good education and an adequate and accessible accommodation so if somebody could please reach out to me so we could make contact and help this parent. It would be very helpful. And thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Martinez and Dr. McNeil. I know. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. So I'm going to ask um, our Chief Information Officer, uh, Dr. Turner, who is also working with our um, Office of Civil Rights Director, Ms. Gina Sessions, to follow up with you, Ms. Martinez, to make sure that we get that information for you. Diana Dingledine, Rachel Fisher, Kelly Curl, Lisa Cohen, Michelle Rutherford. Good afternoon, Superintendent McNeil, Board of Trustees, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Diana Dingledine, and I teach third grade at Dodson Elementary. This is my third year working for WCSD and I've had a wonderful experience. But guess what? <laughs> we are here again. We are here instead of being at home with our families. We are here again instead of enjoying our personal time or simply to rest and recover from the endless work that we do for our schools, for our students. Instead of all the things that we could do, we are here trying to make our voices heard again. For months now, arguably for years, educators, parents, and community members keep coming back to speak directly, directly to all of you and the public about the realities of students, teachers, and schools, and what they're facing. On a side note, I taught in, California for over 20 years, and they have the same issues as well. Um, not enough funding, large class sizes, et cetera, et cetera. So moving to Nevada, I am faced with the same dilemma that I faced while I was teaching there. And, and we are tired. Like they say, there's no tired like a teacher tired, and that's me. Uh, but I have a burst of energy, I guess, because I'm speaking to everybody. But we are just as tired of coming here as we imagine that you are tired of being here and listening to us. But we are back here again because we don't know what else we can do and because we have no more time to waste. Nevada educators and students do not have time for any more lip service over lawmakers' overdue promises. So please remember, education affects all of us. Education is a community issue. So we, the members of Empower Nevada teachers, are coming together as a community to urge you, once again, to listen, really listen, and most importantly, to act. 
act now before it's too late for our students. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mrs. Dingledine. Rachel Fisher, Kelly Curl, Lisa Cohen, Michelle Rutherford, Stacy Aranda. Hello, my name is Rachel Fisher and I'm a first grade teacher at Lena Juniper and I am also here with Empower Nevada Teachers. And to go off on what uh, Diana was saying, Nevada public education is broken and it has been for years. Despite education being an essential societal service, our state does not invest in it and it shows. Since 2008, we have ranked one of the lowest states in per pupil K-12 spending. Currently, we're 46th, 46th. In order to meet the national average, we need to increase our per pupil spending by nearly 40%. According to the NEA, Nevada currently has the largest class sizes in the country that are almost 40% larger than average. This creates extremely difficult learning and, learning and working conditions for students and educators. Outdated technology and textbooks, a lack of resources, budget cuts, and a culture where education is always a talking point but never a priority has driven the system to its edge. All of these metrics test how Nevada values education and we are quite literally failing ourselves and our students. It is embarrassing, and we should be ashamed. Yet we have been doing more with less for so long that we don't know any better. We know that COVID did not create these problems, but it sure did magnify them. Many of the issues we're currently facing with reopening, the struggles and reasons why we couldn't go long distance, and so much of the anger, frustration, and heartache that you have been hearing for months is because we are trying to do even more with less. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Kelly Curl, Lisa Cohen, <coughs> Michelle Rutherford, Stacy Aranda, Jennifer Grange. Kelly Kroll, also here with Empower Nevada Teachers. The efforts to make up for the educational shortcomings of our state and county, and quite frankly, our entire community, has always fallen on the backs of education. It has always fallen on educators. Educators are and have been working themselves into the ground. Not for more money, not for more prestige, but for the students. Because that's what we do. We sacrifice everything for our students because we feel there's no other way. This is not only unfair, but it is unsustainable. As a state, we have allowed educators to become martyrs for a lack of leadership and support. Teachers will literally put their lives on the line for their students. We are constantly overworking ourselves because we believe it is the only option we have to provide for the students that we love. But if something does not change soon, there will be no teachers left to sacrifice, no one else to pass the buck to. Our profession is slowly disappearing and that inaction by leaders is aiding to its extinction. Across the country, we are witnessing a mass exodus of educators. In Nevada, with all the ways we undervalue education and our teachers, 
This issue is only amplified. We have all heard Malcolm Gladwell's famous numeration that it takes a thousand hour or 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. According to the Washington Post survey, teachers work about an average of 53 hours a week. We're at a school, a little lesson. If we are idealists and pretend that teachers don't work throughout their vacations, which we all know they do, then teachers work about 26 weeks a year. Using that simple math that a teacher once taught us, we can calculate that it takes approximately seven years for a teacher to become an expert. Take a moment and look around at these teachers. Think about the teachers you know. Think about maybe if you were a teacher, how long it took you to become that expert. Did you know that in Nevada, every other teacher you meet, you will not make it past the fifth year in teaching? A third of those teachers won't make it past their third year. Teachers quit not because Ms. they Pally, want to. I'm sorry, your time is up. But because we don't have the support. Thank you. Lisa Cohen, Michelle Rutherford, Stacy Aranda, Jennifer Grange, Kate Carter. Hello, I teach second grade here and I'm also here with Empower Nevada Teachers. Um, this issue of failing to keep teachers, it's not just who we fail to keep, but also who we fail to gain. Um, over the last several years, years, enrollment in the College of Education has gone down over 35%. As we lose more and more educators, fewer and fewer young pe people want to become teachers, and frankly, who can blame them? Most teachers spend four years at a university, endure, count and endure countless hours of training, and collect tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, only to work themselves ragged at a job where they earn, on average, 18.7% less than other college-educated workers. The system is rigged for us to fail. Despite our essentiality to education, we are the ones who are cared least about. Our high teacher attrition rate should be one of our state's biggest concerns because schools cannot function without educators. Yet instead of recognizing this problem as an opportunity for positive change to make teachers feel valued and respected, Nevada settled for a cheap fix. Lawmakers just made it quicker and easier to become a teacher rather than address the valid concerns and challenges that force educators to leave the profession in the first place. The pandemic has only worsened these problems, sharpening the image of why education in Nevada is so inadequate. Just in the last few weeks since school has started, we've already lost numerous teachers because they felt unsupported and unsafe in their school environment. Again, instead of taking this as a sign that something is wrong and needs to change, you're scrambling to fill classrooms with warm bodies. Despite promises, despite that we are living through a pandemic we knew about six months ago, there are no substitutes and we're literally begging for them. We've made it so that a person can have absolutely zero experience in teaching, but still be entirely responsible for the education of our children. In what other profession do we allow a person with zero experience to be fully responsible for the outcomes of their job? Would we allow a person who's had zero training in nursing to be responsible for taking care of patients? Of course not, because people could die. Would we allow a person who's never handled a tool be responsible for building someone's house? Of course not, because people could get hurt. Yet because of desperateness born out of poor planning and delusional foresight, we will allow anyone to become a teacher instead of doing all we can to retain the quality educators we already have. To put it more candidly, it is now currently possible for last year's seniors to be teaching their friends this year under the current hopeless position we find ourselves in. And if we don't do something now that will very well might be the future of our educational system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Michelle Rutherford, Stacy Aranda, Jennifer Grange, Kate Carter, Jackie Weib. Hello. Anyone can see, everyone should know that the madness of these half baked band aid solutions. The people we are harming the most are our children. Do our children not deserve what the rest of the students across the country receive? Do our children not deserve every possible opportunity? This isn't a rhetorical question. 
It should be a question that springs all of us into action and demands each of us to truly do what is best for kids instead of just saying it for political purposes. If you believe in this job you were elected or hired to do, then why do we continue to allow this underfunding of our children's education to occur? Are you okay with this? The public can only assume that you are because we don't hear any of you speaking out and putting pressure on those responsible for our lack of educational funding. This is not a time to be political. Education affects us all. At a time when everything has become political and we are more divided as a society than ever, we have been witnessing Republican, Democratic, and independent educators and community members coming together and fighting for the same cause, the education of our children. There's power in our unity. We can show our community that it's not us versus you or us versus them, that while we might not agree on everything, what we do agree on is that we cannot continue to allow our students to get less than what they deserve. We cannot do this without you, and you cannot do this without us. Educators in our community are getting more organized and more active than they have ever been. We hope that this is something that Dr. McNeil, district leadership, and the trustees will not discourage, but embrace. We hope that our vocal concern for the education of our children will be supported and encouraged. The educators in our community are getting active to save our educational system. We're fighting for the same things that you are. We hope that educators that speak out will not become targets, but that our message will be amplified through our trustees and your leadership. There are many of us spending personal time to share a message with you that we hope won't fall on deaf ears. We need to build the trust between the leadership of this district and the educators in this district so that our community receives one message when they hear our district leaders or our teachers speak out. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rutherford. Stacy Aranda, Jennifer Grange, Kate Carter, Jackie Weib, Kaylin Evans. Hi there. My name is Stacy Aranda, and I am here with I Empowering Nevada Teachers. The only way we can fix a problem is by acknowledging it, that there is one. We have to shine a bright spotlight on these issues so that our community is aware and ultimately will support our fight to fix it. It's the public that has to put pressure on our lawmakers to address these issues. It's on all of us as educators, educational leaders, educational officials to speak honestly and transparently about these issues to educate our public and our lawmakers. The toxic positivity and the constant <clears throat> attempts to present a false view of our school system to this community is hindering us as much as the lack of funding and resources are. It's okay to tell people the truth. It's not a lack of skill or dedication on our part that we find ourselves in this situation. It's because every single one of us is working in a broken system. We've, <clears throat> we are trying to do our best, but we can only, <clears throat> but we can do that with what we have. But in any profession, if you don't provide your workers with the resources and the support to do the job right, the outcome just won't be acceptable. And this outcome is too important to gamble on. Here we have to come together and fight for our children's future. <clears throat> we are here today to ask for help. Teachers spend all of their time trying to help their students keep their heads above water. But now, more than ever, we are all drowning together. Education in Nevada has been a sinking ship and our leaders keep placing icebergs. COVID has broken us and we cannot repair these holes. We need a lifeline. We need the tools to build a new ship. We need, we need leaders 
who won't let us down. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Aranda. Jennifer Grange, Kate Carter, Jackie Wipe, Kaylin Evans, Isabel Peralta. Good evening. I am Jennifer Grange and I teach second grade at West Regard and I am an activist with Empower Nevada Teachers. You all have the power to affect real change, not just talk about it, and we need you. We need you to fight harder than ever to increase funding for education and support the educators and community members you see before you who are in that very same fight. We need you to support teachers in collective action. We need you to join us hand in hand to march through Carson City, demanding lawmakers to stop mistreating our children and educators. We need you to be as angry as we are and help us to amplify this message. We need you to be loud. We need you to get on your platforms, your soapboxes, your social media, and keep talking until your voices are as tired as ours are. We need you to fight harder than ever because we can't afford to lose. We're fighting for our future. If we can do this together, we can keep teachers in this profession. We will attract better teachers to this profession. We will inspire others to fight for what is right and what is good for kids. If we want to change the culture of education and give every child by name and face a solid education, then we need to start with acknowledging what we have done and what we still need to do. We as a community can do better. We deserve better. The future of our community deserves better. To do better requires a meaningful use of our time and resources. We as teachers create lesson plans. We know our desired outcomes and we share our plan with our students for how we will get them there. We desire action and a plan. We are tired of watching people talk. We want to hear how you plan to make the state of education better. Today, we hope you have listened. Tomorrow, we hope you will make a plan to act. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grange. Kate Carter, Jackie Wipe, Kaylin Evans, Isabel Peralta, Dana Hamilton. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Carter, and I am an educator at Sky Ranch Middle School and an active member of Empower Nevada Teachers. Many of our educators in our district want to speak up, not to cast blame, but to bring awareness to the issues that we are facing. They know that in order for these issues to be fixed, they have to be addressed by those of you sitting in this room. Our site administrators are doing everything they can, but even they don't have the resources needed to deal with these issues. Many in our district do not feel comfortable speaking out and Empower Nevada Teachers is constantly being asked to help speak for those who don't feel safe enough to speak for themselves. We've had a number of distance learning educators reach out who feel that they are being pushed to their breaking point. So we wanted to take some time to address these issues with all of you. We hope you will listen with open minds and take these concerns seriously. As educators, we get tremendous satisfaction from contributing to the growth of our community. We care deeply about our students, and that's why we stay in the profession, even as the number of demands placed on us continues to grow daily. 
The year 2020 has thrown a lot of curveballs at all of us. Our students are struggling now more than ever. As educators, we recognize this and we want to be there to support our students. The doors of schools have reopened and we have welcomed our students back into the halls and classrooms, but it is not business as usual. The landscape of education has changed dramatically since last year. Teachers, being the creative and resourceful group of people they are, have devised many new hacks for teaching in an environment that is completely foreign and continually changing. But this takes energy. It also takes resources that we are not being given. Because of the state of Nevada's public education system prior to the COVID, re the reopening is placing immense strain on educators. This was the concern that so many of us at ENT had regarding the reopening plans. It was never that we did not want to be in the classroom with our students under adequate circumstances. It was because we knew we were already underfunded with limited resources, facing an already dire teacher shortage and lack of infrastructure. And because of these shortcomings, the burden of this reopening was going to come at our expense and it has. The morale of educators is dangerously low and the school year has only just started. If we don't act quickly to address the issues, then we will see our students continue to suffer and more educators get pushed to the breaking point. What we want you to do is think to yourself, do you want this for your own children and grandchildren? Would you want these working conditions for yourself or any other professional you know and love? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Yes. Oh, Ms. Uh, Carter, Dr. McNeil wants to add something. Hi, Ms. Carter, I'm gonna have you follow up with Deputy Superintendent Byersdorf for the um, concerns that you had around distance learning and for the particular teachers that have outreached to you. Jackie White, Kaylin Evans, Isabel Peralta, Dana Hamilton, Alexander Gobbin. All right, good afternoon. My name is Jackie Wiebe, and I'm a 27 year veteran of Washoe County School District teacher, a member of Empower Nevada Teachers, and a first year distance learning teacher. I wanted to share um, some direct quotes from some Washoe County School District distance learning teachers. We've been contacted by a lot of them. So one teacher says, I have two to three times the number of students as the in-person teachers do. Another teacher says, being responsible for multiple grade levels with extremely large class numbers means there's no time for small group work, partner work, interventions, in in individual student conferencing, which our students desperately need. Another teacher says, in addition to all the work that goes into simply teaching, countless hours are spent on communication with families, and I am communicating with 70 or more families a day. There are major privacy concerns. For example, I've been videotaped by parents during lessons without my knowledge and discovered this later when they've been shared elsewhere on social media. We are expected to provide IT support to our families as well. I am working more hours a day and on weekends than I have in my entire career as a teacher and it is still not enough. Another teacher said, this is beyond exhausting. I ask you to think about whether or not you would want this for your children or grandchildren and whether or not you would want your loved ones working under these conditions. Please stand up if you find this unacceptable. And another teacher said, this is an unhealthy work environment. End of discussion. These teachers are doing everything within their power to reach all students, all while being reminded that we need to do more with less. Why do we find it acceptable to tell an elementary school teacher that in an online environment, he or she can case manage 50 or more students? We wouldn't imagine doing that for our in-person teachers. Are the students whose faces we only see through a computer screen less important than those whose parents chose in-person instruction? 
We cannot tolerate such treatment of our teachers and students. It's imperative that the district makes a change to the situation right now. It'll take a commitment of more resources, but we cannot delay. We need to work together to make this happen. We need to reduce the number of children the distance learning teachers are responsible for. They should be responsible for one grade and one grade only. And Ms. Weeby, I'm sorry, your thank you. time is up. Um, the issues you've raised are very concerning to us and, and we would you know, expect that uh, our staff be able to help solve those problems. So I know Dr. McNeil already asked um, Deputy Superintendent Byersdorf, because we we want you know the only way we can try to help is if we know you know what the issues are. I'm sorry those teachers don't feel comfortable addressing them directly, um, but if you wouldn't mind, I think uh, Dr. McNeil would have you speak with Deputy Superintendent Byersdorf outside so we can get more information to those specific teachers. That would be wonderful, and I and I know that um, area superintendent Lauren Ford, she's right in the back, and so while Deputy Byersdorf is out, if you want to step outside and speak with area superintendent uh, Lauren Ford, she'll be able to help you out and make sure that we get that information. Absolutely. Thank you. So we can actually go this way. Kaylin, ma'am, I'm sorry. Can you walk this way? Uh, we're trying to keep this the flow of traffic, <laughs> the COVID flow of traffic. Kaylin Evans, Isabel Peralta, Dana Hamilton, Alexander Gavin, Beth Martin. Thank you. Am I on? Okay. Hi, my name is Kaylin Evans. Um, I am also with Empower Nevada Teachers. Um, given the current state of education, there are so many issues that educators and students are trying to navigate. And then you throw on top of that everything that we are dealing with as a society. Um, it's very easy, given how chaotic things are, um, that messaging can get lost. Um, I wanted to take a minute to make sure that all of you in this room understand exactly what ENT's goals and objectives are. Our current fight is tackling the lack of funding and resources that the state of Nevada provides its students, educators, and its school district. We are all in the same boat. Okay, we're doing our very best for the, what's right for our students and our families and our communities, but we aren't being set up to succeed. Our number one goal is to get Nevada education funded at the national average or better so that we can do three main things. Attract and retain quality teachers, reduce class sizes, and provide better mental health services for our students. We believe that students and educators in Nevada deserve at least what the rest of the country is getting. We're not asking for anything more, but just to be average. And it, it pains me to be up here saying that we just want to be average, but being average, the amount of funding and resources, if we were anywhere near average, we would be head and shoulders above where we are right now. And that's what we're trying to fight for. We saw massive educational movements in this country in 2018. And it was because the school board members, the superintendent, and educators came together and demanded better for their community. These groups had to force changes for the betterment of the education system. And Nevada students deserve this. I feel like that's something that everybody in this room can agree with. And at a time where we disagree on so much, let's focus on what we do all agree on. And that's the fact that Nevada education is underfunded and under-resourced. And there's nobody that can argue that. You cannot look at the statistics and argue against it. So why don't we get on the same page and same messaging and start making sure that the people who are responsible for those, those errors, it's not the people in this room. We don't control the funding measures of this state, but you guys have a platform. And not only should you be doing this, but you have a responsibility to be placing pressure on lawmakers and having these discussions, not just in closed uh, private meetings, but publicly. We need to be coming together and making sure that the state of Nevada is adequately funding education, and they are not. So I'm hoping that we can attack this together. And I'm hoping that you see the true intentions of what all these educators are coming up here today to tell you and like what we're really trying to accomplish. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Evans. Isabel Peralta, Dana Hamilton, Alexander Gavin, Beth Martin, Angie Reeder. Hello, my name is Isabel Peralta, and I'm a recent graduate of the Galena High School STEM program, senior class of 2020, and I'm the founder of Washington County Students for Change. I'd like to address today some of the rhetoric surrounding the district's restriction of Black Lives Matter and LGBT identity support and discussion. Much of the concern surrounding this restriction is in regards to what is conducive to good learning environments and what is disruptive. Black Lives Matter is disruptive. A, black li er, a rainbow flag is disruptive. Simultaneously, district leadership has expressed commitment to anti-racism and acknowledgement of systemic oppression. But truthfully, to say this disruptiveness is inherently bad is to fail your marginalized students in a hist critical historical moment. The very nature of stepping up for your black and LGBT students is disruptive when it comes in the face of centuries of ingrained hate. After listening to community members and learning about the diverse history of our country, I've come to learn that for years, the rights of people of color and the LGBT community have been guised under politics and not seen for what it is, which is human struggle and disenfranchisement. According to a 2018 study from the Human Rights Campaign, 70% of LGBT students have been bullied at school because of their orientation, 77% receiving unwanted sexual comments, jokes, or gestures in the last year. The Trevor Project, projects, uh, the Trevor Project writes that LGBT youth are five times more likely to have attempted suicide compared to heterosexual youth. Personally, I realize that an all too common experience held by queer youth is a disconnect from visualizing their own futures, a disconnect rooted in the absence of relatable role models and support. On that note, I want to acknowledge the teachers who have been affected by this policy. I commend them for their initiative and for their bravery for returning to a space that, many queer people is the set, that for many queer people is the setting of one of the most emotionally damaging periods of their lives and for being a sign of hope. I commend the teachers who see Black Lives Matter for, for what it is, which is a commitment to inclusivity. It's saying that I see you, and I'll protect your life when others might not. I hate to think of how it feels to be a teacher who survived hatred and discrimination in their adolescence, the racist pushback of the civil rights movement, or the effects of the lavender scare, only to reach this point where we're at right now to be told to tone it down once more. I implore the Washoe County to understand that regardless of however wide a variety of viewpoints you may want to accommodate for, there is no question when it comes to whether a person's colorful and unadulterated presence is justified. The school district can do this by reversing the antiquated policy, implementing anti-racist texts, having a history curriculum that truly demonstrates the diverse background of our country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peralta. Dana Hamilton, Alexander Gavin, Beth Martin, Angie Reeder, Janine Luciani. Hello, my name is Dana Hamilton and I am a counselor at Spanish Springs High School and an ENT team member. On August 2nd, I sent Dr. McNeil an email with an article urging her and the board to reconsider opening school for in-person learning. I re received a reply from Dr. McNeil that referenced her own article in her response. The article she presented addressed opening school at the primary level and in a nutshell, the article shared that we needed to return to school for the social emotional well-being of our students. She then stated in her reply the following, I am sure you can understand our board's decision and my recommendations are based upon any possible risk associated with reopening our schools weigh just as heavily on our minds as the risk we know face our children when they are not in the classroom, especially those students that are, that are in abusive homes and depend on school, not only for learning, but for food and social services. To be honest with, I was stunned by this response. The main reason we are returning to school is because of the social emotional needs of students. Well, on a macro level, I'm sure this is true. Most educators are in this profession because they love children. However, however on a micro level, 
where actions speak louder than words, this reasoning doesn't add up. According to the American School Counselor Association or the ASCA model, counseling caseloads across all levels are to be set at 250 to one ratio. This year I have 370 students on my caseload. Before October of last year, when we received a seventh counseling allocation and for several years prior, I had roughly 450 students. Washoe County is not alone in regard to the high number of students on caseloads. And literature found on the State of Nevada Education website that actual counselor ratio across our state is 464 to one. I know in this district at the elementary and middle school levels, counselor ratios are even higher. In my counseling office, we use terms like crisis response, crisis management, and triage. We have become a mental health emergency room. We do not have the time or resources to address our students' needs at the prevention level. Economic predictors have stated that it will take the U.S. 10 years to recover from this pandemic. 10 years. As a state, we, are, we were just rebounding from the financial crisis of 2008. Education in Nevada cannot take another hit. The students and staff of Washoe County School District need you to join us in this fight this February when the legislative session begins. A major revision of Nevada's K-12 education funding formula must be advocated for. We cannot lose another cent. No more toxic posit positivity and no more doing more with less. To quote the late great Ruth Bader Ginsburg, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Please lead us. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Alexander Govan, Beth Martin, Angie Reeder, Janine Luciani, Farrell Vaughn. Hello, my name is Alexander Govain. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Agnes Risley Elementary. I'm on the leadership uh, team of Empower Nevada Teachers as well. It would be so empowering to see you guys wearing Red for Ed t-shirts on Wednesday and putting those photographs of you all in Red for Ed on the Facebook, Washoe County School District Facebook page. Uh, and help raise awareness and support uh, for an increase in funding. Uh, you have a large, powerful voice that a lot of people will listen to. So for years, we've been handcuffed by an anemic budget given to us by the state that clearly doesn't support or respect education and is determined to prevent equitable education from reaching our 67,000 students. We're calling right now for an increase in funding that matches only the national average and they will not give it to us. This lack of funding is crushing us. Everyone in this room knows that. Staff in every area of our district have been making miracles happen with nothing forever. This year has exposed every crack and fissure and black hole in our education system. And we're here demanding a change and it would make sense that you also demand the same change. We're supposed to be allies. We're supposed to be fighting for the same thing. We're on the same team, but if we're on the same team, it would have been really great to have seen some of you or all of you down in Carson this summer when we lined the streets with the WEA and the NSEA during the special session with signs calling for more funding. The thing is, all of you guys ran for your seats and we all voted for you and you represent the districts that you came from. President Raymond, you represent my district. So we elected you because we believe that you have the strength and the courage to change how this district is run and to try and change how our legislature thinks about education. So that's why we voted for you and you're here and there shouldn't be any division between us. But see, the thing is that teachers are afraid to stand up and raise their voice and stick up for themselves. And they're afraid to criticize any faults in how our education system is run. And there shouldn't be any of this McCarthy era fear of retribution that some of us have when we try and stick up for ourselves, like I said, and bring people together to say enough is enough because leadership comes with criticism. We need to be heading in the same direction. We need your help. We are trying to do right by our kids, 
our colleagues and ourselves, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're deeply invested in this movement to increase educational funding, and we need you to work with us and stand behind us in a new way, and we have to change this at the state level, and we need your powerful voice and your support because it is necessary if things are going to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Govain. Thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, Superintendent McNeil has a response for you. Hello, Mr. Govain. Yeah, Hi. I just wanted to just make a couple of corrections for the record. So, and I think you'll, if you're able to stick around, we're going to be having a presentation around um, our budget and enrollment. And so, actually, our enrollment has decreased from 64,000 students to 62,000 students. So, just make sure that you have that number. And then actually during the summer, um, superintendents across the state actually did provide testimony at the special session in order to mitigate the revenue losses, including the distributive school account. So I appreciate your advocacy very much. Thank you. Beth Martin, Angie Reeder, Janine Luciani, Farrell Vaughn, Kiana Bunting. Beth Martin, um, parent and employee for the record. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, today I wanna start with um, just a personal story. Um, I come from a small village in Alaska where the population year round is about 400 people a place situated in Southwest Alaska, a place in which you have to fly to get there. Once you're there, you see one paved road, um, and that road is 13 miles long and it just ends. Um, all homes are built off long dirt roads along the way. Homes were even built across the river and children who lived there had to fly to school. In my village, everyone took care of each other. There was one school and it served children from preschool to 12th grade. A big class size was 20, and I was one of 17 in my graduating class. It was a place where people opened their homes and worked together. Everyone understood the importance of a good education and building relationships with people in the community. People did what was best for kids, and everyone came together to strengthen our community and help each other even through the toughest of times. Our school was used for every event from basketball to volleyball, Native Youth Olympics, wrestling, funerals, dances, potlucks, community bazaars, even weekend homes for teams that would fly to our village to compete in sports. Our school was our home and it was simply part of our culture. Growing up in a community like that shaped who I am today. I realize and appreciate the power of people when they work together and understand the importance of a solid education. This is why when I started working in Nevada, I was shocked to learn that our education funding is far less than acceptable. I still wonder 13 years into my career why we just still accept it for the way that it is. The state of Nevada continues to fail our children and we as a community need to rally for our children and their future. As I always mention when I talk, overcrowded classrooms, low per pupil spending, lack of mental health resources and low paying salaries is not what's best for anyone. The new funding formula has done nothing but create new winners and losers, and it doesn't even appear to benefit all counties. We're just redistributing money from the same size pie. Um, these children have a constitutional right to an adequate education, and Nevada falls extremely short of this. And it's not even about one incident or one year. This is just part of the culture in Nevada. Shoving kids in overcrowded classrooms, not being able to meet their mental health needs, overworking teachers to fix the world's problems has become the norm. Um, and we just simply can't wait two more years. That's why February is so important to us right now. And we need um, our community be, to be more aware of the issues that we're facing and be there to fight with us. Um, and I just always want to end on a positive note. So I want to give all hands on deck shout out to Ms. President Raymond for moving public comment to four o'clock today. And also a shout out to Kelly Karpchuk, who's a GT teacher at my son's school. Um, she did a great job working with them all week last week for the smoke. Thank you. Thank so, you, Ms. Martin. Thank you. <laughs> Angie Reeder. Janine Luciani, Farrell Vaughn, Kiana Bunting, 
Darcy Clark. My name is Angie Reeder, and I was asked today by a parent in the district, Carmela Thomas, to read her public comment because she could not be here in person. My name is Carmela Thomas, and I am a mother of two elementary school kids. I grew up in a public school and strongly believe in the importance of public schools for our children, despite the significant uncertainty that came with the 2021 school year. However, with each passing week, I am blown away by the inconsistent decision making, lack of communication and lack of transparency that we as parents and teachers must somehow just accept from the school board. It took you all two weeks to give us parents and teachers criteria to be used for distance learning in the event of unhealthy air quality. Two weeks. If this was something that could create a problem due to the change in ventilation system, why wasn't criteria determined beforehand? To add to this lack of decision making and communication, we are now 26 days into the school year and no clear criteria has been decided on COVID numbers in our school district for closures. Why? You continue to push off this part of your responsibility. The positivity rate that is considered elevated and institutes a change in education delivery should not change no matter how deep into the school year we are. Instead, this is demonstrated as a complete lack of your ability to make important decisions, decisions we all need from you in guiding this year to be as successful and safe as we can. Instead, you are asking teachers and parents to sit back and watch. You tell us, we haven't decided yet. This is unacceptable. According to washoeschools.net, the Washoe County School District and the Board of Trustees remain dedicated to engaging our parents and guardians. How have you kept us engaged? You continue to not provide answers or a clear plan on how we should expect clear, easy to determine criteria with the COVID-19 pandemic. From the same website, it is stated, we will continue on the path for improved transparency using meaningful data and processes that are effective. Let me be clear, your methods of communication are not transparent. You continue to not make clear decisions or take longer than necessary. Lastly, the site indicates you will provide accountability. My question to you is how? Knowing that Nevada is last in funding distribution and is 46th in per pupil funding is not your excuse. It is your reason to provide better means of communication and decision making. As a parent, I urge you to fight for a better education system, which includes more state funding and resources for parents and teachers, as well as your obligation to communicate with us all. Do better. Thank you, Ms. Reeder. And if you could uh, share with that parent and uh, that we did make a decision at our last board meeting. It, we don't have a red line in the sand about a metric that puts us to distance, but we do have on the homepage of our website now the criteria it lists the risk factors and all of the cases in the community. Um, and I think that the the metric or the number for the AQI for the smoke days was decided that first week of school. Of course, we did not anticipate smoke days in advance, and so we did not have a number set in advance, but we did, I think, uh, as soon as we could try to get that communication out. So if you could share that with her, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Janine Luciani, Farrell Vaughn, Kiana, Bunting, Darcy Clark, Zachary Quaid. Hi, my name is Janine Luciani. Board mem member, Superintendent McNeil, thank you for your time. I'm a parent, retired teacher, and member of Empower Nevada Teachers. If we had been given adequate funding from our state, we would have had the resources to offer one-to-one -one technology for every student, thereby making it easier to start our year remotely. Nevada needs to start funding education to at least the national average, and to make this happen, we need your help. We need you to fight along with us for our students. Nevada has the highest class sizes in the nation as it, and is ranked 46th in per pupil funding. You hear teachers tell you they are struggling week after week, but why are they bringing this to your attention? For the students. They tell you because they know that without high quality, experienced teachers, small class sizes, and access to mental health services, it is the children who will suffer. Don't you see that this movement is about empowering Nevada? When you fund education, you fund our future. And as the school board, you should be doing everything in your power 
to bring this reality to the attention of the community. I fear that teachers think they do not have enough power to push back. They do. School could not happen without them, and you should be supporting them in this effort because empowering teachers directly empowers students. Teachers, you are the boots on the ground, the first responders, the essential employees, and it's time that you recognize your value. The state, the district, and the community should be listening to you because you know. You know how policies made without your voice adversely affect our children. You know what a few more students in an already crowded classroom means to the education of everyone. You know what it is like to pay for a college education, become a teacher, and still need to supplement, supplement your income with a second job. And you fear that others will not choose this path. I get it. As a teacher, you feel that you have a responsibility to your students, and you will do whatever you want, whatever you can for them. I know you go above and beyond. I recognize that you don't want to take anything away from your current students by exerting your energy outside of your classroom. But think about what happens to your students after they leave you. Will they be in a classroom with an experienced teacher? Will they be in an overcrowded classroom? Will they be taken care of as well as you took care of them? What about next year and the year after that? Think about the big picture. This is about the big picture. The actions you take now will benefit your current students for the remainder of their academic career in Nevada. This movement requires everyone, every single teacher, parent, community member, principal, superintendent, and board member. If you care about our community, you must be in this fight with us because nothing will change if we continue to do more with less. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Luciani. Farrell, Vaughn, Kiana, Bunting, Darcy, Clark, Zachary, Quaid, Hannah, Brannon. Thank you for giving me the time to speak today. My name is Farrell Vaughn. This is my 20th year teaching in the Washington County School District, and I am a member of Empower Nevada Teachers. I'm here to talk to you about the impact of the decision to send students back to school without giving school administrators, teachers, counselors, and support staff the time to properly prepare and appropriately assess our students' needs. In the first five weeks of school, we've had nine in-school cancellation days. On my hybrid a AB schedule, I've seen students only six and seven times. These cancellations, some just before school started, have forced teachers to scramble to change lesson plan plans and quickly transition to the virtual teaching model. I know that full-time distance learning teachers in the district have not had to deal with these disruptions in their teaching because they were able to establish procedures and routines for their students, students for the beginning of the year. Teachers, other staff members, and students' health is at risk. I was exposed to COVID-19 by a student. I just finished a 14-day quarantine. A substitute teacher had to be hired to cover my classes. My exposure created a lot of uncertainty for me and my family. This is the situation that many teachers face. How do we educate our students to protect our loved ones from infection? I have a student who is now on his second 14-day quarantine after being exposed. He's been in class a total of three days and five weeks. The trustee's decision to return to an in-class schedule has created a nightmare scenario, scenario for education, educators, students, and our families. Because of a lack of funding and resources, teachers are being forced to take on extra responsibilities and it's causing them additional stress. We're working far beyond our contract hours and pushing ourselves to the point of exhaustion. At this time, the district does not have enough substitute teachers to cover absences and already overburdened teachers are being asked to give up their precious prep time to cover classes. Some teachers have been assigned to teach in person and virtually at the same time, a nearly impossible and ineffective pedagogical strategy which doubles the teacher's workload and negatively impacts student achievement. And right now, in the six week, weeks of the semester, some teacher schedules are changing as students get reshuffled because of problems with how distance learning programs have been rolled out. Those student scheduling problems have now become the teacher's responsibilities. Many teachers are already suffering from professional burnout, and the lack of support from the school board and the district is not helping them. Teachers have not been given enough time to shift their educational practices. Teachers have been adapting to new educational platforms with little, very little training. Teachers are currently being told to prepare for the evaluation process as if everything this year is normal. And I'm running out of time, so I won't even get into the ridiculous SLO process, which is putting an additional unnecessary burden on teachers who are already overwhelmed by the increased demands of the job. As usual, the responsibility to provide a high quality education to our students during a period of reduced funding, inadequate resources, and a lack of support is falling on the shoulders of teachers. As a result, many teachers are choosing to retire early, and some are quitting the profession altogether. 
This loss of hardworking, dedicated professionals will have a negative impact on the quality of education that our students receive. I've been watching teacher morale drop for years now. So please, hear my plea. Stop adding more duties into overworked teachers' already long list of responsibilities and provide us some relief so that we can preserve our mental and physical health and provide the Thank high you, quality Mr. education. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. I'm sorry your time is up. That our students deserve. Thank you. Kiana, Bunting, Darcy, Clark, Zachary, Quaid, Hannah, Brannon, Elizabeth, Cadigan. Hello, Kiana Bunting, Washoe County teacher, regular at the school board meetings now. Um, so due to my time restraint, you will see me again at your next board meeting to update you on distance learning. But for now, I'm going to ask you to convince our parents some way to convince their students to become more involved in their learning. As a title of the teaching book I read in college, never work harder than your students, but right now I am working insanely harder than my students. And something needs to be done with, about that. So as I'm, what I'm going to address you today is lucky enough this morning I participated in a panel with HGVS students at UNR via Zoom. And I was asked an array of questions about my profession, but one of them asked, how is it going teaching in the pandemic? And how is the social emotional learning going for our students? So without wasting too much time on that, I wanted to speak on a conversation I had with a kindergarten teacher. And she mentioned that it was near impossible to follow the mandate of staying six feet away, an incredibly hard situation to choose between her well-being and the emotional needs of her students that she knows that she needs. Um, but she did slightly say that she doesn't follow the mandate because when a five-year-old's crying, she's going to do what you ask of us to teach, as teachers to do, be there for them, give them support. As for how teaching is going, I paused for a moment because I wanted to give a thoughtful answer, but in truth, it made me think about why I'm still in this profession that I've wanting to be in since before I can remember. And I'm always asked how teaching is going, and my response right now is, well, I'm just trying not to quit, is my daily response. As my fellow teacher stated this morning, um, once you get past that five-year hump, the motivation to stay a teacher becomes hard because we are burnt out and very quickly because we have to keep up with the many lists of things we need to do on a plate of teacher without the lack of support and funding. Teaching should not be this stressful. At what point do I stop picking my career and my students over my mental health? That statement that we need to put the oxygen mask on ourselves before we put it on others doesn't apply to teachers. We are constantly putting the mask on others first before we are able to take care of ourselves. And if we don't stop what we're, what we're doing now, there are not going to be enough teachers around us because we're going to exhaust ourselves. So how do we fix this? I don't want to stop teaching, but there's something that needs to change. Um, since I'm quickly running out of time, I will save the rest of what I want to say. Other than myself and other, a couple other teachers have other jobs. We work other jobs because this job is not enough for what we need to do to make our living, especially in Reno. So as I heard in a recent video of a teacher who was speaking in another district about the same issues because it's all over the world, pay teachers what we earn because clearly you can't pay us what, we worth, what we're worth. So remember us when you get your money right because we deserve this, our community deserves this. You guys deserve us to do better. I don't want to leave but it's very hard to stay in a profession where you feel undervalued, underappreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bunting. I believe uh, Superintendent McNeil has a response for you. So. Hi, Ms. Bunting. I'm gonna ask you to follow up with Dr. Parks because I wanna make sure that kindergarten teacher gets the support that she needs through um, Casey Edgington. She needs to, I'm sorry, you have your public comment at time is up and so we have to be follow, up, follow <laughs> up with Dr. Parks, he's with right Dr. there Parks. in the back. He's getting up right now there for you. Darcy Clark, Zachary Quaid, Hannah Brannon, Elizabeth Cadigan, Kristen DeHaan. My name is Darcy Clark and I'm a high school special education teacher. This is my third year of teaching, and I can honestly say I have never seen such chaos and disarray from the school district. 
It is one thing to force teachers to teach distance learning, hybrid and in-person with hundreds of students on their rosters. It is another issue with COVID going around and lack of contact tracing, as well as no, as well as no real personal protective equipment being provided. I mean, seriously, you gave us a bottle of poison the week before school started, which would have required gloves and goggles because of how toxic it was, yet you expected us to clean our classrooms with this poisonous substance. That tells me you really have no regard for any of our lives and think we are disposable like human garbage. We were told you would have masks provided and gloves, but that never happened in numerous schools either. COVID is still a concern to lots of teachers, but a bigger concern is the fire days that have caused distance learning. Dr. McNeil, you stated that for these reasons, whenever it is safe to do so, we will ask employees to report to work on site for the workday. It is important to reiterate that the decisions in this situation are based on the potential for prolonged exposure for students who are identified as a vulnerable population when considering the walk to school. The requirements for increased ventilation on our buses and utilization of outdoor spaces throughout the school day. These factors don't apply to employees in our buildings who are safe to occupy during the workday. I can assure you, these buildings are not safe to occupy during the workday. And you would not know that because you never set foot in the buildings breathing in the smoky air. We have headaches, sore throats, coughing, and asthma attacks. We have recirculated air from outside coming into the schools because of COVID. Not all of the elements of air pollution are aromatic or even clearly visible. These microgram particles from the AQI cannot be seen or smelt. However, they can lodge into your lungs, even pass into your bloodstream and lower your immune system. I've had administrators say, well, your room is not smoky, as if that validates any of this. But there was a week when it was 512 for the air quality index, but there was no odor and no smoke. However, there was a ton of microparticles. These conditions will decrease teachers' lung capacity and decrease our chances of fighting off COVID if we do get sick. But once more, you don't care. You're killing us. You're killing us with smoky buildings, tremendous workloads, stress, long work hours, and lack of support. This is not what teaching is supposed to be like. Most teachers cannot follow contract hours because they have too much online work to do from 12 to 14 hour work days. At my school site, we average 10 absences a day. All hands on deck? None of those hands come from district admin. They all come from teachers who are already overworked and are expected to cover when there are no subs. We are tired of the lack of respect given to us. You can observe this by noting the number of teachers who retired, resigned, took leave, or are burning through their sick leave. My final request for you all is when the economy recovers, can you come up with one simple reason why anyone should come here to teach? If you can't, the future Washoe County School District will be one where classrooms are staffed with day-to-day -day subs. Thank you. Go ahead, Superintendent McNeil. Yeah, Ms. Clark. So you made some pretty serious accusations there. So it's going to take some time, but we will do an investigation on those. As far as you mentioned, no PPE, you mentioned a poisonous substance. You mentioned hundreds of students on special education caseloads, as well as regular teacher caseloads. You mentioned no face coverings within our schools and administrators not providing support. So I'm going to ask Deputy Superintendent Byersdorf to follow up with you tomorrow to make sure that we get um, accurate information. Thank you. Zachary Quaid, Hannah Brannon, Elizabeth Cadigan, Kristen DeHaan, Cindy Anderson. First, I would like to thank the board for meeting with me, oh, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Zachary Quaid. I'm in eighth grade at Swope Middle School and I'm here to declare my support for BLM and the LGBTQ plus community. As a white individual, there is no possible way I can comprehend the history of oppression that people of color have endured. Through the cruelties of slavery to the prejudices that have sprouted from burdening socioeconomic factors confronted by racial minorities. And as the, and even as the friend of many LGBTQ plus individuals, I've only seen the tip of the iceberg, an iceberg full of uncertainty and fear. So when I see my school district call support to people of color and the LGBTQ plus community political speech, I feel ashamed. That is why I stand in solidarity with Washoe County School District Students for Change. When the statement all men are created equal was written, it was not in relation to Democrats or Republicans. When the claim that all men have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it was not claimed in relation to the left or right. 
And when you politicize support for basic human rights, I only see the abyss under the bridge for equality deepen. Not to mention, national education lacks the teachings of LGBTQ plus and black history. Why can you not teach the failures of our people, but you can suppress support for black and LGBTQ plus communities? In a 2015 survey, 63% of students said they had never heard about LGBTQ plus history in school. A study also conducted in 2015 found that only nine, 8 to 9% of history class time was dedicated to black history, 8 to 9%. In a time where inequality as, is as prevalent as ever, and in a time where schools nationally lack education relating to many communities, we cannot prohibit support for these people. I do not expect that any policies will change, but I do expect all of you recognize your role in fueling the fire of inequality. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Quaid. Hannah Brannon, Elizabeth Cadigan, Kristen DeHaan, Cindy Anderson, Tanya Pullman. Hi, thank you for your time today. My name is Hannah Branch. I'm a student in Worcester's International Baccalaureate Program and a member of the Anti-Racist Reform Group, Washoe County Students for Change. I'm speaking today in response to Washoe County's ban on teacher support of Black Lives Matter and LGBT plus identities, and specifically the, consider the consideration of these topics as political speech. Through ongoing discussions with you and other district leadership, we've become familiar with Board Policy 1310, political activity in schools. We have been told numerous times by district leadership that this ban of teacher support um, under, is under 1310, so it would be easy for any student, parent, or community member to mistakenly understand this BLM LGBT plus policy as um, old or written in stone. Um, however, upon further examination, we realize that it is not written at all. In other words, the policy that we previously understood to be holding us back from making progress with the district to allow teacher support for these groups is in fact unrelated to identity-based expression, thus creating an encouraging opportunity for you to take action. The purpose of 1310 states that during school hours, no student or other person should be subjected to partisan political activities on WCSD property or at district-sponsored events. The policy goes on to specify that the district cannot fund candidates, ballot questions, initiatives, or petitions, or any other matter currently before any local government agency. None of this applies to Black Lives Matter or LGBT plus people. 1310 claims association to several board policies, including 1321 and 1140. 1321 only bans student participation in partisan events. 1140 limits the posting of materials from organizations external to school. But once again, neither BLM nor the LGBT plus community is directly an organization and definitely not a political one. The policy also cites NRS 281A, which only prohibits government spending in support of or opposition to specific ballot questions and candidates. With knowledge of these policies and their language comes a clear understanding that they need not and in fact necessarily do not inherently limit identity-based expression policy. This means the district's treatment of LGBT plus teachers and Black Lives Matter support was and continues to be up to you. While we understand a rule limiting teacher support of a candidate or initiative, the comparison of a rainbow mask with one that endorses a political party presents a fundamentally false equivalency. People of color and LGBT plus people exist across the political spectrum, and it is irresponsible to signal to our students that their value is up for debate come election season. Because the policy you've told us was holding you back from promoting equality is unrelated to the groups in question, and because you've expressed support for anti-racism, please take action today to reverse your rule and consider anti-racism in text, curriculum, and hiring as outlined in our ongoing petition and in the letter we sent two months ago. With this encouraging space for action in the policy, sorry, we encourage you to not only empower our voices, Branch. but support our plans for inclusivity. Quick, 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 thank quick. you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Branch. Elizabeth Cadigan, Kristen DeHaan, Tanya Pullman, <coughs> Ashley Wade.
Superintendent, Board of Trustees. My name is Elizabeth Cadigan, and this is my 11th year serving as a music teacher with Washoe County. As a child, I received my entire K-12 education for public schools within Washoe, Glen Duncan, Desert Heights, Trainer, and Hug High School. I share this information with you today because I believe it is important to note that my perspective is one of both a former student and a current teacher within our district. A few weeks ago, I received an email from Dr. McNeil that described how the district has always worked to do more with less, and that this was something that the district has done for years in order to provide services for our employees, students, and families. Well, I recognize that Dr. McNeil was using this phrase to address the sacrifices that our central office has made to their staffing positions in an effort to divert reductions away from the classrooms, I could not help but stiffen as I read those words. Why is this phrase being used as if it is a good thing? I have seen our district do more with less for decades. As a result, I, like many of my colleagues, students, and families, have been conditioned to think that this was the norm. Our district has always had to make sacrifices in staffing, classes, and resources. Teachers have always worked long hours for little pay, always accepted the added tasks and assignments, and always provided their students with more, oftentimes out of their own pocket or personal time to find the support to do so. It wasn't until I started connecting with teachers outside of Washoe and seeing how what we do in our district compared to other places that I started to realize that conditioning our students, family, and staff to believe that doing more with less is just the way things are does nothing but hinder our students from receiving the quality of education they deserve. Across the board, doing more with less has resulted in added responsibilities and less support, larger class sizes with less space, increased vacancies and fewer replacements. None of these things do more for anyone. This conditioning needs to stop. Our students deserve better and our community deserves better. Prior to the pandemic, our district's per pupil funding was dismal. Ranked as one of the lowest in the, rates in the nation, our funding has been in need for a major rehaul for quite some time. To tell the community that we must do even more with less when we've had so little in the first place is unacceptable. How long will it take before we are able to return to the level of funding we had before the pandemic? How long will it take after that to reach a level of funding that is comparable to the national average? As the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees, I recognize that your voices and opinions carry a lot of weight within our community. Rather than continue to condition our community in thinking that doing more with less is just something we do here in Washoe, I call on you to help us raise awareness of our need to properly fund our schools by adding your voices to those currently advocating for adequate school funding, such as Empower Nevada Teachers. Do what's right for our students, for our community, and for our future. Thank you, Ms. Cadigan. Kristen DeHaan, Tanya Pullman, Ashley Wade. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen DeHaan, and I am the teacher of a senior at AACT High School, as well as a special education teacher at Drake Elementary School. I'm also a member of Empower Nevada Teachers, WEA, and SEA. I want you to imagine how great it would be if our state were properly funded and we were able to have smaller class sizes at all levels. Imagine being able to have per pupil funding that was at the national average instead of being 46th in the nation. Imagine funding that would allow for hiring more school psychologists because currently in Nevada, some school psychs are responsible for up to 2,800 students. Imagine being able to hire more social workers and more counsels, counselors. Imagine being able to truly address students' mental health. It sounds pretty great, doesn't it? My fervent hope is to make this a reality by going to Carson City in February when the legislature is in session. I want to make a difference for all students in all of Nevada. I hope that you will all stand with us and make your voices heard with us to get this proper funding to our children in this state. We are stronger together. Please join us. Thank you, Mrs. Dahan. Tanya Pullman, Ashley Wade.
Dr. McNeil, Board of Trustees, Tanya Coleman, third grade teacher, ENT, WEA. As a mother, grandparent, and teacher, the number one absolute I want for my children, grandchildren and students is a happy teacher, authentically happy. A teacher who cultivates an environment of inclusion, creates a caring culture, and is able to recognize and support students suffering trauma. Because let's face it, trying to get through life is comparable to trying to build sand castles in the middle of a violently raging ocean. Roughly half of American school children have experienced at least some form of trauma. From neglect to abuse to violence, in response, educators often find themselves having to take on the role of counselors, supporting the emotional healing of their students, not just their academic growth. You all relied upon Dr. Larson's recommendation to open schools after Kevin Dick warned against us, warned us against it. What was her reasoning? What was your reasoning? The mental health, physical safety, and well-being of our students. School is a safe place, but is it? One of the greatest hypocrisies in public education is the idea that schools are safe places. Even before the pandemic, how many of our staff, faculty, and students were victims of harassment or assault? How many teachers have literally walked off the job in our district in the past five years? You expect us to integrate social emotional learning into our teaching or culture. The safe schools literature speaks to this. Yet, if a sixth grade student asks me if they can make a pride flag to hang in the classroom, my response needs to be can't. It would be considered political indoctrination, and so that's a no. Student interpretation, I should be ashamed of myself for being myself. Shame will fester into self-hate, self-harm, and possibly suicide. But hey, maybe the test scores were great on some state-level employee's spreadsheet on Google Docs. Speaking of abuse, have you ever explored the reasons why teaching is now considered the most stressful occupation? Roughly 200,000 teachers leave the profession each year. I'm sure you must know teachers are more likely to suffer job-related stress than other professionals. I will vouch for the fact that working intensively over fewer weeks of the year leads to a poor work-life balance and higher stress levels among teachers. I am starting to really understand why some people stay in abusive relationships, the rationalization, the codependency. That needs to change and it starts now with us. It starts here in Northern Nevada. As politicians, your investment and relationships with your constituents are a priority. I wonder how many of your constituents made threats to educators on social media the past five months. As bilingual students, as an advocate for bilingual students, how many of your constituents said they need to speak English or go back to Mexico? That's politics, right? So even though we are supposed to keep politics and religion out of the classroom, a thousand percent of your decisions are based on someone's politics. Your decisions affect everyone's happiness, health, and professional practices. Need, we need you now more than ever to lift us up through these hard times. We need to create pathways to recruit and retain exceptional teachers by acknowledging the fact that we are the expert and you are the leaders. We have zero intolerance for ignorance. Thank you, Ms. Pullman. Thank you. Dr. McNeil. Ms. Pullman. All right, just for clarification, and just so you can make note of it, so it doesn't limit a student's speech, and they are able to use um, and make a, a flag, a rainbow flag, as a piece of artwork. So just wanted to make that clarification. Fabulous, because that's actually what um, happened to me in my art class. Good to know. So they can hang flag, pride flags in the classroom. We can't get into a discussion. I'm oh, sorry. Thank that's you. part of my public apologies. comment. Thank but you, Dr. McNeil. McNeil. Love you. <laughs> Ashley Wade. Thank you for the record. My name is Ashley Wade. I'm a teacher uh, with the school district. I'm also a parent raising my family's fourth generation of Washoe County uh, District students. Um, I learned when my grandfather passed away a week ago that um, we've had students in this district since 1940. Um, I'd like to just pause for a second. I'm just gonna discard what I had written. Um, and, and just take a moment to acknowledge that 200,000 Americans have died of COVID that um, on average, one person in our county dies every day. Um, and that uh, my colleague who was up here earlier, hysterical, um, because she fears for her life in our school district buildings, um, is right. That being required to be in the buildings to begin with during COVID, but particularly during the uh, smoke, um, we were asked to participate in state violence. That was permanent lung damage happening to our colleagues, to ourselves. 
during a pandemic that also attacks the lungs and causes permanent organ damage. Um, so I had come to say uh, other remarks um, in support of other community members, but um, Anne was right. And her terror is common. And uh, what the woman, uh, my other colleague who spoke just before me now um, said, um, that it's, it is an abusive relationship that how do you leave, right? We're financially dependent on the people who are actively harming our bodies this school year. Um, it, it's mind boggling, it's mind boggling. If we work backward, before the smoke and then before the lung damage from COVID, or during that same time, the school district did double down in a memo uh, saying that we cannot affirm that our black colleagues lives matter, that we cannot affirm that our queer colleagues lives matter. Um, and so that's like this pattern of, of like <laughs> weeding out who matters and it's like fewer and fewer people. Um, and that's like real people aren't sleeping, you know, they're nauseous. Who do you trust at work? When this is the leadership, this is what the leadership is saying, what we value as an organization. Um, and then I think about, you know, I'm white and I'm cis, and so there's, this is the first time in my life I've had to question that, do I really matter to an organization? Um, and I think about my black colleagues and our black and brown students, some of whom have come and spoken to you and said to you directly, I am currently still experiencing the permanent damage of COVID-19. and. And this institution has told them their entire lives, actually, that their lives don't matter. And I think one step that this board can take to address that is to rename Hug High School after the Feimster family. It's a very small step you I'm sorry, your time is up, you Ms. Wade. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent McNeil has a response. Ms. Wade, I want to make sure that, that we address your question. So um, as far as if you can please send the memo to me where, um, we, where apparently there was a statement as far as um, that black lives don't matter and LGBTQ. If you could please forward that memo, that exact memo that you stated on the record, if you could forward that to me, I truly appreciate it. Absolutely. That's all the cards I have for this item. All right, thank you very much, JJ. Okay, made it through public comment. Um, and since we were able to take that short recess beforehand, I think then we will move, if um, staff is ready, on to agenda item 4.01 and get through the budget before our next recess. So 4.01 is presentation and discussion regarding the fiscal and staffing implications related to the enrollment count for the fiscal year
shot. Check, check. Perfect.
again, but we look like we're missing one of our presenters. So, is it? Okay, so we can get started and he'll join us. Okay, so we are back. And we will hear now agenda item 4.01, presentation and discussion regarding the fiscal and staffing implications related to en the enrollment count for the fiscal year 2020-21 district budget and approval of proposed budget recommendations totaling $12.6 million. This is for pre presentation, discussion, and possible action. Our presenters today are... Um, Solutions that will mitigate nearly all of that impact um, and, and so that we can move on um, based on current staffing levels. Um, and then lastly, Emily Ellison will go over uh, uh, the overage process, give you a status of since this impacts the overage and allocation process, it was important we did it now. So in terms of enrollment, uh, again, I, I, sh I should preface all of this by saying enrollment is a moving number. And so we're gonna give you numbers, but they're already stale. Um, we've seen certainly enrollment trickle back in above what we're reporting to you. Um, but again, it was important to kind of give you this presentation. September 4th was a key day. Um, this year, th that was our count day. That's the date and the, and the number we base our allocations on. And so I'm going to provide to you numbers as of September 4th, which was the third week of school. And again, that's because that determines our allocations going forward for the school year. And so you can see there um, that we did see a drop of a little over 2,300 students or uh, roughly 3.6% from our enrollment in week three of 2019. So we decreased from 64,002 uh, students week three of 2019 to 61,673 students in week three of 2020. You know, it's really important to note to you that Washoe County School District is right in line in, in terms of that experience with other districts. So this is an issue um, that goes well beyond our borders. Um, it go, it, it's happening across the state and it's like happening across the nation. Nearly all districts are seeing a decline in enrollment for a number of reasons that we'll go into. So we're not alone. Um, we surveyed our neighboring Northern Nevada counties and as you can see, they've seen enrollment declines of 2.5% to 6%. Uh, we did touch base with Clark County School District as well. And although we heard some um, not so great numbers before, They're, they are also reporting a decrease in enrollment of three and a half percent. So they're right on top of where we are. Um, we also, um, in our staff report, noted some national uh, trends. Again, 
Um, we've seen many districts actually have enrollment decreases far more than three and a half percent. Um, but again, this is a national issue. Obviously, enrollment itself is a huge issue. It drives operational decisions, educational decisions, and financial decisions. So I think all districts across the nation are really struggling with providing educational services when they've seen this drop in, in enrollment, and that directly correlates to per pupil funding and the total funding we receive. Um, so it's, you know, we're not alone if, if that makes us, I guess, feel any better, but still it remains a significant issue. Um, and so um, the, the uh, slide here provides a breakout um, of where that enrollment decrease um, came from. It's, it's, I have to warn you, it's a little misleading in that um, we saw North Star's enrollment go up 650. And so you'll see a part of the decrease in elementary and middle actually are students who are transferring from an elementary school or middle school or even a high school to that last row of pre-K to 12 schools. That includes North Star. So there's a little bit of internal transfers here, but clearly the greatest drop in enrollment happened at the elementary school level, and it happened in kindergarten. Um, we saw a drop of 786 students in kindergarten, and so that represents more than a third of our total decrease. And, and we know the reason why. We know parents have discretion about um, whether or not to bring their kindergarten age child to school. And clearly a lot of them chose um, to not do so this year. They eventually will come back to the school district, for, but for this year, um, clearly there were a lot of parents who chose not to enroll their kindergarten age child in the school district or, or anywhere. Um, but as you can see, there are, this, this slide breaks it out by actual grade level so that kind of deals with the North Star issue. You can see enrollment um, decreased for every grade um, through seventh grade. Um, and it, but once again, the greatest percentage, of course, is kindergarten. Um, so we've been working with our uh, demographer staff in trying to analyze where those enrollment decreases came from or, or, or the reasons for the enrollment decrease, I should say. Um, and so I'll ignore the blue bar for now, but you can see the numbers um, for uh, those who chose to homeschool, a little bit more than 700 families chose, uh, additional families chose to homeschool their child compared to 2019. So again, I should clarify these changes reflect changes between week three of 2019 versus week three of 2020. So 712 additional students were being homeschooled. Again, we've seen a trickle back uh, in many cases of, of students who are being homeschooled back to the school district. And we continue to kind of believe that will continue to be the case through at least the first half of the school year and maybe even after that. Um, we also saw uh, a little bit more than 1,400 students on the far right transfer to uh, charter schools or private schools. And so one of the things we alerted to you back in May again was um, the construction of a new uh, state-sponsored charter school, Pinecrest in Spanish Springs. They opened. They had enrollment of more than 600, so they represent roughly half of this number. Uh, and the other half would be students attending private schools, state-sponsored charter schools, or other Washoe County school district chartered schools. Um, so that's a, obviously a significant number. And then in between those homeschooling and those transferring to charter schools, we had kind of a mixed bag of all other withdrawals. And then in terms of no-shows, um, presumably those students who had left the region, they were nearly 600. Offsetting that is kind of the normal turnover of students, if you will. So the blue bar represents kind of the transients of our, of our population and our students. And we actually uh, saw an offset of an increase of 1,545 students there. So in, you know, the net again is a drop of 2,329. And again, those numbers move every week. So if we were to look at this again in a month, those numbers would be significantly different. Um, the uh, last chart on enrollment that I'll talk to kind of tries to take a step back and ask more on a, you know, a, a global basis, 
why are we seeing the enrollment drop this year that we have? And again, we don't stand out from other school districts in the nation or in the state by any means, but we still wanted to ask what's going on. Um, we know Washoe County School District, at least until this year, was a growing, had a growing population. So why would we see relatively flat or in this year declining enrollment? And so again, in conversations and bantering with our school demographer staff and, and other staff, we came up with at least four kind of reasons, both short and long-term, why this would be happening. Um, obviously, we think the short-term reasons give us um, you know, a strong conviction that we will see students come back um, when COVID-19 or other issues resolve itself. Uh, the longer term issues are, you know, a little bit more problematic, of course. But in terms of short term reasons, clearly concerns about COVID-19 are front and center for many families. Um, many families did not know how in-person uh, learning would go, uh, chose not to do distance learning, uh, an option we provided. Um, and so, you know, what we see again, going back to the prior slide is, our belief is that those who chose to homeschool this year and those kindergarten age children that were held back, that to us is clearly a reflection of concerns of COVID-19 and the possible contagion um, in the classroom that might come um, with those students enrolling. Um, I think, you know, to some degree, there's probably families who took a kind of wait and see approach and wanted to see how the first few weeks of school went. And so, um, I'm hoping that they, in fact, come back um, seeing, you know, how things are operating in the school district. Another short-term kind of event that I think has impacted our enrollment is the economic recession we're currently going through. And, you know, this in concert with the lack of affordability in our housing has put pressure on families who lost jobs um, uh, to you know, basically survive in Washoe County. It's it's no it's no longer an affordable place to live, and at least in many parts of the county. And so, with rising apartment rents and and mortgages, um, there were I, we believe many families who moved out of the region. Again, very hard to kind of directly quantify that impact, but we do think that in fact happened in the lower SES category of of households. And likely we'll see more children in transition that again puts pressure kind of on the cost side to support those children. We hope that um, in fact there will be a vaccine to COVID soon or at least in the next year or so and that over the next one to two years um, we see a reversal of these short-term trends. And in terms of longer-term trends, obviously we know we have school, there are school alternatives in Washoe County uh, itself. We've seen two new charter schools built here in the last three years. And so that's just a fact of life. Um, and then the other long-term kind of trend um, that at least you know some of us kind of are mindful of, again, is the lack of affordability of homes. And it's incredibly difficult for starter families and starter homes with uh, you know, younger age children to, to live in Washoe County. So you know, we've all seen subdivisions being built and and it, it you know it's difficult to kind of wrap your head around the fact that we may not see as many younger children as we did 10 20 30 years ago from the same size of development but that's a fact um, we think there's been a decoupling of population growth on a total basis um, to growth of school age children and so that's you know until our, our housing becomes more affordable we think that's a factor that will kind of suppress growth of school-aged children over time. So again, all of the all of the issues kind of lead to a declining enrollment number this year. Again, we're hopeful that enrollment will actually increase throughout the school year, um, and that will alleviate some of the financial issues we face. But we have to be prepared to address you know the numbers that we see now. We can't wait. Um, we uh, need to come up with a financial plan now. Um, that will get us through the fiscal year. And so to speak to that, I will turn it over. I don't know if you recognize him, um, but Mike Schroeder, our budget director. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening, President Raymond, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent McNeil. Mark explained about the enrollment, and the reason why that is so important, <clears throat> excuse me, 
because it impacts our, our funding levels, we receive the majority of our money for the general fund through a per pupil funding formula. And that formula is based on enrollment. So when we get to start school and we start our enrollment counts, it's a really critical part of our budget. We pay very close attention to it. If it's deviating from our budgeted enrollment, then we, we, we can have some serious problems. And in basically in my 29 years here, this is the biggest deviation we've had from enrollment. And we talked about some of our concerns about that last May. And that's about the time COVID was hitting and we really didn't know what was gonna happen. And now we're to a point where we understand what's going on. So in a real simplistic manner, the way it impacts our budget is you take our enrollment and it's multiplied by our per pupil amount, which is $6,109 per student. And we, our weighted enrollment, <clears throat> we get paid on weighted enrollment. That why, that's why this number difference than the 2,300 kids Mark is talking about. Uh, Pre-K students are weighted at a 0.6 rate rather than a whole weight. But that equates to 2,064 student decrease and multiplied by our $6,109 per pupil. Right off the get-go, we know that we're uh, $12.6 million short in our budget. And as Mark alluded, that's a big concern and we wanted to get here in front of you today to Make sure you understood that and understand that we're trying to devise a plan to address this. Now on the expenditure side, enrollment is also a huge impact. We provide staffing to schools, mainly teachers through our staffing guidelines. So at the elementary school level, we're allocating teachers based on individual class sizes for grades K through six, if you happen to be in elementary school with sixth grade. Middle school and high schools are based on total student enrollment. So when we get to a reduction in enrollment, we've had reductions in the past. We'll typically do, it's kind of a leveling adjustment. And that's just adjusting teacher allocations to match the actual enrollment count rather than the projection. We start with the projection, now we say, okay, based on what you really got, these would be the differences. And in this case, it was almost 99 positions. So, and that's a significant amount, far more than we ever really had any time in the past. So, in a simplistic world, if you took that enrollment decrease and you say we're gonna lose $12.6 million, you say, well, geez, we can come over here on the teacher allocation side because we don't have the students to support that number of teachers. And that would be roughly $7.2 million. So you'd say, well, okay, now we're down to a $5.4 million problem. Uh, unfortunately, you can go to the next slide, Mark. You know, we, we're not really in a simplistic time like that. We, in the past, if we had to do that, we wouldn't be able to absorb all those different uh, reductions, but you could re um, offset a lot of those through existing vacancies and unfilled positions. We didn't even have that many vacancies and unfilled positions to even address this. Plus with uh, our times right now, uh, the stress and the changes that are related to COVID, it would be extremely disruptful to the schools if we were to make some type of wholesale change like that. So coming into this, that was one of our goals is to say, okay, what can we do here to, to really minimize the impact of schools? Because there's a lot of things going on and we gotta help them as much as we can. So that was a goal also, you know, we knew there were some other things going on related to the COVID. We have additional costs, we have other things that happened because of COVID special session that impacted our budget. So we had to consider those also. And in the grand scheme, you know, we wanted to maintain a good financial stewardship. Part of that is maintaining a fund balance. We still have unknowns in the current year, and we know there's a lot of unknowns heading into fiscal year 22. So we can't just take our savings account and spend it all at once. And as many one-time solutions as we'd come up with would be best also. So what we did is we 
kind of sat down and we had a big list of alternatives. We wanted to come up with a list that more than met the need that we had to reduce. And that would at least give us some type of options. Uh, that list was vetted through executive leadership team and helped narrow down some of these choices. But uh, the first one I really want to talk about are other costs and things that are happening. The enrollment shortfall causes a $12.6 million shortfall through the budget, but there are some other things happening. Special session, there is a number of budget reductions to state categorical funding. One of those was read by grade three. Read by grade three was a state funded program that allowed us to put literary specialists at each of our elementary schools. When those positions were filled, they're typically filled by more experienced teachers. Those teachers came from our general fund, moved to grant funding, and therefore that, that actually saved us some money because those teachers were replaced with uh, new, new hired teachers who typically make less than the experienced teachers. So part of our balancing the budget for the current fiscal year is we saved about a million dollars by that movement. Well, now with the reduction of read by grade three, those teachers are all coming back to the general fund and they're filling spots that typically would have been filled by new hire teachers who make less money. So that, that ends up being a cost to the general fund of about a million dollars. In the interim, uh, we saw a seriously downturn in our Medicaid reimbursement funds. And part of that is due to COVID. We weren't able to provide the same level of services. But also there was a change to a, a key rate for speech therapy. That rate redu was reduced by almost 68%. And that reimbursement from those services account for almost 65% uh, of our Medicaid revenue. So ultimately that comes back as a loss of revenue for the year that impacts the general fund. That's about 1.5 million. Also, um, because of an enrollment decrease, we get funded for class size reduction funding for grades uh, one, two, and three. And because there's a decrease in enrollment for those grades, we'll lose some funds from that. So when you net all that out, that's about another 3.8 million in additional costs or lost revenues. So what we were really looking at beyond the 12.6 million was about a $16.4 million issue here that we wanted to come forward and offer solutions for. And when you're looking at this, there are some things that stand out and they're kind of easy choices. Uh, we certainly don't want to think, do things that are more impact, impactful or harmful. So we had put a health insurance increase into the budget anticipating an increase because every year that typically goes up. Fortunately, we did not need one this year and we had zero rate increase. So there was about $1.3 million in the budget that essentially was a savings. So that's easy choice, doesn't really harm anybody. Um, also, when we build the budget, after we give the schools all these allocations to start the budget, there's typically a bank of allocations, allocations that are sitting there. They're not needed at this point, in, at that point in time. Special circumstances come up as we get into seeing what the actual enrollment is, things like that. But in this case, we didn't really need those. So that saved us about uh, 900,000. Then fortunately, we were also able to get uh, Federal CARES Act funding. Our district received 9.9 .9 million and that CARES Act uh, board item has came to you and we've talked about what those funds were gonna be used for. We were hoping to be able to use more of those funds in anticipation of an enrollment shortfall. But we it still ended up with 3.2 million of the 9.9 .9 million. And a lot of that other funding went to help schools due to the uh, COVID impact. They were finding it really hard to maintain social distancing, keeping bodies in front of kids. And we provided every elementary school at least two long-term subs. That was at a cost of almost 2.7 million. We lost funding from SB 178 during the legislative session. Those funds were cut. That was about, a, I think, a two and a half or close to $4 million reduction in funding that we got from the state. And we had some ongoing positions and some other needs there related to that reduction of about <clears throat> $700,000 that we use those ESSER, the 
the ESSER funds, CARES Act funds for GT, Gifted and Talented, was also cut by the legislative session. There was about a, over a million dollar impact from that. So to preserve those positions, we used ESSER funds for that. We also knew that we would have to provide socially emotional supports and uh, family supports. So we added over $700,000 in positions to help that. Plus we have to take out some indirect costs and anyway, it ends up pretty close to 3.2 million. So obviously that's a big help in addressing this issue. So those were kind of the easier choices. Then we have to get into things that are probably a little more difficult, take a little more thought. Uh, other post-employment benefits, OPEB. It's like pre-funding health insurance, similar to pre-funding PERS for employees. Um, given the times, there's not a lot of districts. We have a huge unfunded liability regarding this. Every, every government entity typically does. Not a lot of government entities actually fund this. But given the times, this was more, I guess you could look at it more as a luxury than a necessity. So we have about 1.9 million in the budget for that. So we said we'll suspend that funding for at least this year. Uh, next one is fund balance. So the fund balance is precious. That's like our savings account. We do know there's always uncertainties. You want to maintain a savings account to address those. But in these times too, you're, you can use a little bit of that because what other time is better than now? So we have some savings from fiscal year 20 and we're proposing to use 3.8 million of that to adjust help with this problem. Um, that would leave us at about a 9% fund balance for fiscal year 21. The board policy is to have an eight to 10% balance. And I guess in our minds, you know, we're not even through this fiscal year yet. We're just getting started. We don't know what else may happen this year. Things change on a daily basis. And we know there's a new funding formula coming forward in fiscal year 22. Uh, right now, that's not necessarily looking real good for our funding levels. So we, we want to preserve as much fund balance as we can, but yet still provide for this uh, revenue shortfall due to the enrollment. And from there, uh, it was kind of like sharpening our pencils. Um, we know every year we, we end up with savings and salary and benefits and operating costs. We've really tried to analyze where those savings are and what's going on. We believe we can hopefully squeeze out another two and a half million dollars worth of uh, salary and benefits savings related to turnover of employees and things like that. Uh, we also save on operating costs. We do a chargeback system where we end up a little better in the budget all the time and we save on other operating costs typically during the year. So we took about hoping 1.5 million there. So. I mean, when we get to the end of the year, this is, it's going to be tough. This is going to be close. You know, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel, trying to do what we can to, to address this issue. So when you add up all those things, that's about $15 million. And remember, our goal here was try to do the least impact to schools, least disruption to schools as possible. So basically, we come up with 15 million to solve a 16.4 million problem. Uh, we had 1.4 million left. And that was roughly about 19 allocations. The area superintendents worked with all the schools individually to try to address this just to say, okay, we need to come up with this much and what are we able to do that in the least impactful way in working with the schools? They were able to come up with those 19 without really doing a lot of harm to the schools. So in essence, we got this thing down from possibly 99 allocations to about 19 based on the solutions we're proposing here. If anybody has any questions on this, I'd be happy to answer them. Trustee Simon Holland. Thank you, President Raymond. And thank you, Mike and, and team. Um, really great problem solving. I, um, I'm always amazed at how you guys put this together and I'm, I'm really appreciative. I know we all are. I, I'm trying to get my head around so I can understand down, down in the bottom of the chart uh, under revenue reductions, 
it, where it says charter enrollment increase, this is on slide 12, charter enrollment increase, uh, we lose $478,000. So do we get double hit? I know we've, we've taken the hit for the reduction in our enrollment. So help me if you could understand what the 478 yes, that's additional good. is. Yes, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, that's why the charters have a huge impact on us, especially if we lose a charter student or one of our students to a charter school. We not only lose the $6,109 per pupil, charter schools get a portion of our other outside revenues. So this be like our one or two thirds ad valorem and government services tax, things like that. So that amounts to almost $1,500 a student. So when you take the, the growth in the charter schools versus what was in the budget, it's almost another $500,000. So that's why, you know, we really wanna keep students here and maintain our students, keep them coming to Washoe County School District rather than going to charters because it, it ends up being not just the per pupil hit, but the outside revenue also. Thank you for that. that that's really important to know. I appreciate that. Trustee Cottle. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you for the presentation. I was hoping that you could um, go over with the board what our fund balance percentage is compared to our total budget um, currently before we do anything. Thank you, Trustee Cottle, Mark Mathers, CFO. Um, so um, we ended up last fiscal year with a total fund balance of, of a little under 42 million. And of that, our unassigned portion, the available portion was 38 million. And that reflects 8.2% of budgeted expenditures. So that was fiscal year 19. So we were within our target range of a fund balance of eight to 10%. Um, we expect um, for fiscal year 20, and we're still working with our external auditors on the, on the CAFR, we still haven't pinned down all of the assignments so that we need to make. Um, but we expect, even with doing this, to end up with an uh, unassigned fund balance of 44 million. Um, and that reflects a 9% ending fund balance. So we did, again, see savings. We'll come back to you and report more in depth on that once the CAFR is completed. Sorry, CAFR is a consolidated annual financial report. It's basically our financial statements. Thanks, see. Um, once we have that completed, we'll give you an analysis. But even by doing this, um, we will see growth in our ending fund balance and we'll see growth as a percentage of our budgeted expenditures from 8.2 to 9%. Um, you know, turning to next fiscal year, you know, that's, that's the big unknown. But to answer your question, we're still in good shape, even with this plan. Thank you, Mark. And then the, the last question is a follow-up. If you could just uh, really quick go over why it's important to have a healthy fund balance for the long-term financial health of our district? Great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, you know, we'd like to think this is a one-year event, but I don't know of any CFO of any public agency, at least that I speak to, that is banking on this being a one-year event. All of us are planning on this needing to prepare for at least a two-year event. And, you know, there's lots of forecasts out there of what the economy will do. Um, but it is absolutely imperative to keep some powder dry, i.e. to keep fund balance um, in that target range that you set three years ago to allow us to ride out what's most likely going to be a greater than one year event. If we were to you know, kind of use up all of our fund balance, we have a number of issues. One of them is just the ability to manage through unknowns going into fiscal year 22. And Mike mentioned we have a new pupil-centered funding plan and the impact of that and the impact of the state's budget that we'll see in January is completely unknown at this point. Um, in addition to that, if we draw down our fund balance, 
we will see um, most likely a, a decline in our bond rating. And we were just upgraded, if you'll remember. And I think, you know, the savings we saw in fiscal year 20 will will reinforce that that Moody's decision to upgrade us. But if we were to draw down, they they absolutely track that. And so we would see. Uh, downgrade in our bond rating from a double A back to a single A that impacts our borrowing rates when we go out in the market to issue long-term debt. Um, those are just a, a, a few of, of the repercussions of drawing down your fund balance too fast. I guess the other significant one is an operational one, and that is we need the cash to pay, make payroll. Um, and so if you draw down too much, you know, our combined payroll and taxes is, is north of $30 million. And so you need the cash to be able to make that payment ahead of when we receive the funding at, at month end from, from the state. So for all those reasons, it's absolutely critical that we not draw down our fund balance too, too fast and, and too far, and that we give you the ability to manage through what may be a, a, a difficult fiscal year 22. Just, just one. And Sorry. that's that's thirty million dollars a month. It, it's thirty million a month. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes, ma'am. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, okay, thank you for the questions. As I mentioned earlier, we put out a lot of different options to kind of look at, um, and we think we narrowed it down to the best ones. Obviously, some of the ones here that are listed, pretty controversial, uh, harm operations significantly, or would take a long time to implement if we had to renegotiate and do things like that with employee unions. So it was just to say those, these were not the only things we considered. We had other things out there that we wanted to look at and just say, Let's start with the big list and let's narrow it down to the best choices. So in the end, what we're asking is that uh, looking for your input and hopefully approval of a solution to move forward with at this point. Uh, most of these solutions are budget accounting changes. Um, they're keeping reductions away from schools keeping schools from being disrupted, kind of using one-time sources. And on the allocation side, mostly I think we're doing what we wanted to do is keep a serious staffing reduction away from the schools and allow them to deal with the current situation in our new educational delivery models with in-person and distance learning, hybrid models, making sure we can maintain social distancing within our buildings and keep bodies in front of kids and uh, keep the educational process going. And as it turns out, we, we will not impact any special ed allocations, any allocations related to English learners or gifted and talented or other school allocations. And with that, Emily will provide us a summary of I fixed it. Sorry. Wow. I know. I keep doing this. And, wow. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. Okay. Emily Ellison, microphone breaker for the record. I'm not going to touch it. I'll just scoot closer. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thank you for your time this evening. Um, as uh, Mike and Mark mentioned, um, 
I don't, I don't think there's probably anyone in this organization that is more grateful for the solutions that they came up with to avoid a reduction in force than uh, the HR lady is. So uh, we're, we're very grateful uh, for the creativity. And in terms of uh, allocation reductions, um, there's really kind of two components that we look at from a personnel perspective. Uh-oh. Oh, that's your speaker. Okay. Do you want me to wait a moment? Why'd you move it? I need to speak closer. Also, it's chicken for dinner.
from a personnel perspective, we really look at two things when it comes to allocations. So the first is the total number of allocations and obviously a reduction of potentially 99 allocations that Mike talked about earlier um, was uh, uh, angst causing to say the least. And so when we look at total allocations and then we took that number and were able to reduce that to 19, um, as they shared, we were able to do that primarily through vacancies. And so without impacting actual staff, we were able to um, account for the loss of students in enrollment. The second component of allocations is a rebalancing that happens twice a year, and that accounts for movement from school to school. And so um, we do our count day process, we look at the enrollment at each location compared to the allocations, and then make adjustments from there. So while we were able to absorb many of the reductions in vacancies, there was still a little bit of rebalancing that needed to occur. And so we have about 32 employees that are participating in what's called the overage process right now. And that's where we work with administrators and with employees to identify which schools have an increased need for educators and then transition employees into those new schools or into those new roles. I say approximately 32 employees because just like our enrollment, um, our staffing is a little bit fluid as well. And so there may be people who um, decide instead of being overage, they're close enough to retirement that they want to retire instead. Or, um, you know, someone at a school site goes on a leave and the overage is resolved through that way. So the process is a little bit fluid, but um, we are on track at this point to finish that process. Um, this Friday is our placement meeting. And then teachers, uh, educators will move early next week to their new assignments and have some time with students before fall break. So um, we've, we've worked over the years closely with business and position control to try and minimize that timeline as much as possible so that we can ensure there's not a lot of movement happening for kids and adults in our buildings. Um, I did want to note as well, um, because we, we put a substantial effort into getting employees matched with distance learning assignments and getting accommodations in place for those who have concerns about their health risk related to exposure to or potential exposure to COVID. And so um, going into the overage process, I was a little bit concerned about how those um, uh, employees may be affected if we have an accommodation in place at their current site, they're assigned to distance learning, but then if they are over allocated and we needed to move someone to another site, how we would make that happen. Um, we took some steps early on to work with principals to identify um, potential uh, movement and then try to pre-plan for that. And so at the end of the day, with the small number of overaged employees that we have, that 32 that I was talking about, um, we have three employees who have ADA accommodations for distance learning. We're working closely with them and our administrators to get them matched with new distance learning opportunities at their new sites. So. Um, and then Mike mentioned a little bit ago that we are grateful to have not needed to make any reductions to special education, um, English language learners, gifted and talented, and some of our other certified and administrative staff as well. So happy to answer any questions if you have any. Well, thank you very much, Emily. I have a question. Uh, I start with you, but if you're not the right person, pass it on. Sure. <laughs> so, if we're making all these adjustments and let's say after the winter break, even for the next semester, 500 kindergartners show up, what do we do at that point? <laughs> well, um, from a, I can answer from a staffing perspective, if additional allocations uh, were created, I'll defer to business to talk about what that would look like. Um, we would obviously, uh, we're, we're engaged in a continuous recruiting effort, and so we would be utilizing our recruiting channels to identify, um, obviously, certified teachers, uh, preferably to go into those roles, but also working closely with our college partners <clears throat> to identify potential paid interns or perhaps retirees um, who could return and help us with those students as well. Thank you. I'll handle the increase of 500 kids would be really nice. We get funded. <laughs> based on average daily enrollment, and it's a quarterly process. So those, those students were to show up, we would get increased funding for the rest of the year for those students. It's a lot easier to add back than take away. I mean, 
like we were showing here, when you reduce students, you can do a little more than half the cost related to a teacher, but the other half of that cost is paying for bus drivers, custodians, uh, school staff, central support staff. So <clears throat> the revenue we would generate by an increase in students if you had to put the teacher back in there would only take about half of that increase in the revenue. So that's the easy part, adding back. The hard part is subtracting. The hard part would be probably trying to find staff at that point in time midstream during the, during the middle of a school year. And just to add to that, we are fortunate that uh, in our t many of our teacher prep programs that we work with um, operate on a semester-based system. So we usually have a bit of an influx um, between the two semesters anyway from new graduates. Okay. And I think it'd be great to put out there too, um, you know, having been through this process in previous years, although this year is obviously different, um, 32 is not an extraordinarily high number in my memory. We've had other years with even more than that without COVID, I, I think. So if you could give some context for that. And, and I know how much work went into getting it to that number. So thank you all for that. Yeah, absolutely. So our um, spring overage is typically a, a bigger overage than fall because we're utilizing projections for the next year. Um, but it is not uncommon to have closer to 60 or 70 folks in the overage process typically. Um, I would attribute the kind of declining numbers over the last few years to a few things. Um, we are working closely with principals and I know our area superintendents are working closely with principals in order to kind of understand their enrollment patterns and then make staffing decisions accordingly. So it's not uncommon for a principal to maybe hold off on filling a position if they don't feel like their enrollment numbers are there. And so that obviously helps to minimize movement as well. Um, but you're right uh, that that is a, a relatively small number for the, the numbers that we typically see during the bridge. It still doesn't make it a easier process for the teachers or for the families and students that are impacted. And I want to acknowledge that, but I also want to acknowledge and thank you all for trying to minimize that impact as much as possible because it is just one more added layer to, of stress to everyone at a time where it's just sending, it would send, I think, people over the edge, you know, so I appreciate that. Vice President Taylor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I, I would be remiss if I didn't just echo the, the, the thank yous in your, um, in, the, in the budget work, um, uh, Mike and Mark, and, and really expressing and, and the, the board's wishes of always doing as much as we can to keep reductions out of, out of the classroom, um, certainly away, away from the students. And, and as, as our President Raymond just said, in particular this year, probably more than any other year away from the teachers, um, you know, we, we, we hear the public comments, we read the emails, and we certainly heard a lot tonight. And we know it's a, it's a tough time for everybody, but in particular for them. And then the, the, the administrators who support the teachers in the buildings, um, to not have them um, go through some of that same stress as well. You're talking about counselors and deans that do a great work and helping students manage, helping teachers manage the students. So I'd be remiss if I didn't, didn't thank you for that. Um, and I also want to thank, and this may have been done in the past, but you, you, you made a point of it, and, and I, I don't know if it was Mike or Mark that talked about the, having the area superintendents working with the principals as you got it down to a particular number and them working together on, again, I don't know if that's happened in the past, but I think that makes a big difference as well. I mean, you don't want to have any overage, right? Ideally, because we don't want the numbers to go down, but when people can be involved in solving a problem that impacts them, then it makes it a little bit easier to, to absorb it, to understand it. You still may not like it, but you've had a voice in it. And again, that may have been done in the past, but this year is the first year I recall that really being made a point um, of that happening. So, so I thank you for that as well. Now to my question, um, because we do count quarterly um, um, the, um, as of late, um, do you expect, and I know I see numbers are fluid and it looks, looks like numbers are going up. I think as we 
you know, see more of people getting a little more comfortable, in, you know, in the schools and whatnot, which is a great tribute to all those in the buildings doing the work um, and keeping it safe. Uh, well, do you think there'll be adjustments in the numbers of teachers? I know what you're looking for maybe a little in, influx at the semester break. Will there be will quarterly adjustments be necessary, you think? That's a good question, and I don't have a good enough crystal ball. Uh, typically, in a given year, the way our ADE works, the first quarter You'll see an uptick in the second quarter. Part of that is just because more kids are coming for the days that quarter is in session. When we start the school year, a lot of kids don't show up at the very start, so they're not included in those initial days of the quarter. So the ADE, the number of kids might not necessarily change so much in the second quarter, but they're there for the whole quarter instead of partial quarter. So you'll see an uptick in our ADE in the second quarter. Then when we get to third quarter, it typically goes down a little, and fourth quarter it will go down further. Uh, a lot of the decrease in the third and fourth quarter is high school kids. So kids just drop out or stop coming. That's where the numbers end up going. We may see an uptick in elementary school during those quarters. But typically, they're not, you know, it's not like, 20 kids come into the first grade at Brown Elementary. They're just onesie twosies here and there and they don't really impact allocations on a grand scale. So this year, I don't, it's really hard to say how many kids may come back. Past experience, not a lot, but who knows, this year there could be an uptick. And like I say, if, if there is an uptick and it requires more allocations, we would get additional funding to provide for those allocations. Okay, so if the number is large enough, or if it has enough of an impact, it may require, for the first time, this is, you know, this is a different year, right? It may require that. Okay, thank you. That we, at least we aren't adding more kids to what we, significant numbers of more kids um, as the school year goes on. So thank you. And again, thank you so much for, for the work and avoiding the stress on the, on the teachers in the building. So it makes a difference. Trustee Minetto. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and thank you for your amazing work here. I'm, I, I don't know what principals slash schools identified a net of 19 teacher allocations that they could afford to lose and still serve students. What does that mean? I get the 32 overage, but I, I don't know what that means. That's a great question. Thank you, Trustee Minetto. Uh, Emily Ellison, Chief Human Resources Officer, for the record. So when we look at the total enrollment and then the total number of positions aligned to that enrollment and then the d decrease that we saw, typically that would result in a, an elimination of 99 allocations, whether those were filled or not. And so in this scenario, when we were able to um, hopefully implement some of these solutions and that number of 19, those are allocations that we would eliminate from the budget and um, primarily from vacancies. So schools and uh, principals and area superintendents work together to, at the school level, look at enrollment and say, the, we've, these allocations were initially budgeted based on projections, but we're going to um, not fill those allocations and remove them from the budget based on the enrollment decrease. Thank and, you. I and, appreciate that. And I guess I would just add on, I mean, this year, absolutely, it was more of a multidimensional kind of consideration, right? That, you know, we started off with the kind of allocations in the budget. We have these social distancing requirements, right, that absolutely put, you know, increase the need for positions. So we took some of the CARES ESSER money that Mike mentioned to add two long-term subs to each elementary school. And then we saw this enrollment drop. And so, you know, I got to hand it to the area superintendents because they worked frantically over, over several weekends talking to principals and really just strategizing about which schools based on the enrollment drop could actually afford to lose an allocation. We saw some schools actually see enrollment go up. So, it, you know, it was a, a big puzzle with lots of puzzle pieces and lots of dimensions to it. And, and, you know, the principals felt comfortable that they could uh, afford to lose those 19 allocations and still meet the social distancing requirements, still support 
students, you know, to the to the same level of service. So, you know, it, it, it did take a village, if you will, you know, of people working together to kind of problem solve it. So. Thank you. Trustee Cottle. Thank you, Madam President. Since I've been on the board, I've, I've always been the, try to be the voice to, or not try to be, but I've always kind of been the voice of not really supporting using fund balance because I, I think it's a, a dangerous game for the school district to live in the red. However, um, the fund balance is there for these one-offs, for these years that just kind of come out of nowhere. And so I do think using the fund balance here is appropriate, it's what it's there for. Um, I, I give you all a lot of credit for doing all of this work to get this very large number into a very small number. Take 99 allocations on the 19, that's, that's a great job because you could have easily come to us and said, 99 allocations gotta go, this is how we're gonna make this work. And so I appreciate the problem solving instead of coming to us with something like that and then having us send it back and say, do something else. I appreciate that being proactive about that. So I do think the recommendation that you are giving us is definitely appropriate. Um, the question I have, and I apologize if you've already touched on this, there may be some people that are watching this going, okay, so 19 allocations are being eliminated. What does that mean? Does that mean 19 staff members are getting a phone call saying their, their job has been lost or are they being reassigned? Um, if you could just go over what exactly that entails so that people understand what we're, what we're talking about when we mean that there's a 19 allocations that we are gonna lose. Absolutely, I'd be happy to take that. Emily Ellison, Chief Human Resources Officer, for the record. Um, so in, in this case, we were able to take those 19 allocations largely from vacancies. And so as we eliminated positions, um, we, we were able to not impact people. The 32, uh, approximately 32 folks that I mentioned um, are a part of that rebalancing process. So um, we're not laying anyone off. Um, and the 32 individuals who are going through the overage process are being um, transitioned to other locations because of increases in enrollment at, at the schools where we saw increases. So uh, we have uh, plenty of positions and we actually are still hiring as well. So once we get through the overage process, the positions that remain, um, we will work to fill those and make sure that those schools have those um, teachers in place as well. I appreciate that that clarification and I know today we heard a lot of public comment around around our funding and these are the the tough uh, situations that we're being put into to make these decisions on I feel like we're always talking about uh, what cuts can we make to make it work rarely are we talking about what can we do with all the extra funding that we're getting um, but I do think it starts with enrollment so I do think as a district we need to come together and, and really analyze what do we do about enrollment? How do we increase enrollment? What is being offered at a private school or a charter school that we're not offering? How can we increase our enrollment and get those kids into our schools versus leaving our schools? I do think that is a team effort by our school district and our staff to determine how can we do that? Because it is gonna start there and then we can, we can kind of take off from there on, on other funding sources, but we do got, have to get this enrollment, enrollment back up. So again, I appreciate the, the work that you did to give us um, a really reasonable uh, solution to a very challenging problem. So thank you very much. Thank you. If there's no other discussion or questions before we hear from Superintendent McNeil and take action, I'd like to see if we have any public comment on this item. Pablo Nava Duran, Jeff Church, Natha Anderson. Okay, so we got some uh, huge enrollment decline. Never say before, because many people many people were coming to Reno to to buy their home, have the kid to go to school, and then we built a new school. Now they're leaving, 
uh, because of uh, COVID-19. So, yeah, I guess, so uh, since of COVID-19, we know, we know the Spark area and Northern Nevada area have been changed. Have been changed the woman causing decline. They have sent a kid to homeschool. Holy back f uh, five year old from kindergarten. For the the, the, the demographic change and the uh, house of affordability now uh, since uh, since the uh, ten years ago we know spark care was much cheaper. Now it's my apartment costs like four hundred dollar per month. Four hundred dollar per month. Now it's like nine hundred sixty five dollar per month for two bedrooms. And now we know be and become a, a least affordable places in a nation. In a, in 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 the nation beside California. And many people are we as a result many people are leaving. Now they have few family with younger children. Yep. The cost of not such Reno Spark but the uh, United States and the other developed nations cost uh in inter per fantastic per people. Yeah. That's okay. Law of our union with no charges. And for the economic rejection, so yeah, that's the hard one because many people are lost their job and many people cannot afford and and we know spark they like in for example when a Californian moved to Nevada to buy a home to have a Reno Nevada we to have a job in Reno Spark area now and now now they lost a job and cannot afford their home they, they have to move somewhere else. So in Las Vegas. So they're moving to Las so many people moving to Las Vegas. Or Idaho or Utah. Or Texas. And the school authorities is uh, they're sending kids to charter school or private school because the states don't offer them. I don't know why, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Navadaran. Jeff Church, Natha Anderson. Good evening, my name is Jeff Church. First of all, the proposed cut of 19 teacher positions as well as teacher funding is insanity. Today, we're looking at a $12 million cut based on enrollment. I want to point out one thing. Enrollment has only gone up 0.5% since 2012. That's one half of 1%. And I have your exact figures here from the school district. So we've never had massive enrollment increases in recent times. But wait, there's more. The, the incline legal settlement, the lawsuit settlement, is going to hit the school district a minimum of 10, probably $20 million. Are you budgeting for that? But there's more. Fee tax or sales tax. Who knows how much that's going to hurt us, but that could be anywhere from 10 to $20 million from what I can come up with. Maybe you have better figures, but that's a question to ask Mr. Mathers. There's still more. Property tax decline. Harris is closed. The casinos are being reassessed. Everybody's being reassessed. The biggest business you'll see in Reno now is called for lease or available. Massive property tax decreases. And there's more. Yesterday, a judge in Carson City invalidated the special session funding for education, quote, tens of millions statewide, invalidated. You need to plan for that. So in my limited minute and a half left, I'm going to give you some solutions. Number one, many of these were covered in my Washoe Schools Examiner that was distributed to you last month. I'd like to quote from there, but I don't think I'll have time. Number two, do something. Don't pass the buck to the next board in January. Number three, cut all admin bloated salaries 15%, and per NRS 288, you don't need to renegotiate. You can do it tomorrow. You can do it today, 15%. Number four, furlough and layoff employees as needed. 
That's what the RSCVA did. Take, take their advice. Number five, cut admin principals at some of the smaller elementary schools from a ratio of one to one to one to two or one to three elementary schools. Number six, I have a plan to use WC1 funds legally for non-building purposes. And that leads to number seven, stop building. Enrollment is down, stop the building. Save money on salaries, et cetera, and use that WC1 money to pay the interest on the existing bonds because again, C tax is down. And then if you finally have to, I mean, if push comes to shove, you cut even more assistant principal positions where they're covering schools at a ratio of one to two instead of one to one. I have eight seconds left, so I can't read from the last page of the school's examiner, but I hope you do because this was all predicted. Thank you very much. Mr. Church, there was a lot of misinformation in what you just stated, and so I will ask our staff after we finish our next public comment to correct some of what you stated. Natha Anderson, Beth Martin. Thank you so much. No touchy. Uh, good evening, uh, Natha Anderson of the Washoe Education Association. Uh, I just first wanted to echo many of the statements that were already made by the trustees. Trustee Cottle, you, you pretty much took some of the words right out of my mouth. Um, appreciate the work that Washoe County School District Budget Department and HR has, um, has put into this. The acknowledgement of the numerous changes that are facing our educators and the stress that that is creating. And so trying to keep those budget cuts as far away from the classroom and as far away from our schools as possible, which I know has always been the plan, uh, but that took some truly uh, incredible work. And just when I think about the possible loss of 99 allocations and actually the actual loss of 80% less than that, um, although it's difficult for us to lose any allocations, uh, the loss of 19 as opposed to a possible 99, and then also no rifts, no reduction in force. Again, um, just incredible work. So just really wanted to thank the Washington County School District Budget Department and HR Department for all that work with us. Um, I think you heard earlier today the stress that people are feeling and just the need for how are we going to be able to rebalance some of those distance education elements. Uh, so I just, I realize that I've got another minute 34, but you've also been here since four, three o'clock listening to things. So just wanted to appreciate the work that you guys have put in for that. I realize that the budget is always a difficult thing to discuss and there's never going to, we just don't have enough at this time, but at least you, uh, you are both through the department and then also the trustees putting the classrooms, the students, um, always at the forefront and trying to make sure that that is the priority and greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Beth Martin. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that we were done. Beth Martin again for the record. Um, something that just really stood out to me was the um, nearly 500 kids in kindergarten lower enrollment and it just made me wonder um, what is the long-term damage of that f to think that these 500 children are not going to kindergarten and then they're going to come in, thir in first grade and already be so behind. Um, I work at Anderson Elementary which is a very, um, it's a very needy school. Um, and to think that you know there's kindergartners in that area that are not going to school, how are we gonna long-term support that? And is there anything that we can do as a district to try and reach out more to the families and encourage them now that some time has passed, um, things are more regular at schools to try and get them into the school system. Um, and I know that it was mentioned that like quarterly um, it can be reevaluated and we can gain allocations. Um, it's just very scary to think that there's that many kids that aren't in school that 
really need to be. So if that could be addressed in any way, maybe through an email or maybe talked about at another time, I'd really appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Okay, so I don't know who wants to start. If it, uh, Trustee Cottle. Thank you, Madam President. Before I forget, I just want to say a few things. I do think the comment about kindergarten is valid, and I know that I'm sure our academic staff will be um, thinking long and hard through this school year how we're going to support first grade next school year uh, with the uh, expectation we could have a lot of first graders showing up that were not in kindergarden. But the, um, so I do think that's important, that's a good point, and something I think we need to think about this school year before next school year. The other part that I just have to, I have to say is that there's a lot of staff probably watching right now. And one thing that I can say pretty clear, that as long as I'm sitting here, if we have alternatives to save jobs, we're going to do that. Just cutting people to cut people is wrong. And the thought of anyone sitting up here who believes that is wrong. And so if we have alternatives, we're going to find them. So thank you for finding alternatives so that we got to go tell staff you don't have a job anymore. So thank you very much to principals, assistant principals, and teachers because it matters. So I just wanted to throw that out there because it bothers me when, when I hear some things that are extremely troubling. So thank you for your, for your work on this and definitely support the, the recommendation. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Trustee Cottle. Um, I just want to clear up. So the 19 positions, as you reiterated previously, are not being cut, that they are vacant positions that we're just not filling. Um, at previous uh, budget discussions, Mr. Mathers, you have discussed sales tax and the potential that that has to impact our budget in the long term. I don't know if you want to quickly kind of recap that. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it quickly. Um, so although we remain concerned about sales tax, it is held in better than I think anyone had expected. Um, we do not have a problem meeting our debt service. Um, we don't get C tax, but we do get the sales tax. Um, property taxes have um, grown strongly. Uh, I think Southern Nevada does have an issue with the reappraisal of casinos based on a different appraisal methodology that historically has not been a huge issue in Northern Nevada. I mean, I, I take the point and that may be happening um, in you know, kind of one-off situations, but we actually saw very strong property tax um, growth. And again, it's based on you know, new homes being built. They may not bring kids, but they bring in the property tax revenue. So we have no issue at all covering our debt service. Um, we don't need assistance in doing that. Um, we're in very, um, very good shape in terms of meeting our debt service. Um, we're nowhere close to, you know, revenues falling to a point where we can't cover it. So, um, you know. That's I, a short answer. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I thought the presentation did a good job of explaining enrollment um, and especially because uh, I know we have also talked in previous years about the, the growth of our community in relationship to the growth of our student population. Um, I remember in previous um, presentations um, addressing that it's not that even that the charter schools are seeing a massive growth and we're not, you know, there's not some disproportionality right. there. We do, we did see a new charter school that changed things certainly this year, but we can't attribute all of it to people leaving our district to go to charters. That certainly had an impact this year. And I would echo what trustee Cottle said about, um, you know, the need for our district to continue to work to, you know, be as competitive and, and, um, you know, as possible to get those students, but it's not the growth that, and for, correct me if I'm wrong, the growth that we're not seeing in our schools is not because of they're going to other schools. It's because the people moving to our community are not moving here with school age children. That's, that's right, Madam Chair. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation there at all. Um, you know, one of the things I, w I do want to bring out, um, I'm going to wave Pete and Adam's flag a little bit. I mean, with WC1, 
Um, we know part of the reason for WC1 was to address backlog needs and dilapidated facilities, and we're doing that. Um, and that and that was important. I mean, just you know, the new high school that's being built now, right? That was that that's important, along with the remodeling of it to be a CTE academy. That, th those are important needs. But I'll also point out an, an attachment to the staff report that we really didn't cover is that we are seeing growth in certain parts of the county. And so whether you talk about Cold Springs or Damani or other areas, there actually was enrollment growth. And so, you know, it's an alternative of do you build facilities for those people or would you bus them 30, 45 minutes each way a day to get the kids to schools? And, and so that, you know, part of WC1 obviously was address, to address growth in those outlying regions. So again, we didn't touch on it, but even though enrollment is relatively flat, we've seen growth in outlying areas that need schools. So I, I would just I would just point that out. And I guess I guess lastly, I, I mean, I respect the opinions of the speaker, um, but we cannot legally use WC1 monies for operations. Um, that is absolutely forbidden. Um, WC1 is fairly narrowly written. Now, did we use um, did we use funds to reimburse principals who are working with construction contractors on new schools? Absolutely, but that's a construction function, not an operations function. Um, but when we look at WC1 wording, and I've talked to bond council and tax council about this, it is fairly narrowly worded, such that even certain capital expenditures are questionable in terms of using WC1. There is very strict language in the ballot measure. We look to that um, with bond council when we go out with bonds. So there is absolutely no way legally, currently, we could use WC1 monies to fund teacher positions or, or, or other operational costs. Thank you very much for addressing that. And I will turn it over to Superintendent McNeil, see if she has any more to add. Thank you very much, President Raymond. So I, I won't spend too much time, but I do um, want to say that I absolutely appreciate um, our budget team and HR um, and our silent partner back there, Jeff Bazo, who has the patience of Job, um, you know, as far as going back and forth with, with allocation sheets. I want to thank Deputy Superintendent Byersdorf for her continual patience and, and pull, um, you know, when, when we're presented with an issue, I want to say that this is an absolute example of collaboration and problem solving. We had a problem and we were able to solve it for all the right reasons. And so I truly appreciate our team coming together and making sure that our schools had the least effect and impact. And our area superintendents, we have one of them there in the back, consistently speaking with our principals over the weekend, late at night, making sure that they were taken care of. And I wanna do a shout out to our principals because of their leadership and talking about that this was a loss of enrollment and it was not the district, that this was a loss of enrollment. And they actually worked amongst themselves to say, how can we be able to do this for the betterment of our students? So just thank you very, very much for the entire team. Trustee Simon Holland. Thank you, Madam President. I wanna echo all the great comments and, and just say we all, including the folks that are sitting here making this presentation, know that any reductions are painful reductions. None of these things are done without great gravity and emotional investment in what's best for our students. And I know we all try to make those decisions, what is best for our students, and you all have come up with a plan that demonstrates your commitment to that. And I just want to say thank you for that. And I, and I want to remind everyone that we are very mindful that these reductions are painful and we don't want to have to make any of them. But um, we're faced with the challenge of reduced resources at a very difficult time. Uh, you've been able to offset some of those reduced resources. You've been able to find solutions, make accounting changes, shift uh, accounting uh, you know, functions so that we can charge expenditures differently and, and relieve pressure on the general fund. Um, and that took a lot of innovation and a lot of dedication. But I want to acknowledge 
that um, none of this is done easily. It's not a mechanical operation or an administrative function. It's done by people who have great heart and great passion for serving these students. So thank you, and I certainly will be supporting uh, this plan. Would you like to make a motion? Oh, I'm sorry, Vice President Taylor. I didn't see. Oh, no, that's okay. I was just harder gonna... for me to see everybody oh, in this okay. thing. I was just going to make a motion. Okay. You make the motion. Okay. <laughs> really, in light of all that has been said and the appreciation that has been shown, um, I move that the Board of Trustees approves the plan to address the enrollment count um, impact to the district's finances and staffing. Second. All right, a motion by Vice President Taylor, second by Trustee Simon Holland. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion passes unanimously. Send you off with more accolades. Thank you, thank you. Great job. Appreciate the hard work. I know there were rows and rows of people behind you that were helping with all of that, and, and so please pass on our thanks to them. Yeah, she was calling me about it, I know. <laughs> um, all right, I would now like to take a little bit of a longer recess. I know we have some shifting of people and moving around to do so. It is 7, let's say 7.30. We'll be back here at 7.50 to resume the meeting with agenda item 5.03.
And we are now on agenda item 5.03, which is discussion and action by the Board of Trustees to consider the character and professional competence of the applicants received to fill the vacancy on the board, on the board in District A, created by the resignation of former trustee Scott Kelly and select approximately three candidates to interview from the following legally qualified applicants. Tara Carolyn, Jeff Church, Megan Clowers, Lisa Janaski, Jack Heineman, Teresa Herzl, Greg Jewell, Sharon Kennedy, Julie Morrissey, Lori O'Leary, Heather Parkin, David Perez, and Wayne Vanderval. Well, wow. um, and I would actually like to, I should have stated this at the beginning, that um, we learned earlier today that Tara Carolyn has withdrawn herself from consideration, so it's only the 12 applicants. Um, and our Chief General Counsel will help us get started here. Good evening, mm -hmm. trustees, uh, President Raymond, Superintendent McNeil. As you just stated, this is the time to narrow down the field, if you will, to uh, pick those who uh, the board chooses to interview. As you may recall, we said approximately three. Uh, that was based on Vice President Taylor's suggestion in that she thought there might be a clear break in the number of uh, candidates that would be selected as far as qualifications go. We did go and check the addresses that were listed by each candidate. They do, from what we can tell, meet the minimum required qualifications uh, per Trustee Cottle's request. Um, so I think at this point, other than Tara Carolyn, the process would be similar to how we do naming a committee, which would be something along the lines of, we would ask that each trustee, oh, you were also uh, provided uh, documents so that you could write down your um, your thoughts, those documents are part of your deliberative process privilege, so um, you, you have those as well. Um, and so at this point in time, what we would like to do is do a ranking system, and the ranking system, now keep this in mind, I wanna be really clear on this, your first candidate doesn't get a one, your first candidate gets a three, your second candidate gets a two, your third candidate gets a one. So your number one candidate gets the highest number. Now, I guess the one question I would ask the trustees, do you feel you need more than three numbers? Do we need a five, four, three, two, one? That would be my only question. Otherwise, uh, that's how naming does it. That's how we discussed it two weeks ago at the board meeting. I see you all agreeing that three is enough. Um, so what we'll do is, Again, your first candidate, your favorite candidate gets a three, your second favorite candidate gets a two, and your third favorite candidate gets a one. Then what we'll do after that is JJ and I will uh, keep the totals and we will compare notes and then uh, we'll come back to you with the, the final tally and we'll move on from there. So we'll take a, it won't even be a recess, we'll just go, I'll just, go over there real fast, add it up, and then we'll go from there. Does that work? Yeah, I think um, we'll, you know, want to start with just a little bit of sure. um, conversation, discussion yep. about things, um, mm -hmm. and then I know we do have some public comment, yep. and then we'll kind of get into our ranking. So, uh, yeah. Trustee Simon Holland. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to clarify, um, will we be able to um, provide our reasoning why uh, our top candidate is our top candidate or do you just want three two one I think you are uh, it, well that's up to the president so perhaps she should answer but I think you should be able to say yeah. your reasons okay and I think we you know we can have a little bit of like I said discussion uh, but I just wanted I didn't want to get too far down the path of ranking anybody before we hear from our public comment um, and wanted to give people just a chance to share if they had any sort of general observations, um, and then we'll get to the meat of it. <laughs> and I, I, we don't, I guess I should have started there, but I was just presuming that's how yeah. we would roll with that yeah. part, yeah. Trustee Minetto. <laughs> yes, I um, have to make a disclosure. It is in pursuant of NRS 281A.5. 
420, I am disclosing that I am a friend with Therese Herstel, who has applied for this position. However, pursuant to NRS 281A.4201, I do not have a commitment in, uh, in, private, in a private capacity as defined in NRS 281A.065, and thus I will vote on this item. Thank you, Trustee Mineta. Um, well, I'll just start with a thank you to the candidates that applied. Um, there was a great pool of applicants. Um, just really impressed with the people that stepped up to take on this uh, position at such a challenging time for the district. Um, and, um, you know, I think really representative of a, of a real wide um, variety of uh, voices and perspectives in the community. Um, I think many of them would certainly add new voices and new perspectives to this um, current board. And so that um, was very uh, inspiring to see the, uh, you know, people step up for such a challenging t position at this time. Um, you know, just a general observation, I think that I kind of carried with me in looking at this was kind of seeing what was the, um, you know, right fit for this current body, which, um, you know, to me, I was sort of looking up at, at looking at the makeup of our current board. Um, I was encouraged to see parents that applied. I think um, having a voice of a of a current parent of a student in the district um, would be great. But I also was thinking about, you know, kind of what, um, knowing that this is somewhat of a short-term uh, position uh, ending at the end of this year and really only five uh, full board meetings, you know, who would be able to kind of come in and, and know what to, how to grasp this, the workings of the school district the quickest. Um, so those definitely like were factors that I considered, um, and there was one other one that just escaped me. So, but um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add before we hear from public comment. No. Oh. Okay, we'll go on with our public comment. The board received emails from Scott Benton, Judith Miller, Nicole Gross, Deborah Harris, Erica Kennedy, Michaela Tonking, Caitlin Howard, and Enos Interariano. Thank you, JJ. Okay, so since we've made it through the public comment, then I think we'll start, um, if you're ready, Chief Re General Counsel. Ready? Yes. I feel like I always start to my right, so I'll start to my left this time. Put you on the spot, Jackie. <laughs> so um, as we discussed at the last meeting, I think we kind of said up to five. And so I don't want to, you know, force anyone to n rattle off more than they really felt. Um, so just whatever you're comfortable within that range of, of up to five. And so start with the number one. Number one, please. Yeah. So that okay. person would get three points. I'm sorry, uh, Trustee Cottle. I just want to clarify, um, if we can name up to five, then we couldn't do three, two, one, because in our last two would be zero, zero. Right. So I think we do need to settle on how many candidates oh, right. are we supposed to, to give. Um, I'm good with three. I just want to make sure we, we all understand. I, I agree. I thought of, I, I must have forgot, I, I must have forgot the motion. I thought it was, I thought we said, it, they set the example around three is what we said. Did we say around five? Is that what we ended up with? I'm sorry, five, um, I think what we asked was everyone come with five uh, ranked, up to five ranked. Okay. And then we would see how those points worked out and the top three from that group of five would or or wherever the break was if it was clear that there was really a top two then we wouldn't have to do three so okay but uh, so why don't work? we do five four three two okay one, yeah that's a good idea if you don't have below five and four then that's then you're, you just that's don't just, have you're it just yeah done. okay yeah for example 
Does that does that work for the board? That okay. Trustee Calvert. Well, unfortunately, I only have three. <clears throat> I think you can. Yeah. Um, Teresa Herstel, uh, Heather Parkland, and Jack Hyman. And just to confirm, you would like Ms. Herstel to get three? No, Jack is three. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, Teresa, Teresa, excuse me, is two. Mic on. Can you turn your mic on, please? Sorry. And so start with your number one pick. Okay, my Five. number one, oops, sorry. Is Mr. Heineman? No, my number one, yeah, was him. Okay. And... Teresa, okay. and then Heather. Okay. Got it. Trustee Simon Holland. Okay, thank you, Madam President. I also only did three. Um, my top is Sharon Kennedy. Uh, next is Lisa Janassi. And then my third is Heather Parkin. Trustee Cotto. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I came with five, so I'll go ahead and give you five. Starting with number one, Sharon Kennedy. Number two, Heather Parkin. Number three, Lisa Janassi. Number four, Wayne Vanderwell. Number five, Megan Clowers. Okay, I will go next. Uh, my listing was number one, Sharon Kennedy, number two, Lisa Janassi, and number three, Heather Parkin. Okay. All set? Okay, I have three. Number one, Sharon Kennedy. Number two, Lisa Janassi. Number three, Jack Heineman. Trustee Manetto. And number one means my first pick, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> That's going to be your five pointer. That's your. Okay. Yes. Number one is Terry Herstel, Therese Herstel. Number two is Jack Heineman. And the third one is Sharon Kennedy. Okay. And so just to, I think. If you all would not mind, I wouldn't mind going through this just to make sure we have it correct for the record. Would that be okay? So I have Trustee Calvert with Mr. Heineman at five, uh, Ms. Herstel at four, and Ms. Parkin at three. Okay. Trustee Simon Holland, Kennedy at five, Janassi at four, and Parkin at three. Okay. Trustee Cottle. Kennedy at five, Parkin at four, Janassi at three, Vanderwall at two, and Clowers at one. Okay, thank you. Uh, President Raymond, Kennedy at five, Janassi at four, Parkin at three. And then Vice President Taylor, Kennedy at five, Janassi at four, Heineman at three. Okay. And Trustee Minetto, Herstel at five, Heineman at four, and Kennedy at three. If I can just have a minute. Madam President. Yes, Trustee Simon Holland. Is it possible for us to have a little uh, discussion about our choices while they're doing that? That's fine with me, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to um, to comment on why I had the, the three folks that I picked. Um, I think for me, um, some of the important things, as you said, what, what, what do we not have enough of on the board? Um, we want to make sure we have uh, diversity of 
geography and diversity of interests and diversity of experience um, on this board to make some very important decisions that are coming up. Um, I put, pick, put Sharon Kennedy as my top choice for a couple of reasons. One, she uh, has great familiarity with the district, uh, has been working in the district at the level of a principal uh, for years. She's very, very popular in a part of the geography uh, of our district that isn't always, that doesn't always feel that they're um, fully embraced by all of us, um, even though they are, but um, they don't always feel that way. She's also got a background in healthcare, and um, I think that's an important issue that we're dealing with now. Um, and she's a great problem solver, um, really well liked by uh, the people that she has supervised over the years. Um, so she, uh, she came out as my top choice. Um, Lisa Janassi, I think, um, was the third choice in an election in that district, and um, she has served on school naming committee. Um, she was the chair of the school naming committee. She's uh, served the district. She has some skills that are important, uh, grant writing and some uh, nonprofit experience, so I think she's really valuable there, and also had a lot of uh, popular support. We got a lot of um, emails and comments uh, supporting Ms. Janassi. Um, and then Heather Parkin uh, is working on a doctorate in distance learning, which was very um, moving to me and very important. She's also bilingual, uh, and that brings in another part of um, our district representation that we value and we need. Uh, so those were my top three. But uh, again, Sharon Kennedy, even in retirement, came back to work on the reopening task force um, and won't require any getting up to speed. Uh, whoever comes in really needs to understand the district because there won't be really a lot of time uh, to get up to speed. So I just wanted to explain my reasoning for those. Thank you for that. And I'll just say you pretty much said everything that I felt about those three. I had the same ones. Um, I don't know uh, Sharon as well as you do. I did get to visit her um, at her school once, um, but uh, just the value that she holds in terms of her ability to come in stood out uh, quite a bit for me. Um, again, it's a short period of time and um, a lot to digest in a short period of time and still some really important decisions to make between now and the end of the year. So, Anybody else want to add anything? Vice President Taylor. Sure, I'll, I'll add and I won't, I had two of those three I had uh, Sharon Kennedy as my uh, first choice for the reasons so eloquently shared uh, by my colleagues and the same for Lisa Janassi and I, I do want to point out that I, I gave some gave some points um, to uh, the experience in the district and her willingness to to run um, showing showing um, showing interest and I think that that was important this, this one was a little tougher um, between uh, my third choice was Jack Heineman and there was another uh, who I thought that's kind of where a line was drawn. And um, um, Jack, one of, uh, one of the re same reasons, uh, he showed an interest, he ran, he shows an interest in education, um, um, is a, uh, has, was a student uh, leader, um, sounds like for all of his life, <laughs> for the most part, and uh, comes from an area of town that's rapidly growing. Um, they went through a lot last year and um, as, uh, um, as a school. And um, that's a voice that we don't have in a voting capacity. So that's why I went with, with them. Trustee Cotto. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Just real quick, um, I had the same top three as um, Trustee Simon Holland, just a little different order. I, I valued um, district experience, leadership qualities. Um, so I had top, I had five, but um, the top three were, were pretty clear for me as well. Um, so I know we'll hear from them, but that's really where I drew the line in my reasoning. Thank you. Anybody else? Trustee Minetto. Um, I chose Therese because I know her, I know her character. I've, she's retired after 22 years of teaching and so that, of course, that's what I'm thinking. My second choice was Jack, and, and I was thinking, you know, he so clearly wants to get involved in everything, which yay, yay, and maybe this would be a nice taste. That was my thought there, just a nice taste of, oh, wow, is that what I want to do? <laughs> Trustee Cotto. 
we all had <laughs> a brief consideration. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, I'll turn it over to you, Chief General Counsel. Thank you, President Raymond. So uh, the clerk, Ms. Batchelder, and I have uh, confirmed our numbers agree, and we have the final ranking as the mass make it tough to do the classes. It's, but the final ranking is uh, Ms. Kennedy with 23, Ms. Janassi with 15, Ms. Parkin with 13, Mr. Heineman with 12, Ms. Herstel with nine, Mr. Vanderwall with two, and Ms. Clowers with one. So um, it's up to the board at this point to decide where the break point is and who they want to um, interview uh, for the next agenda item. You know, could I ask you to go through the numbers again, please? Yeah. Yes. Um, Ms. Kennedy at 23, Ms. Janassi at 15, Ms. Parkin at 13, Mr. Heineman at 12, Ms. Herstel at nine, Mr. Vanderwall at two, and Ms. Clowers at one. Okay, so we now need to, uh, Vice President Taylor. <laughs> Okay. What are you going to um, make? Sorry. Yeah, just, just for, uh, for consideration for my colleagues, I, I recommend we go with the top four because there's more of a break. The two, 12 and 13, there's only one number, mm -hmm. and then there's more of a break um, going down. So that's just my recommendation for us to kind of consider and toss around. Yep, I see a thumbs up. Anyone have any issues with that? Okay, I think um, then we can make a motion. The process now, we make this motion, uh, open the next agenda item. We'll ask the four top candidates to come in here uh, just so we can thank them and, and see them. But then we will ask them, uh, all but one of them, to step away for the actual interview portion so they don't hear those interview questions. Uh, they'll just be in here for their, their, their time. And that, again, is the... Um, three minutes, uh, five minutes for an opening address and three minutes for each of the three questions. May, may I make one suggestion? Yes. I, I perhaps maybe invite all of those who applied okay. in just yeah, to say good thank point. you. Uh, yeah. I, was just I think about that's what you meant. But yes, I, good know. point. <laughs> yeah. I was actually just about to suggest yeah. that. Very good. <laughs> all right, so if someone would like to make a motion. And I move. Um, I move that we um, um, move forward the top four candidates for uh, further consideration. Do we need to say their names? For the record, Ms. Kennedy, Ms. Janassi, Ms. Parkin, and Mr. Heineman. Okay, thank you. Uh, motion by Vice President Taylor, second by Trustee Cottle. Any further discussion or questions? All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. I just saw Vanjie walk out, so we'll just give it a minute here. I was supposed to signal her. That's my mistake. So she told me to give her a heads up.
I think Katie wants you. No. They need a, one of those big carafes of coffee. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. I am going to open agenda item 5.04. Um, uh, but I guess, do I open it first and then I, I can talk? I think you can talk to them right now okay. and then open it up. <laughs> But before I do that, I just would like to thank all of you. Um, I said at the beginning just how impressed I was with the applications we received. It made this a very challenging job to do. And I was frankly a little shocked by how many we got knowing uh, what you would be up against at this time uh, facing our district. Um, but just so impressed, um, truly uh, um, inspired by the varying kind of ideas that you brought and your motivations for doing this. And um, I just truly appreciate the time you all took to make the effort to apply, but also to be with us today. And um, so thank you all for for the hard work and, and for stepping up at this challenging time for our students and our district. I don't know if anyone else would like to add anything. Well, thank you and uh, hope you got some food or something and <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, so now I will officially open, is that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 5.04, which is discussion and possible action to appoint an applicant to the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees for District A by considering the character and professional competence of the candidates through interviews by the Board of Trustees of those legally qualified applicants who were selected for such interviews pursuant to the previous agenda item 5.03, and that includes let me see, go through my list. Lisa Janassi, Jack Heineman, Sharon Kennedy, and Heather Parkin. Yep. I got that right. Yes, you did. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all again, um, and congratulations. Uh, as I said, this was not an easy job. Um, I think I'll just take a moment to kind of go through the logistics, um, and please chime in, uh, Chief General Counsel, if I miss anything. but. We're gonna go through a process of, of interviews now. Um, each of you will have about five minutes to make an opening statement. And then we have three questions. Uh, we are limiting the answers to those questions to three minutes. Um, and so um, to make it fair for everybody, um, the three that are not being interviewed at the time will be uh, back in the room where they can't hear what's happening in here. Um, and then the one individual will stay. Um, we were, uh, I will look to you, Chief General Counsel, if you have any suggestions, if we just start in alphabetical order or if we go in. It, it's at your discretion, Madam President. Alphabetical order sounds as good as okay. any other order to me. I don't. Trustees, do you have any? <laughs> okay. All right, so we're gonna. Sorry? <laughs> Not? Okay. Okay, so we're going to do alphabetical. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so that would mean uh, Lisa Janassi will be our first um, interview. And um, Chief General Counsel, do you have anything to add? Just quickly, uh, Madam President, uh, we, pursuant to our last board meeting, we had three questions turned in from trustees. The questions have been vetted for legal purposes and they're appropriate uh, as far as the law goes. I have made a copy of those questions and they'll just sit here for all four candidates. Okay. So in case they need a reference point. Great, and when you uh, approach the podium, please do not touch the microphone. <laughs> we have had some technical difficulties. Um, so if you can, uh, Try not to, I don't know, are they gonna be at the podium or at the desk? Okay. I'm gonna try.
being very touchy tonight. So. <laughs> And the mic is on, okay. It is off? It's on. On, okay, great. I can never remember. Well, thank you so much, um, Ms. Janassi, for joining us. And can you help me? Is it Janassi or Janaski? It's Janassi. Janassi, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. um, appreciate you again taking the time to submit this and, and be here with us. Um, so as I mentioned, you'll have five minutes to just um, kind of explain a little bit more about yourself, any kind of opening statement you'd like to make, and then um, we'll move on to the interview questions. Sure, what a way to put a woman on the spot. <laughs> you know, my, my, my surname was Pierce, so I could, could have just transferred over to that one and, and gone last, but all right, fine. <laughs> Um, you know, I particularly ran because I um, really, really was concerned about some of the decisions that were being made in District A, and, and most of you knew that as you saw me campaign. Um, I have a, a much deeper background than just grant writing. I've actually been a project manager, I've been a scrum master, I've run several nonprofits, you know, lots more experience than just that. I didn't go into teaching, I could have, my undergrad is in English but I care so much about our students. When I met my husband, he was working with this children in trans transition program and I had never heard of that. And to me, I wanted in. I just wanted to know how can I help more? And as this opportunity approached and I was uncomfortable with things that were happening in the past, I threw my hat in. I really was interested. And I'm so interested in what happens in this community. I, I'm on the Arts Council. I, I serve on a, in a large nonprofit. I, have non I, I also have nonprofits, and this is just part of what I believe in. I truly have a heart of servitude, and I believe so much in what you do. I sat and heard all of the comments tonight, all of the teachers, and I know you are making the tough choices to keep everyone safe during these crazy times. And I'm not going to use the word unprecedented. Someone said we should try a new word, and I said it's a bit freakish. It's kind of a freakish time. So that, that's what I'm going to say. I'm not going to take five minutes. I, I, I'm just not the person that does it off the cuff, but that's, that's really why I'm here. I just have a heart of servitude, and I really feel that I can make a, a dent in this. And, and we all know to see more funds in Nevada, this comes from a federal level, and we, it means combining and working together to truly bring more money into the state, and that is a huge passion for me. That's, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> So we'll have our three questions, again, sure. three minutes. The clock doesn't start until you start talking. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, so if you need a minute to just think or whatever, take your time there. Um, and I will ask um, Trustee Minetto to read our first question. All right. Welcome. Thank you. You're, you're Describe your view. I'm over here, sorry. <laughs> Describe your view of the roles of the school board trustees and the superintendent and then what is an ideal relationship between these two offices? Sure, sure. So I do a lot of board development in my past. My master's degree is in nonprofit management, so I understand to have a strong board, you really have to work together with that superintendent or executive director or the person who's running the, the real show, right? And I think that is so imperative to these times. All of you come with brilliant expertise that you bring to the table. And I've watched all of you grow over the past several years, and this has just been phenomenal to watch you tonight in your response. I think these are one team of synergy, and it is about teamwork. It's about removing impediments if you can, and if you can't remove them, addressing them together and coming together for the one purpose of serving our community and our children and our parents and our, our custodians or everybody that comes into this world. It's a lot of pieces. And Kristen, you have been amazing, truly incredible as a parent, as a taxpayer. I, I am just feel so blessed every day. But that's what I see as a board. It's truly about bringing people to the table that bring an expertise that is maybe not there and a different perspective to, to give that superintendent just a little bit more oomph to sit there and support her and understand what she's going through, understand the people that she serves and the needs she has. And I think this is something that's just real synergistic to, for the, all of you. Thank you. All right, question number two, I will turn over to Trustee Cottle. Thank you, Madam President. 
Thank you, uh, Lisa, for being here. Sure, thank you. Um, this will be a two-parter. So given the short period of time you will serve in this role, how do you plan to make a positive contribution to the Board of Trustees, and what is one thing you would like to accomplish during this time? Okay. I think the positive contribution I could bring is, you know, we have a community now that's kind of feeling a little disruptive. You know, we're, we're like incline in many ways of community I come from, but we're like incline in many ways. We kind of feel a little forgotten. We've got Ward 2 out there. We've got Galena out there. And we do kind of feel like we're not represented at the moment, which we aren't, right? And I think there's some healing that needs to happen for that community so that they feel engaged and they realize, you know, we just have how many new schools out there? We've got Incline Village that's done a great job and they've dealt more with the smoke than we all probably have, right? And I really think in the short period of time, it's about a healing phase as well. It's really transitioning from this person into whoever is hired in November and then coming in in January. It's really getting that seat ready for that person. What can I provide in the time that I'm here? Um, you know, I've, I've reviewed policies, I've written policies in the past, I'm, you know, detail-oriented, all those things that we all come to the table with with our resumes. But, um, you know, one thing I'd like to accomplish during ta this time is really just that transition, is really getting this seat ready for whoever is hired in November and comes in, in January so that they're ready to go. Great, thank you. And the last question will come from Vice President Taylor. Hi, Ms. Janassi, thank you for being here. Yeah. Okay, beyond the immediate concerns around the COVID-19 pandemic, and we know there are many, uh, what do you think are the most pressing issues that are facing our district? Absolutely. Um, my children are both in distance learning, and as a, um, as a disclosure, my husband works in the distance learning department. So for that, I have to stay away from a little bit. What I think the most pressing issues are, are facing in this district is what's next. And, I think that you are doing a really great job listening to the CFO tonight and setting that stage of this is going to be a little bit longer than we expected, folks, and we're going to need more, and we're going to start looking beyond just what taxpayers get, what all these monies. We're going to be looking at what's working in other school districts so we can replicate, communicate with them, and bring some of those tools into here. And these are not financial tools, not always. Just what's working in districts that are comparable but are very successful. How can we mirror what they're doing and i think that's something that the parents want to see i think we want to see more transparency i think that we are being patient and i do think that our teachers are just saints i mean i look at my two children's teachers every day i've got one that actually is in the desk next to me and i just think oh my goodness this woman is amazing she's absolutely incredible and you know i think the most pressing issues that our district is going to face is the disparities how are we going to, if we go into a shutdown, what are we going to do for those children who come to us to eat, come to us for safety, come to us because we're the one constant thing in their lives? And that's the biggest issue that I think we're going to face, and it's not just you. It's the entire community. We're going to have families who are now down to one job. We have families that will be on the street. And these are the things that we are all addressing, and we are so worried and so concerned, and I think this is the big pressing issue for all of us, is how are we going to serve our full community together? Business owners, mothers, parents, workers, doctors, all of these, how are we going to serve our community together? And I do think that's the pressing issue. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> made it look easy. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. And you can go up that ramp and out that door. Oh, Lisa, do you want a water? Are you good? Oh, I have one in my purse. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome, Mr. Heineman. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I've been told not to touch this, right? Yes, I can't, that's, you know, no. <laughs> move it around. No. We might be here till midnight if you do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Got um, it. 
As I mentioned uh, earlier, there will be a five minute opening statement and then each of the questions we'll be asking, you'll have three minutes to address. Uh, the clock doesn't start till you start talking, so if you need a minute or two to kind of think about something, take it your time. Um, and good luck. Awesome. That's not just for decoration, right? No. That's the real thing. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon. Oh, well, good evening, <laughs> President <laughs> Raymond, Vice President Taylor, Superintendent McNeil, and members of the board. I am incredibly honored, and I do mean this sincerely, incredibly honored to be here today to be considered as a candidate for this appointment, to be seriously considered, it is a really great honor. I trust that all of you had time to analyze my resume and letter of intent, and I hope that when looking at my resume, you too can see the dedication and admiration I have for public service, education, and this community. My resume tells you what I've done, but it doesn't tell you why. One of the quotes that have stayed with me since middle school is a quote from Gandhi that says, be the change you wish to see the world, in the world. Be the change. It's what I've continuously tried to live up to. In middle school, after seeing the lack of care for our campus, some students and I co-founded a club dedicated to protecting our nearby environment. At age 11, I became fascinated with politics and decided to volunteer for a presidential campaign both in 2012 and in 2016. I served as class president at my high school for two years, guiding and serving my peers through fundraisers and events. I became so involved and passionate about whom we choose to lead us locally that I was hired as a field director two times for local city council races. I've had the opportunity to serve on school internal committees and participate in WCSD sponsored events where I've always represented my peers and provided insight on what kids like us go through in these hallways. I was elected student body president where I had the immense privilege to work day in and day out with students and faculty. I was able to lead them through the good and the bad identifying, discussing, and finding solutions to problems in a collaborative way. Throughout my 12 years of being a student in this district, I've always tried to be the change, to step up, to help, to serve. So when I talked to a teacher about the challenges our schools face, she told me to stop talking about change and start being the change. As you know, you may know, I ran for the school board. And while I may not have been successful, I'm proud of the campaign I ran. I valued the input from the people I met and I learned so much from the teachers and, and students with whom I have spoke with. And I'm so grateful for the 2,601 votes of confidence I received from this community. It's about 2,600 more than I expected. <laughs> and now I'm here, wanting to serve this community once again, wanting to be a voice for positive action and demonstrate leadership. But this commitment is much more different than when I was running for office. With only over three months to serve, I believe that this trustee's role will be to provide stable governance and thoughtful decision making. Additionally, this trustee will have an even greater responsibility to listen to the community and to communicate the essential information everyone's got to know. I know what you may be thinking. I'm thinking it too. My resume, it's a unique one and it isn't the standard experience you all get. But I believe that's a good thing. I can bring a unique and complimentary perspective to this board that's quite different from the other applicants. I have the honor of receiving and having receiving the support from over 100 educators in a letter that I've sent to you all via email. These educators, they are superheroes. And I'm always aware that I am who I am today because of the dedication and support of these incredible people. In fact, when I was in middle school, my social studies teacher, she gave me this constitutional booklet. And in it, she inscribed by saying, I can't wait to see what you become. It's those relationships that I have with those teachers, with those educators, custodians, office secretaries. It's, it's that ability is my strength to put a name and face to the issues that come across your desks every day. So I'd like to end my remarks with one of those statements from that letter. Jack is a product of us, of our district, 
of our community. He is the result of decisions made by this very board. This is an opportunity for us as a district to send a message to the community. Our youth is ready and will always be ready to lead. Thank you for your time and I look forward to these questions. All right, thank you very much. Our first question is going to be uh, coming from Trustee Minetto, and so I will turn it over to her now. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you. So describe your view of the roles of the Board of Trustees and the Superintendent, and what is the ideal relationship between the two offices? Thank you, Trustee Minetto. Um, listen, in, in my view, I think the school board has two main functions. Uh, first, to guide the district, the community, and our schools through good times and bad by overseeing a budget that aligns resources to the district's goals and strategic plan. But second, the board is the board's responsible to oversee and also guide our superintendent. Uh, I think in many ways there's a false thinking that the board manages at the district and day-to-day -day operations. Clearly, that responsibility fortunately and unfortunately, I guess, is with our superintendent, as it should. And I truly do believe that the board's main focus should always be developing goals that reflect the vision and values of the community, developing po policy and providing informed oversight of the superintendent. When it comes to a relationship, I, I certainly don't expect that as a trustee for three months, we're going to be BFFs by the end. But um, you know, I would definitely be able to develop the same relationships one would hope um, to develop in the shortest term as possible. Uh, as I've said, my main focus would be to provide stable governance and, pro pos and promote positive relationships which form the basis uh, for collaborative problem solving and decision making. Therefore, in my three month term, I'd regularly uh, communicate with the superintendent and direct any necessary questions from constituents to her desk as it should be. All right, thank you very much. Our next question um, is coming from Trustee Cottle. Thank you, and thank you, Jack, for being here. Thank you. Uh, given the short period of time you will serve in this role, how do you plan to make a positive contribution to the Board of Trustees, and what is one thing you would like to accomplish during this time? Thank you, Trustee Caudill, for the question. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious that this is a pretty short term, and so um, like I said in my letter of intent and I said in my introductory remarks, my main goal and main purpose is to provide stable governance, uh, to listen to constituents' concerns, and provide any necessary, and, and ask the tough questions during board meetings. I, I think to, to say that I'd accomplish one specific thing is, would be a little premature, especially in the short term three months. I think the overall goal, provide stable governance, and, and to be a voice for students and, and teachers and educators, you know, the people that were in the that are in the front lines right now. I think that's necessary, especially over these three months, you all are gonna be making some pretty tough decisions, some pretty unprecedented decisions. And I think it would definitely help to have a voting member on this board that has been in those schools recently, been in those desks, walked those hallways, and can really provide the necessary perspective and feedback. And again, ask those tough questions. All right, thank you. Our third question and final question is coming from Vice President Taylor. Awesome, awesome. Welcome, Mr. Heineman. Thank you. Okay, your last question, beyond the immediate concerns around COVID-19, certainly those are fairly obvious, uh, what do you think are the most pressing issues that are facing our district? That is a great question. Uh, I, think, um, I think in terms of how of COVID-19, well, I actually, I'm going to kind of violate this question and go into COVID-19 because I think the after effects of COVID-19 is really one of my major concerns. You know, how are we going to address, um, we just saw in the beginning of this meeting, uh, felt like ages ago, um, that, you know, there are, uh, obviously there are a lot of um, families that chose not to send their supposed to be kindergartners into school. I think that's going to be a problem for our first grade teachers. But more specifically, that's not just, it's not just an isolated problem in kindergarten, it's everywhere. You know, it's, it's in high school, it's in middle school. So I think that would be one of the major issues that I think is facing us long term is how are we going to address the inequities, not just in the short term, because I think we're trying to with the Wi-Fi buses, um, but in the long term, how do we address those inequities? How do we make up for that lost time? Because 
let's face it, distance learning isn't uh, the best form of education. I know, I'm a university student at college, and I can tell you I'm, full, I'm fully virtual and I'm thankful, but I can tell you that I'm not learning the material I should be learning if I was in person. And I'm sure tons of educators and um, professors at, at the university could agree. Um, in terms of outside of COVID-19, I think there's a plurifatha, I think that's the word, <laughs> of issues. Um, I think when we look at diversity uh, in the district, uh, you have a couple students here, you know, uh, a couple students that came to public comment uh, and were concerned about diversity and social issues that are affecting this district. I think as a district, we can do a better job of communicating and really adapting with the community in terms of our board policy. And, and, and there is a lot of fallacies on both sides, I think, um, in terms of what that board policy is regarding Black Lives Matter and the LGBTQ flag. And I think it's important for us to communicate that um, pretty considerably. You know, I saw Dr. Taylor, Trustee Taylor and Superintendent McNeil, your courageous conversations or in your town halls, I think they're helping. And I think we could use more of that. And as a interim trustee, I would definitely be more committed to engaging and communicating the necessary uh, things that need to be communicated with our community. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you. Great job. Eloquent as always. <laughs> I'm so scared to do this. I don't want to turn it off. Oh, jeez. No pressure. Well, welcome, Mrs. Kennedy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, President Raymond. As I said um, at the top of the agenda item, you'll have about uh, five minutes, um, up to five minutes, to just give us sort of an opening statement. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, if you'd like. Um, and then we'll have the three interview questions um, with three minutes for each question, the clock doesn't start until you start talking. So if you need a minute to kind of compose yourself, you've got that. And then um, I'll just hand it over to you. Thank you. Am I allowed to say how nervous I am? Oh my gosh. Okay, I'll live. President Raymond, esteemed trustees and guests. My name is Sharon Kennedy, as you know, and I'm honored to be considered for this position. Throughout my life, I've been involved in the helping professions of nursing and most recently education. I've been told that my reputation is one of integrity, honesty, hard work, and fairness. And so I believe that I had earned a peaceful and relaxing retirement, which began on July 1st. However, when I heard on the news that WCSD would be looking to appoint a replacement to fulfill the remainder of this District A term, I surprised myself and probably shocked my husband when I said aloud, I think I'm gonna apply. Listening to teachers, parents, students, and other staff of schools during public comment of board meetings, on social media, as well as in private conversations reinforced that sentiment. If I could, and if it was possible, I wanted to be part of a solution and be a support. Please understand, I am no politician and I have no interest in running for a full term, but this is an unusual time and I believe that I'm in a unique position. I have a medical background as a registered nurse for nearly 25 years, including experience as a home health public health nurse in inner city New Haven. I've worked in education for 20 years and as a very recently retired principal, I understand and work directly with many of the processes and policies of WCSD. As a member of the WCSD Reopening Task Force, 
I had access to and participated in many of the discussions on the problems and challenges and considered solutions that that large group of people in our district and community agonized over in order to educate children and keep everyone safe. What I'm saying is I'm applying and asking to be considered because I believe that I can help and I'm willing to do so. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, if you want to be a true professional, you'll do something a little outside yourself, something to make the world a better place for those less fortunate than you. Well, applying for this position is definitely outside of my comfort zone, but I have the time, the willingness, and unique skill set that may be of assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our first question will be posed by Trustee Minetto, and I will turn it over to her. Welcome. So describe your view of the roles of the Board of Trustees and the Superintendent, and what is the ideal relationship between the two offices? So my understanding is that the Board of Trustees advises as well as verifies policies, um, agrees to and not agrees to, um, formulates policies, budgets, directs and advises. The superintendent takes care of the day-to-day -day running as well as long-term planning for the district. I think the, the best part of to, way to describe it is they work together, that the superintendent relies on input from the board and the board really requires the input of the superintendent, that the superintendent who knows what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis explains why things are needed, uh, what is needed, and how the board could possibly help the superintendent and the administration of the district to fulfill their goals because everyone is working on the same mission. My understanding is everybody is trying to implement the mission and the vision of the entire district. Thank you. All right, our next question is coming from Trustee Cottle. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Given the short period of time you will serve in this role, how do you plan to make a positive contribution to the Board of Trustees and what is one thing you would like to accomplish during this time? I believe I can make a positive contribution by being prepared and understanding what is going on, that I would be aware of what the concerns are, be aware of the items that are on an agenda, have done my homework, be aware of what um, people that live in the district, not just an incline, um, are talking about and what their concerns are so that you can come and be a valuable part of the conversation. I realize that whoever takes this position is going to be entering a group that's been working together for several years. And in this case, the best thing that you can do is be prepared, listen, which is, I think, one of the most important things, and then offer suggestions and ideas that will further things that are going on. Um, the one thing that I would want to accomplish would be to represent my district. That, I think, is the most important thing. And for me, that would mean leaving Incline and making sure that I was a presence at those other 15 schools if possible, within that period of time. All right, thank you very much. And moving on, our next question is from, and final question is from Vice President Taylor. Ms. Kennedy, welcome. Dr. Taylor. Okay, here's my question. <clears throat> Beyond the immediate concerns around COVID-19, uh, what do you think are the most pressing issues facing our district? Can I say that M word out loud, money? Uh, sure. Finances, funding, the F words. Um, I think that it's always a challenge. I think that you, 
you don't have to go attend too many of the board meetings to hear the concerns of staff and teachers and families who are concerned about what we do about funding. And while I know that it's not a district um, decision about how things are funded, and if we can give the shout out to the, the CFO and the accounting for Washoe County School District, I think they're miracle workers right now with what they're doing. It's pretty amazing. But the reality is, is that that has been and I think is gonna continue to be a major concern is, you know, how, how many times can we try to make something out of nothing? You know, make that rabbit appear out of a hat to find the funds to be able to do everything that we all want to do for the children in this district. So that's it for me. So my number one concern is and has been something that we have no control over, funding. Okay, what about something that we do have control over? Something we do have control over? Well, I think then it goes back to that same thing. It's like, so what do we do with the funds that we have? And I think that being aware at all times about how we're spending our money and what we're spending it on, it is limited. And making sure that we have our priorities and that our priorities are in alignment with what the people in our district really want. And so I think that as a board member, understanding that that is something that you have to come back, what is important to the people in the district about what we're doing with the oh so limited funds that we may have. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, great job. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Appreciate you being so prepared. <laughs> I won't touch the microphone, I promise. <laughs> Do you mind if I pull out my phone though, just because I have notes on them? Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And um, just a reminder that we have set this up so you'll have about five minutes um, for just any kind of opening statement, um, remarks you would like to make in addition to, you know, what. Um, you've provided in your in letter and resume. And then we'll move on to the um, three interview questions. They're each three minutes. Um, the clock over here won't start uh, ticking until you start talking. So if you need a minute or two to, or minute if to think about anything, um, you can have that. And then um, we'll just move through those questions and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. So my name is Heather Parkin and I want to first thank all of you guys for all your time and effort and I know that especially recently you are, have these marathon meetings <laughs> so your endurance is incredible and I thank you for that. Um, I'd like to first start by saying that I am a product of Washoe County School Districts. I only went to Washoe County Schools. I went to Jesse Beck, Swope, Reno High. <laughs> I'm the youngest of nine kids. All my brothers and sisters graduated from Reno High. One of my sisters is right back there. She ran as well. Lori O'Leary. Um, so we're very invested in the school district. I have nieces and nephews that are going to various schools within the district as well. So I am very much a part of this community. I've been an educator for over 20 years with 15, give or take, in Washoe County. I recently went down to Carson City um, to teach there. I teach in the prison education program down there. Um, which is actually really interesting, really rewarding, very, very different than traditional school, but it's, it's an incredible job. Why did I leave? Because of the, dis the, the unrest, I'll say it, amongst teachers in the school district. That's why I think it would be very beneficial to have a former educator, someone who's very familiar with Washoe County, taking this position. There's clearly 
tension between teachers and, and the school district right now. We need someone that can bridge that gap. It would be beneficial to have someone who's been in the trenches in Washoe County and who is taught there and knows what's going on. I would love to do that. Even though I work for Carson City now, I have not given up hope that we can be a better school district. I, like I said, I have nieces and nephews that are still going to school here. I have a vested interest in making sure that we're doing what we can for our kids. Right now, what does that mean in the age of Corona? It basically means online learning. As you guys know, I'm getting my doctorate in online learning. So I have a lot of beneficial information and, and basically strategies that could really help the board making decisions. Again, when you combine that with the fact that I taught in Washoe County for 15 years, I'm very well aware of what's going on here. That is a powerful combination. Yes, it's only three months, but a lot can be done in three months. Um, we need to take this opportunity to really bridge that gap with our teachers. As you guys all know, they're, they're leaving in droves right now. That's scary. Without teachers, how do we make education work? We need someone that can bridge that gap. I think that person is me. I have taken on leadership positions within the district before. I was here in March of 2016, uh, applying for the same position. At the time, it was the at-large seat when mon one member had to leave. I've been a union representative, um, and I'm bilingual. I have attributes that make me very beneficial and very useful to this committee, or excuse me, this community. And I would like to make sure that I can help in whatever way I can. I'm not, how much time do I have? 1.47? <laughs> uh, let me just look at my notes real fast. Again, I just, I just want to reiterate that I think I, could, I would be an excellent liaison between the board and teachers and students. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll now move on to the interview questions. And our first question is coming from Trustee Manetto. Welcome. Thank you. Describe your view of the roles of the Board of Trustees and the Superintendent, and what is the ideal relationship between the two offices? The roles of the Board of, Super, or Board of Trustees and the Superintendent are to make sure that the district is functioning in the best possible way. That includes the budget, community relations, um, being an advocate, being a listener for all the stakeholders, whether it's teachers, students, community members. The best way to make that happen is communication, and it needs to be transparent, both between the Board of Trustees, the superintendent, and the community, the schools and the school districts and all those involved. I believe the best way to make that happen is to make sure that people are communicating and, and, and seeking solutions. We spend a lot of time, I think, in our society these days complaining instead of looking at how do we move forward from here. So we need to recognize that we have issues, but we need to actively look to solve them. And I think that's the important thing is staying focused on the goal. And here, in this case, between the board and the superintendent, that relationship needs to be a productive school district, meaning financially, community-oriented, educationally. Um, and we need to look towards the future as well, and that's distance learning. So how do we make that work for our community so we're getting the best educational output? All of us have to work together, the superintendent, the board of trustees, and the community. So, I don't believe it's just a relationship between those two people, the superintendent and the board. If you take out the community out of that equation, you're not really fulfilling your goals. So communicate between all three. That's, that's how I think it would work. All right, thank you. Our second question is coming from Trustee Cottle. Thank you, and thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Given the short period of time you will serve in this role, how do you plan to make a positive contribution to the Board of Trustees, and what is one thing you would like to accomplish during this time? I think the biggest asset that I have and I can bring to the Board is the relationship I have with teachers in this district. I, like I said, I've taught here for 15 years. I am aware of the issues that are faced by teachers and by students. I'm a member of the community, just like all the other applicants are, but 
I have a unique perspective in that I know what teachers are facing. Um, the only way to make this three months effective is to take the concerns of students and teachers and address them and try to actively seek solutions. Yes, it's three months, but a lot can be done in three months. Um, I think that the best advocate you could possibly have is someone that the community wants to see. Meaning, you see teachers every day at these board meetings saying that no one's listening to them, saying that they're, they're struggling. So being that sympathetic ear, that advocate for them in the classroom, is probably the best thing that I could do in that three months. And I'm already familiar with many of the problems and issues that teachers and students are facing right now. But being a teacher myself, it's a very easy pathway to get people communicating and expressing their feelings, even the people in this district that feel like they don't have a sympathetic ear to turn to because they're scared that there may be a retaliation. They're scared that they may face backlash if they speak up. If you're talking teacher to teacher, teacher to student, that's a relationship that you, it can't be replicated except in those situations. So I think that it is important to have a voice of the community here, even if it's only three, for three months. And the biggest part of our community, educationally speaking here, is the teachers. So I think the asset that I would bring in three months is addressing those, those problems that keep cropping up and we keep seeing at board meetings. Um, being that liaison to the teachers and the students. A lot can be done in three months. Um, but the thing is, we need to make sure we're addressing what's important to teachers so that we can make these fixes both educationally and just work-wise, you know, work environments. All right, thank you very much. And our third and final question is coming from Vice President Taylor. That's me. Good, good, good evening, Ms. Hi. Park, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, uh, your last question for tonight is, beyond the immediate concerns around COVID-19, oh, what do you think are the most pressing issues that are facing our district? Outside of district or distance learning, um, we have a budget shortfall. And I realize that that doesn't fall on you guys. Um, that's our legislature, but that's one of the main things that we should be doing is forcing people or advocating for more funding. Um, it's hard to make schools work without money. Um, we lack as well a, a good community support system. We need to actively uh, seek our community members input. That includes teachers, students, parents. I think that that is probably one of the biggest issues is that we need to make sure we're reaching everyone and having an avenue for them to speak their minds, get their points across, tell us what they need so that we can make education more effective for them. Community involvement is one of the biggest things leading to better, better education in schools. We need to actively recruit and seek help, volunteering, um, support and yes that's going to be difficult in, in the age of covid you know having parents come in or what have you but that doesn't mean we can't solicit their input in other ways we have facebook we have twitter we have all these ways of making sure that we communi can communicate even despite the challenges of corona and i think the only way that we can move forward as a district is to make sure that we're meeting all the needs of our community members so Succinctly, I would say getting the community involved would be the best, uh, one, to, would alleviate one of the biggest challenges that the school district faces. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Great job. Um, I think we're actually going to ask you to stay in the room. Okay. Uh, you can find a seat back there. Um, and then we're going to ask the others to join you. Um, and we'll do our deliberation at this time. Thank um, you. And I just want to say thank you. I know you guys have a challenging job ahead of you, especially these last few months. You're doing a great job, <laughs> really. <laughs> no one is envious of the position you're in. You guys have been working hard, 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 hard. And I appreciate it as a community member. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I think um, while the others are joining us, I'll uh, check with our recording secretary and see if we have any public comment on this item. I do not have any cards. 
Okay, it looks like maybe we will add one. Mr. Navadran, after you've made your public comment, if you would please fill out one of the yellow public comment cards. Oh, we have one for you. We, we'll take care of it. Uh, so I, I did, I read the, I heard the, the all the candidate, they're very good, very good fit for all the candidate. And, uh, and uh, I know the many teacher, uh, many uh, uh, candidate have been here for Wiener for a long time. And uh, I think, uh, I think that Jack Human you should give the Jack Kuman a, a chance to have a board trustee, just in case, like in the future, and maybe he wanted to run as a politician or a school trustee, or help your others. Just, just let the Jack Kuman. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Navadran. All right, no further public comment. Then we can move on to our uh, deliberations on this item. Um, once again, I really would like to thank all of you for your time this evening and for making the effort to um, apply and be with us. Um, you know, it struck me as we were going through this that we have a very recent former student, a very recent former principal, a parent, and a teacher. Um, so we really have <laughs> covered all the bases with our candidates, uh, which is wonderful. Um, really appreciate, uh, again, your stepping up and putting yourselves out there for this. Um, I don't know if anyone is jumping to get started. I can. <laughs> I'll um, get us kicked off. Um, you know, I, I really was um, impressed with just the different perspectives that everyone brought, and I can see so much value in each of you and what you would bring um, to the district at this time. Uh, it really is a very hard decision. Um, I think, you know, for me, I really do fall back um, to kind of what I said at the beginning, and um, while I can see so much value and all that you have to add. When I look at this period of time that we're facing in the next three months and the decisions we're gonna make, um, Sharon Kennedy really does um, stand out to me as someone who would be able to um, not just come in and, and be ready, but um, you know, I really valued the time that she spent uh, working on the reopening committee and so her knowledge of kind of the process that got us to, you know, really where we are today, um, I would think to be very valuable. I think the um, relationship that she has with her constituents, um, you know, especially in Incline Village, but we heard from, um, in the emails that we received, we heard from teachers, we heard from parents, we heard from um, so many people that covered really uh, all of um, the kind of different, uh, constituent groups that she would be working um, with. And so uh, for me, she, she really uh, rose to the top and is the, the best fit at this time for the appointment. Trustee Minetto. Um, I concur with that. I, uh, she clearly has a heart for the children and as a retired teacher, that's all you heard from me for forever, huh? Um, and I, I just agree with that. That's just the perception I got. Vice go, President Taylor, we yeah, we around? can just go. Okay, we can go around the horn. Um, and going in, and going into tonight. Um, I thought we had a really good group of, of candidates and then going into the finals, the finals tonight, if you will, the interviews, it was clear to me that we had a really great panel of four people that were remaining. 
Um, I love the perspectives. Um, there are a couple of things I was looking for going into tonight. One is someone uh, bringing someone in who, who added that would add value to the board. It's a very short period of time, but we certainly want someone who's going to add to us and give us a perspective that we don't have. So, and something, not just a perspective that we don't have, but in this short period of time, a perspective that can make us better during this time that we're in. A lot of perspectives that we don't have, but something that's going to add to us, right? And, you know, we all know we can use help, but that's another meeting. Um, the, the other thing is looking at um, um, the learning curve. I mean, as, pre you, as prepared as probably we all thought we were coming into this thing with the great backgrounds that we have, it is like drinking from not a, water, not a, not a hose, but a hydrant. I mean, it, it is. It, there's just no other way to describe it. It's, just, it's like drinking like that's, that. Maybe that was just my experience. But it's like, it's like drinking from a hydrant. And so it's really hard to be able to do that and still have an opportunity to, we don't want someone just to be here and just to vote like the rest of us vote, but who can, who can again, add, add value to us. Um, and then I have, there was a third thing I, was, I felt so strongly about that I didn't write it down, and now I don't remember what it was. But it was really good. It was, it was, it was really, hey, it's 912. That's all I'm saying. Um, and actually in this, um, I do think that, that Sharon Kennedy brings more of that. I think each of the four people that we interviewed tonight bring that. I think she brings more of that um, to the position. And I think for this period of time at where we are right now, um, I think um, she's the best one for us at this time. Thank you, Vice President Taylor. Trustee Cottle. Thank you, Madam President. I really appreciate all the candidates, not just applying, but giving such great interviews. I, I think all four did did an excellent job. And, and to echo what President Raymond said, all four bring a different perspective. And I wish we could just appoint all of you for that perspective. But uh, Chief General Counsel uh, Rombardo won't let us do that. Um, but in, in, in reviewing all the materials and, and going through the interviews, I, I do think um, Sharon Kennedy's experience is going to be very valuable to this board. Being a former administrator recently, um, and going through the issues we had last year, reopening task force, um, tremendous support in the incline community. Um, and, and I just think that administrator experience is going to be something that I do think we can learn from because I think sometimes um, that principal perspective sometimes gets lost in the conversation because we hear from so many teachers and and we got to remember our, our principals and um, but it, it's hard this is a hard one because I do think no matter which way we go the district a would be well taken care of for the next few months with all four candidates and honestly I did not expect that I really didn't. It's a short period of time. You turn on the news and you wonder, man, why would I want to do that? And so I was just so impressed tonight. And um, it, it's really, uh, District A is going to be, be in good hands regardless of, of which way uh, this board goes. So thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Trustee Cottle. Trustee Simon Holland. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I, I want to thank all of you. Um, I sat in your shoes uh, at one point. I applied to uh, to be a replacement. So I know it's a very tough process and it's really painful. Um, and I want to thank you. Uh, you obviously all have prepared. You've spent time looking at what the issues are and what you could do to help. And, um, and as Trustee Cottle said, you know, there is a point where you're thinking, am I in my right mind to even be applying for this? And you still went forward, and so I thank you for that. Um, Ms. Janassi, I thank you for um, all of the work that you do in the community. I think your experience with nonprofits uh, brings a great deal to us. Uh, I think your discussion about healing uh, is really important, and I think we all need to, to be mindful of that. Um, Mr. Heineman, um, very excited about your enthusiasm and your energy. Um, I think you did a lot of work um, in your campaign and since to connect with people in District A, and I think that's really important. Um, I think you're a great listener, and I think you would be a, a big help 
uh, in terms of communicating some of the difficult messaging that we need to get out there. You have a lot of energy for that, and, and, uh, and that's a great contribution. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy, I know you well and have seen the great work that you do uh, at Incline, and, um, and I know how well respected you are there, and I know what a great team player you are, and I think that's one of the things on this board that I have been grateful for. Um, I'm now in my fourth year on this board, and um, we can't get this difficult work done if we don't have mutual respect and teamwork and collaboration, and you are wonderful at building that uh, within any group that you work in. So thank you for that. And Ms. Parkin, um, what a wonderful set of contributions you bring with uh, working in the prison. How remarkable. That's a really great place to be investing in education. I thank you for um, your work on distance learning, and I think that would be really valuable uh, to the district. And also your teacher's perspective, as you've said, um, a hugely important thing. So very difficult decision. Um, as my colleagues have said, each of you would bring wonderful things uh, to this board and to the district. And I hate to say it, but um, District A is going to have a hard time after whoever is selected tonight is gone. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> um, all that being said, um, Mrs. Kennedy, you still rise to the top for me. And um, so, uh, but thank you all for the uh, tremendous contributions that you're making and, and for caring about this job and this district enough uh, to go through this process. So thank you all. Thank you, Trustee Simon Holland. Trustee Calvert. Well, unfortunately, I do not know all of you. I enjoyed each and every one of you. Ms. Janaski, I really, you just really, I, nonprofit is something that I've done off and on for a long time, and I truly appreciate that you do that and that you're out there. And I believe that if you're, I mean, you just do an awesome job. And if the time comes that I would run again is what I would say to you. I really would, because I believe that you would bring a lot to the community and to the students, to the teachers, to everyone in your district. I think that they would be very proud to have you. Mr. Henneman, I mean, you are awesome. I think that you as well would be a very good fit in our school district. There are a lot of issues that you touched on that are dear to my heart and things that I would like to see go forward in our uh, school district. I too uh, grew up here, went to school here, and there do need to be changes, but I do hope that you will hang in there and when the time is right, that you will come forward and bring forth what you have. You're young, you have a lot of potential. I love that about you. And don't give up the fight. I mean, hang in there and somehow, some ways, things will work out for you. Ms. Parkin, you also, I mean, I loved everything that you said about the distance learning. You've gone on to get your education. You're helping in the community with our prisoners. And I know that's gotta be a challenge because a lot of them, when they come out, they have no idea what it's like in the real world, what's going on, the challenges that they face. And I think it's awesome that you are in that position, that you are able to um, address something that a lot of people don't think is important. You know, I mean, they think, oh, well, they'll get out and they'll figure it out. But you're that piece that's needed uh, to help move the community forward. And I know we have children that have parents that are in prison. And, and that's a hard one. That's a tough. That's a tough one. So I appreciate it. But unfortunately, like everyone else, I'm going to have to go with Ms. Kennedy. But I do appreciate each and every one of you and for the work that you're doing. And just keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Calvert. All right. Oh, our student representative, of course. <laughs> Ms. Gomez, right? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't read it from here. Thank you to everyone that came. I thought it was very interesting to see that every one of you guys brought a different perspective, and it was really interesting to see that Mr. Nassi has been able to work with nonprofits because r right now during COVID and everything, you're able to experience and know what people are going through, and you're able to help them. So I thought that was a very big perspective. Ms. Kennedy, since you've been in nursing and you've been an educator and recently a principal, it's really you would be a great part of the Board of Trustees because 
you have that experience and you're, you can add something to the group as well as Miss Janessi. Miss Parkin, I thought one thing that stood out to me the most was um, her being bilingual because since families right now can be able, can be experiencing, they can have more connection with the Board of Trustees as they can feel more comfortable with some, having someone that's bilingual in the group. And Mr. Hen Heinemann, Heinemann uh, I think it is a great opportunity that you were applying for this position because it's very impressive. You're so young and you want to do this. And honestly, it's very intimidating. Uh, like if I were you, I would be super intimidated. <laughs> and, but it would be a great opportunity for you to grow and keep, tr keep working hard for that. Uh, but I would choose Miss Kennedy as well. She seems like she has a lot of potential in, in the next couple of months. She can grow more and give an opportunity to the next person after her. Thank you very much, Ms. Gomez. All right. Well, um, Trustee Simon Holland, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Madam President, so uh, I would make a motion that uh, the board appoints uh, Sharon Kennedy as uh, the trustee for District A. I second. <laughs> With gratitude to all that applied. Great gratitude. Definitely. <laughs> Madam President, may, may I say? I was just um, wondering if the motion needed to have the NRS or the, the end of the appointment. Okay. No, I have a motion by, I'm sorry, sorry go, ahead. go ahead. I just wanted to say something before we vote. Okay. Um, because Trustee Simon Holland alluded to it, she was appointed. I was appointed as well. Mm -hmm. And I really, 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 I'm so glad you all did so well. Because when you aren't appointed, you don't understand how hard it is to get ready for three questions that you don't know what they're going to be about. <laughs> I have often said it is harder to get appointed than it is to get elected. Those are two very different things, but you can get elected without studying and knowing in the time that you had to put in to be prepared, and which was obvious from the, the, the comments and the questions that you all answered. Just really, as a person who's also been through this process, thank you, and I really want to commend you. Thank you for making it. I know it seems like it wasn't hard, but it was hard. It was hard. It's, it's hard to be a principal with the reputation that she has. Um, but it was, it was an extremely, extremely hard decision, I know, for all of us. And I just really want to thank you because I know how much hard work it is to get ready and to come and be interviewed in front of whomever it is that's watching on YouTube at this moment. So, <laughs> so thank you. I just wanted to share. Thank I you. Yeah. I didn't share that enough earlier, and I wanted to share that. I thought it was important. All right. We have a motion by Trustee Simon Holland, a second by Vice President Taylor. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye, and any opposed? All right, that motion passes unanimously. And yes, thank you. Thank you all. A big round of applause to all of you um, for applying and for making the time tonight. Um, I would like to now ask um, <laughs> Ms. Kennedy to come join us, uh, or come join up here. We are going to swear you in tonight because we have work for you to do tomorrow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But before you leave here, you will have 15 calendar items to. <laughs> so another trustee needs a swear. Do I? Okay. I don't. I don't have the. Can can somebody bring the oath up? Touch it before. Totally good. It's on right now. <laughs> okay. So just go ahead and read it just for okay. 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 I'm going to ask you to stand, please. And then if you would raise your right hand um, and then just repeat after me. I, state your name. 
I, Sharon Kennedy, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support, protect, and defend the Constitution and government of the United States, that I will support, protect, and defend the Constitution and government of the United States, and the Constitution and government of the state of Nevada, and the Constitution and government of the state of Nevada, against all enemies, whether foreign, excuse me, whether domestic or foreign, against all enemies, whether domestic or foreign, and that I will bear true faith, allegiance, and loyalty to the same, and that I will bear true faith, allegiance, and loyalty to the same, any ordinance, resolution, or law of any state notwithstanding, any ordinance, resolution, or law of any state notwithstanding, and that I will well and faithfully perform all the duties of the office of school trustee, and that I will well and faithfully perform all the duties of the office of school trustee on which I am about to enter, so help me God. On which I am about to enter, so help me God. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow. We have a seat for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you an opportunity if there's anything you'd like to say. <laughs> I, I truly, um, I'm overwhelmed, and I thank you, and I promise you that I will work hard. I, will, when I meant it when I said I have the time right now, and I plan to devote the time to it, and I will do the best that I can. And I'd also like to echo, I'm amazed that I'm sitting here having met the people, the other people that applied. This was an amazing, amazing group of people, and. I've already made some connections. I'm not letting them get far. Um, and I promise, as I said, I will work hard. I have no doubt about that. And I also know that you will be busy. <laughs> they really will have uh, quite a few calendar invitations <laughs> leave here. So <laughs> I'm sure they'll want like to connect with you to get more information before you leave. Um, we don't have a spot for you at the table at the moment. We're just wrapping up the meeting, but you're welcome to just stay there for the Thank rest you. of it. Okay, perfect. Okay. We already moved through um, our reports. Um, the next item is 7.01, future agenda item requests. Trustee Simon Holland. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, there were some things that came up tonight that other trustees were wise enough to think of that, um, that I didn't. And one was um, addressing uh, the disenrollments to uh, private schools and charters uh, and asking the staff to come back with uh, a plan at a time that's good for you all, the staff, um, whether it's marketing campaigns, surveys, et cetera, what, what should the district be doing to, uh, to bring back enrollment? Um, and then second, um, just an update from staff on ideas about addressing the issues of our missing kindergartners and how they will be reintegrated and brought up to speed um, for first grade. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, next item is 7.02, which is public comment. Okay. So we received an email from Melinda Cooper and Pablo Nava Duran has a comment. Okay. Okay, so uh, so I, when I I did talk to um, Cecilia about the declining woman, so so you know the the hers and the Shaw who are the and the, their fitness school are the the most declining because of uh, they build a charter school. So if, if you did build a charter school, they bring the K to eight that drive the woman down, and um. For the um, for the Cold Spring, West Reno, Southwest Reno, and Northeast Reno, and uh, West Park Reno are are mostly are the second most of fat and did not have a charter school because because their kindergarten um, their 
the kindergarten, that's uh, two or three, to kindergarten, went to the world of schools. And we kindergarten, the parents decided to not to go to their school, like skip a year, and uh, could be kindergarten by a six year old kindergarten. So, so, and, um, um, so, and, um, uh, no Valley, and, uh, no Valley, Sun Valley, and, uh, South Valley area seemed like the steady decline or no decline because, because in, in, in South Reno, they are growing. And, uh, now with COVID-19, the group, they're declining a little bit. So, so once COVID-19 is over, they're going to back it up. So, go back it up. So, and no valley. I, I saw the housing building near O'Brien Middle School, and it looked like we need a, a new message school after COVID nineteen is over, after pandem post pandemics. Um, no, not now. Hold on. Hold on. Oh. So uh, we go build a new uh, O'Brien Middle School, so we have more space for students. Maybe like you could space out during pandemics. Uh, then when it's over, they have more space. So No Valley is growing, as uh, South Mill does. And in the Sun Valley, they're not to do much because, and I don't know, but in high school, in high school, everything. The, if they went up, except Wooster, which is declined by 6%, because in high school in Winner's Park area, they have Pirate School, Benjamin Oak High School, and a State Ridge High School, which is, which is Charger School. So thank you, and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Mr. Navadran. Okay, the um, next meeting uh, is on Tuesday, October 13th, um, 2020, and uh, I believe it's at, going to be at Reed High School. Uh, we'll make sure that gets posted, and I will now adjourn the meeting. <laughs>